Good morning, everyone, and welcome to San Diego. Welcome to La Jolla, and welcome to Shiley Eye Institute. Um, it is a pleasure to have all of you colleagues and friends here from around the world. What a representation of the keratoprosthesis study group. Um, I want to give a special thanks, or actually recognition, to the men who put the whole program together, Jose de la Cruz and Jean-Marie Prell, who actually, because of his knee, is not here. He's not here, Jean-Marie Prell, today. But ever since November, these guys were emailing multiple emails a day to figure out what would be the most um, interesting program to put together. And um, somehow they copied me on every email and included me and were so gracious. So I'm so thankful. So also to the keratoprosthesis study group, years of work, years of work that has been done starting by Dr. Dolman, but followed up by so many of you um, and chairing these different committees, the program, Jim Chodosh, SN Akpak, Tony Aldavi, Victor Prez. Uh, of course, Larissa, who, who goes through, uh, through every keratoprosthesis, she is the woman behind every keratoprosthesis that we put into um, each patient's eye. I wanted to say that um, a couple housekeeping things. Um, lunch will be right outside. and You can sit outside um, during the lunch. There are some tables. Um, there will be a meeting um, for oral cancer right in that corridor inside, so we'll try to be away from them. Um, but also, there are bathrooms right on your way as you go to the, uh, towards the, the staircase. That's one. Uh, they, they do not allow us to have food in this auditorium or drinks, just, um, just for all of us to keep um, that in mind. And um, besides that, I wanted to say special thanks also to Karen Anisco and Lillian Gishler, who put so much effort into the program, ordering food, the catering, and my chairman, Robert Weinreb, for his support. I wanted to tell you that my journey with keratoprosthesis started um, in 2001, after I had finished my fellowship with Dolman. And so Klaus came to Duke. It was my first year at Duke. He came as a visiting professor. and actually convinced them, it was my first few months there actually, convinced David Epstein and the group that I should start the keratoprosthesis program there. So I did my first patient there and things went well. But after a lot of collaboration with the retina team and colleagues in glaucoma and a lot of trials and tribulations, it was a decade later when Brooks McEwen of retina service was retiring and we were interviewing his replacement. On the day that we were interviewing his replacement, he introduced me. This is Natalie Afshari. She does keratoprosthesis. When we see her, we run the other way. <laughs> I know this is the feeling that a lot of our colleagues have had about us, but we have come a long way. Now many of our retina colleagues are in the audience. Many of our glaucoma colleagues are also in the audience, and it's such a collaboration because we have caused a lot of glaucoma, retina, but they, we have learned together and they are now running to us. So it's a pleasure and privilege to have the meeting here. Special recognition to Jose and Jean-Marie Prell who put the program together. Thank you, Dr. Dolman, for coming all the way from Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. It's a great pleasure for us to be here. And as you all know, it's, uh, it's a, a great effort that uh, these uh, meetings are put together at uh, the Keeper Study Group is a non-profit organization. So it's a free of charge for all of you. So, but it's actually more of uh, uh, the knowledge that we get uh, after these meetings that uh, it's such a great benefit when we sit down and collaborate um, in such a uh, complex surgery, but at the same time so rewarding. Uh, I, I was asked by Jen Marie to show a quick um, presentation here of the KPRO study group at the same time to give you some background of the, uh, uh, the group. It was established in 1990 with Dr. Pereira Locom and uh, uh, Alfonso Legas, and it's basically it's a foster clinical and basic research in curve prosthesis. Um, also the foster development and uh, improvement of curve pieces worldwide uh, for the benefit of the eye care and our patients. 
the membership is compromised of uh, researchers and surgeons involved in a specialized, this specialized field. We have regular conferences, as you all know, and we have past meetings, as you see here, all the way back to 1992 when it was the first one. And uh, Jim, you, I'll show you the picture when you were there as a, as a younger person, not to say a, a fellow resident, you know. That's right. And as you see here throughout the years, uh, now uh, we had the last one in Salzburg, uh, and it was a great success with Dr. Grabner uh, hosting it in, the, in this meeting here in La Jolla. Thank you very much, Natalie, for hosting this meeting, uh, which will hopefully will uh, have a lot of information. And you see here, this is the first meeting, 1992. Some of you can recognize yourselves there. Uh, and throughout the years, we had, this is in 2012, uh, and uh, the one in, the, in Salzburg in 2014. And uh, all of you will be in the next picture later on in the, in the lunch. So just to be brief here, you see the, the, the steering committee, as you see here, we have uh, great people that have been devoted a lot of time and effort into and putting these meetings together, but also advancing the field of critical prosthesis. Um, to announce, as you know, uh, after this meeting, we have other meetings too that we can get together. If you're not able to come to one in the United States, we can come back one in Europe or the one in, uh, in Japan later on in 2016. So, now to begin uh, the meeting, uh, a little more thing in regards to housekeeping. As you know, we have a very tight schedule, so we want to make sure we stay on time. We have our colleagues here going to be enforcing these 10-minute uh, uh, presentations for the presenters and then six minutes for the free paper presentation. Don't, don't, be, uh, don't take it personal if they yell at you or throw something at you or just shut the, uh, the screen. We just want to make sure that we are uh, giving everybody equal time. And uh, with this, we'd like then to start uh, the first uh, session, which will be the Boston Keeper International Growth. And then we'll have our colleague, uh, Jim Schroeder, talk about globalization of the Capro. Jim. Let me just I think I've got to turn this spotlight on. <laughs> well, yeah. Maybe just click it out. It's so hard to see, too. You think the, the spotlight on this one? I can then go back, the go back point. here. Much better. There you go. Is that better? Yeah, thank, thank you. Good morning. So first, uh, Jean-Marie, if you're watching, uh, we miss and love you. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, and I'm really honored to be presenting the first talk of the day. So uh, Jose asked me to talk about uh, globalization of the keratoprosthesis. prosthesis. This is a uh, topic very close to my heart. Um, let's uh, start with some background. We all know that corneal transplantation is amazing. Uh, this was a hand motion eye with a pressure of 60, filled with fusarium, and then 20 years later is 2040. And corneal transplantation is life-changing for many, many patients. However, not all corneal conditions are amenable to corneal allograft, whether it's lamellar or otherwise, and we all know that we wouldn't be sitting here. Um, the corneal, Australian Corneal Graph Registry showed that only about half of corneal transplants are clear at 15 years after surgery. The numbers get worse if you remove the keratoconus patients. And we all have patients like this who've had repeat corneal graft rejections. We know also, everyone in this room knows that each corneal graft rejection raises the risk of subsequent graft rejection. And uh, the most impressive, perhaps not fully represented, but the most impressive data on this is the paper by Bursutsky showing that the third graft has a five-year survival of essentially zero. So, we have a problem. Corneal transplantation won't solve all of corneal blindness. Donor tissue lags behind need. There are cultural, religious, and economic barriers to tissue donation that in many places in the world will not improve in our lifetimes. Corneal vascosation, in many cases, is too extensive for successful allograft surgery. And in my opinion, and it is an opinion, we still don't have a drug that can make corneal neovascularization completely regress to the point that it dramatically changes the corneal transplant outcomes. So, and we know that repeating and repeating keratoplasty is not a successful long-term strategy. So we have patients that corneal transplantation is just not great for, this corneal graft rejection in the setting of alkali burn. We have a lot of disease internationally, more than in the industrialized world. Uh, this is a patient of John Clements with measles keratopathy and corneal vascosation. And then we all see these patients, the cicatricial Zerotic eye in, in which we know that only extreme measures can be uh, induced to restore vision. So let's talk about the artificial cornea devices commonly in use. We have the Boston keratoprosthesis type 1. This is the, the chariot uh, for the last uh, 15 years with a PMMA design. 
we have the modified osteodontal carotid prosthesis. And uh, coming out of Moscow and also Ukraine, we have a variety of lamellar devices as shown here. And these devices have had a big impact on those patients who've received them. Many patients have gone from light perception or hand motion vision to really quality vision, uh, often reading or even driving quality vision. And that's amazing. And uh, recently we have the CaraClear, which is European Union CE marked uh, as a new carotid prosthesis. So what's the cumulative use? These are estimates. Uh, I think in Boston we've, uh, there have been about 12,000 devices implanted worldwide coming out of the Boston KPRO. The devices in uh, Russia and the Ukraine, maybe 3,000, it's not clear. Maybe uh, Boris can help us to know what those numbers really are, I'd like to know. Uh, the MOIKP, based on reading the literature, I'm guessing it's around 700 devices. I had 600 the last time I talked about this, but I think the program in Chennai is rolling and there's several others. And then other designs, certainly, I don't know that there's experience with uh, more than 200 cases in any of the other designs. Okay, so we have a patient like this with a severe alkali burn who still has a wet, blinking eye. Uh, you can see the patient had a corneal melt after graft surgery, rejected very quickly. And this patient is now seven years out, retaining 20-25 vision. This particular patient never developed glaucoma. I don't know why. I think it's just luck, but it's a good outcome. Here's another patient of mine with uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis at age 12. Uh, had a keratolimbal allograft performed elsewhere, which failed. The left eye perforated and had to be patched. And this is obviously not a corneal transplant eye, nor is it an eye that I would be enthusiastic about putting a type 1. Boston device, and this patient is now five years post-op with 20-20 vision. Um, and these are pictures from Don Tan's excellent uh, review article in ophthalmology, and uh, particularly interested in this patient who had a burn. And you can see that even a type 2 here would probably not work because there's really no eyelid skin, and we probably couldn't close the lids around it, uh, and a modified osteodontal carrier prosthesis was you know, wildly successful in this patient. So this looks like success to me. This looks like success. These cases certainly look like success, but is that really fair? Can we really look at individual patients and say we've achieved success? Worldwide, again, this number is widely disputed, but whether it's 10 million or 12 million or 8 million, it doesn't really matter. We have a lot of corneal blind people in the world, and a substantial number of those are children. And I believe that if you, if you look worldwide, you would see that most of these cases are not amenable to corneal transplantation because many of them are deeply vascularized or even xerotic. So we also know that the great majority of the world's corneal blind are poor because blindness begets poverty and poverty begets blindness. We have a problem. Our current designs are either too expensive and or too labor intensive for global use at a volume sufficient to have a substantial impact. One could create analogy with where cataract was some years ago before Aura Lab started making $2 intraocular lenses. We, there was a huge burden, and still remains, a huge burden of cataract-related blindness that could not be approached until the expense was addressed. Okay, what is the cost? Well, these are uh, dollars per quality-adjusted life years, and the Boston Curator Prosthesis Type 1, in our analysis in Boston, was judged to have a dollar cost per quality-adjusted life years of around 16,000 U.S. dollars. The type 2, around 60,000 US dollars. In a separate paper, the modified osteodontal carotid prosthesis was judged to have a cost of about 30,000 US dollars per quality adjusted life year. In contrast, again, this is great when we talk to people in the industrialized world, treatment for 2200 vision and macular degeneration has a cost per quality adjusted life years of over $200,000. That makes even a type 2 carotid prosthesis look inexpensive in contrast. However, cataract surgery, even in the U.S., has a cost per quality adjusted life year of about $2,000, much cheaper, even with a $250 lens from one of our uh, big companies. So we have that issue. We have the cost and the labor-intensive work, uh, but we have another issue. Uh, we have complications. Um, this is uh, Tony's wonderful paper on international character prosthesis, and he showed that when used in a broad area of the world, the, character, the Boston carotid prosthesis type 1 did very well, with one exception, and that was endophthalmitis. So 9% of patients in the series with different follow-up times had developed endophthalmitis. 
this is you know, great, but also in another way of looking at it, unacceptable. Are we w willing to lose one out of 10 eyes to anophthalmitis in the international forum? It's, it's a concern. So we have these problems, even with the best surgery and careful follow-up care that include infections, glaucoma, which we'll hear a lot about today, um, and retinal detachment being the really feared complications. Even the, uh, the wonderful osteodonocarotid prosthesis, which has restored vision to many across the globe, many in underserved areas, has problems. Mucosal necrosis is common, and bone resorption is another problem with these devices that can take a successful surgery and <clears throat> leave the patient with no vision. So what do we need? I think that when we talk about keratoprosthesis, prosthesis, it's very clear that we're not there yet, that we don't have the ultimate design. And I think any discussion should have, <clears throat> as part of the discussion, what's our goal? I think our goal is that we have something that's inexpensive to manufacture, that's easy and fast to implant, that needs minimal post-operative care because our patients sometimes don't come back for their care, has few serious side effects, and can be left lifelong. And this is, I, re I realize, idealistic, but it, without that ideal, how do we know what we're working toward? So we can now manufacture a keratoprosthesis prosthesis with a titanium backplate that's inexpensive. Right now, with a limited volume, we can make it for $100 a device. Uh, it can be made cheaper if the volume goes up, and it's as easy to put in as a Boston keratoprosthesis. prosthesis. And this is a patient of Dr. Pineda's, Roberto Pineda's, in uh, Darfur, who uh, had bilateral herpes keratitis in the setting of vernal keratoconjunctivitis. And here you see the eyes. We, I think, are pretty sure that this patient, given the socioeconomic situation and the cornea situation, would not do well with standard keratoplasty. And here the patient is postoperatively with uh, this inexpensive Boston keratoprosthesis. And the patient did well. Because of the cosmetic issues, uh, we are working on a device which has an iris, a more iris-like backplate. And you can see it, we haven't, this hasn't been placed in any eye yet but you get the general idea of what it would look like in this eye, and we can color that back plate brown so that it looks more like a, uh, a normal human iris. Okay, so we can do all those things. We can make an inexpensive device. We can make one, we're on the verge of having one that makes the eye look pretty normal, and that's a big advance for patients who may have cosmetic concerns about this metal in their eye that appears to children and other people as being unusual. But without good care and perfect follow-up, the complications can be devastating. If I do a corneal transplant in someone and watch it fail, I take the sutures out, and they have a cornea. It's cloudy. Sometimes it can have bullous eruptions, but often it doesn't. And I can send the patient away, and they, if they don't want to see me again ever, they can go away with their cornea. And if there's no sutures present, there's a good chance they won't have any further problems with that eye. But if I put a keratoprosthesis in an eye and, walk, and the patient walks away, we know there's going to be a problem. We know that the eye will be lost. Long-term retention without follow-up care is unlikely in any keratoprosthesis recipient. So clearly we need more research. So in summary, keratoprosthesis implantation has clearly entered the mainstream in the industrialized world, and although still by numbers a rarely performed procedure, I think is an accepted modality within, certainly within cornea circles for uh, corneal restoration. The expense can be lowered considerably, but complications remain a problem for all currently used designs. And finally, there are obstacles remaining to full globalization that include access to care and, of course, the complications. And with that, I'll stop, and thank you very much. So next up will be the, our colleague, Dr. Aldave, is going to talk about international growth and uh, critical prosthesis. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, Jose very much and Natalie and Jean-Marie for the organization of this meeting. I want to thank all of you who came down to San Diego early uh, for this conference. Looking forward to sharing my experience uh, and learning from your experiences. Uh, the first talk that I have today is on international growth of the uh, Boston keratoprosthesis. By way of disclosure, I have no financial interest uh, in the Boston keratoprosthesis. This is an article that uh, our last speaker and uh, Dr. Dolman and uh, I and others have contributed to on global corneal blindness and the Boston keratoprosthesis. Uh, in this, we uh, detailed the burden of corneal blindness worldwide, the fact that almost 90% of corneal blindness exists in the developing world, 
and highlighted some pilot programs that were underway at this time. This paper was published, I believe, in uh, 2010 or so in China, in India, as well as in Ethiopia and Sudan. If you look worldwide, as Dr. Chodos just mentioned, some will argue the numbers, but they're still substantial. 314 million individuals visually impaired. That's roughly the population of the United States, which is 308 million the last census. 45 million individuals blind. It's a little more than California's population, which is 35 million, but it's on that, uh, in that magnitude. And then 8 million blind secondary to corneal disease. That's about the population of Los Angeles. If you think about that, these are truly staggering numbers. And as Dr. Choto said, you can argue one way or another, but still there's a huge burden. And most of that burden is in the developing world, not in the countries where the keratoprotheses are typically available. This is a map that SightLife has produced. For those who aren't familiar with SightLife, it's uh, probably the largest eye bank in the world as far as number of tissues distributed, headquartered in Seattle. And they have embarked on a uh, a uh, very aggressive program uh, to try to address corneal blindness in the developing world. As you can see on this map, the size of the countries reflects the population of corneal blind. So we see that India is very well represented, uh, as is China, uh, as is a large uh, number of countries in Southeast Asia, as well as Africa. And then the color of the countries represents the readiness for eye banking and corneal transplantation. And much of that readiness is determined by the um, number of cataract surgeries being performed per population each year. So in India, where you have about 5 million cataract surgeries per year, you have surgeons who are very well versed in ophthalmic surgery. You have operating microscopes, knowledge of sterile technique, etc. So the readiness for uh, training surgeons, uh, for increasing the supply of corneal tissue in India, uh, and eradicating, or at least making a big dent in corneal blindness in India is very high, as it is in several other countries you see on the map. So in the United States, the population is, I mentioned, 308 million. Uh, last year, this is data that just came from the EBAA, there was just over 47,000 corneal transplants performed. So it's one in roughly 6,500 people has a corneal transplant in this country each year. So if you need a corneal transplant, if you're in La Jolla or if you're in Boston or wherever, you're going to receive it. Indonesia, population 230 million. It's the fourth most populous country on earth behind the United States. This is data from Dr. Johan, a good friend and a colleague in Jakarta. 191 corneal transplants in the entire country last year. That's one per 1.2 million people. And remember, 90% of the corneal blindness is in the developing world in countries like Indonesia. I believe that by the year 2020, more Boston keratoprostheses will be implanted annually outside the U.S. than in the United States. And why is that? Well, for a number of reasons. Increased availability of donor tissue internationally. Increasing number of corneal transplants performed internationally. Decreasing cost of the Boston keratoprosthesis, which Dr. Chodos just touched on. And similar domestic and international outcomes of the Boston keratoprosthesis. This is data that Dr. Chodos and Dr. Dolman just shared with me yesterday. The number of Boston keratoprosthesis performed per year, both in the United States in blue and then internationally. And you see the significant increase over the last, let's say, five years is in the number of procedures performed in the international arena. The number in the United States seems to be leveling off somewhere around six to 700 per year. The Boston keratoprosthesis has been implanted in more than 50 countries uh, around the world, obviously most of them the United States, but an increasing number, and I believe uh, Australia just implanted the first uh, keratoprosthesis just last year. So there are some large developed countries, which it's surprising that the Boston keratoprosthesis has not been implanted more, uh, but in those countries I believe it will be seeing it implanted much more frequently in the years to come. So let's start with the first two uh, reasons why I think the keratoprosthesis will be implanted more often outside the U.S. than in the U.S. by the year 2020. Increased availability of donor tissue internationally and the increasing number of corneal transplants performed internationally. This is data provided by the EBAA, corneas provided by USI banks. So these are corneas that are distributed by USI banks either to surgeons here in the United States or to surgeons abroad. And you'll see in the blue, these are the procedures performed in the U.S. We saw an increase, obviously, in the late uh, uh, 2005, 2010 because of the increase in endothel keratoplasty procedures. But in the last couple of years, it's leveled off as far as the number of transplants performed in the U.S. 
But again, the demand for tissue outside the U.S. continues to increase so that last year about a third of the corneas that are distributed by U.S. eye banks go outside the United States. So that's applying the developing world with more corneas. And also there are many countries which are now doing a, a really good job at increasing their domestic supply. This is data from uh, my friend Samar Basak, uh, who is or was the uh, president of the Indian Eye Bank Association, looking at the number of corneas collected per year over the last 10 years, increasing from 20,000 to 53,000 plus in 2013. And then the percentage of corneas that are utilized for corneal transplantation, increasing from 8,000 per year in 2003 to three times that in 2013. So a three-fold increase over the span of a decade with utilization rate you see increasing up to now getting close to 50%. So there are a number of uh, states in India now where there is a surplus of corneal tissue, which was certainly not the case 10 years ago. Now, this is data presided again by SightLife, and this is a bit optimistic, but we can always dream. In blue is the line indicating the number of corneal tissues available for transplantation if SightLife is successful in working with its partner eye banks in India and other programs as well done by the International Federation of Eye and Tissue Banks to increase the donor tissue supply. The goal, 100,000 corneal transplants in India by the year 2020. The problem is the dotted line indicates the readiness as far as the ability to transplant those corneas based on the number of trained corneal surgeons in India at this time. So pretty soon the limiting factor, if not already, is the number of surgeons trained to transplant those corneas and the incentivization of those surgeons who are probably going to make more money per minute spent doing cataracts. We have to incentivize those surgeons to do transplants instead. Obviously this involves surgeon training and that's where a number of us uh, in this room come in where we go obviously to India quite frequently to train surgeons in advanced forms of corneal transplantation. Uh, one other advance I think that's going to help us see an increase in the number of Boston cataprostheses implanted internationally is the ability to use long-term preserved corneas as the carrier for the Boston cataprosthesis. This is the vision graft produced by Tissue Banks International. This is a, an irradiated cornea that's kept in albumin for up to two years. It can be pre-cut. Uh, with a laser or with a tree find for the surgeon to make the assembly process even quicker and easier. Other surgeons have used long-term preserved corneas that are preserved in uh, other ways as well. And again, this provides a cornea that's always at the ready for the cataprosthesis surgeon. So if a patient comes in with a melt in whom the surgeon wants to replace a, a Boston cataprosthesis, they don't have to wait for one or two weeks for a cornea to arrive from the United States. This can be on the shelf and ready to use to implant a new keratoprosthesis. There's a couple of articles uh, on the utility of the irradiated cornea. Essen, who's in the front row, was the first author on the one on the right. This one came from Samir Melki and colleagues in Beirut, and collectively about 28 eyes in which they reported good outcomes with the use of an irradiated cornea as a carrier for the Boston keratoprosthesis. Now, if we're seeing an increase in the number of corneal transplants performed in the international uh, arena, we're going to see an increase correspondingly of the keratoprostheses. And why do I say that? Well, in any series you look at, and this is our series on the international outcomes of the Boston keratoprosthesis, the number one indication for the keratoprostheses is failed corneal transplant. So as we're seeing surgeons learning keratoplasty surgery, and those who already know it, performing more keratoplasties, obviously more of those grafts are going to fail, whether we like it or not again, which provides the number one indication for a Boston keratoprosthesis. Another reason why we're going to see a continued national growth is the decreasing cost of the Boston keratoprosthesis. Dr. Chodosh showed you an image of this Lucia, which is the uh, two-piece Boston keratoprosthesis, which comes in one axial length, uh, aphakic model only, so allows this to be produced at large numbers at one time, keeping the cost down. Also, as many of you are aware, the Aura Lab uh, not only produces intraocular lenses for $2 a pop, but they also produce the RO keratoprosthesis, uh, which was developed in conjunction with Drs. Dolman and Chodosh. And this I have implanted several times myself in India. I can tell you at this point, the design is virtually identical to the Boston keratoprosthesis, some minor differences. Uh, this is available in India only for 6,000 rupees, which is now about 100 to 120 US dollars. Uh, the only part of it that's really expensive is this titanium locking ring, which still has to be sourced from the United States. 
So the cost of the character prosthesis, at least in India, really is, is not a barrier. And then finally, similar domestic international outcomes of Boston cutter prosthesis. Uh, we want to make sure if we're implanting the cutter prosthesis outside the United States that we very carefully track our outcomes and make sure that those are similar to those in the United States. And we have to make sure that what we're, the results we're getting in the United States are acceptable. Like Dr. Chodo said, 9% anophthalmitis. You have to think about that. Is that acceptable? One out of 11 patients developing anophthalmitis and losing all potential for vision. One, a patient who has no other chance at vision, who has good teens, let's say useful vision for a number of years and then loses it, I, I think it's unfortunate, but at least they have gained something they did not have, and the other 10 of the 11 patients will obviously avoid an ophthalmitis. So this is something we need to think about, something we need to uh, do our best as far as when we do train surgeons in the developing world to ensure that that follow-up uh, is as careful as the follow-up is for our own patients at home. As far as visual acuities in the international arena, it's a busy slide, but I think I'll break it down for you here. If we look prior to surgery, 2020 to 2200, 6% of patients in my series, 2% international series, then looking at six months, one year, and two years after surgery, virtually identical outcomes as far as visual acuity. So patients see just as well in Mumbai and in Moscow as they do in Los Angeles following the keratoprosthesis. We need longer term follow-up, but at least this is good initial encouraging data. This is the table of complications Dr. Chodos mentioned already. The only complication seen more commonly outside the United States than in the United States was, in fact, anophthalmitis. As far as retention, we're looking at the percentage of K-Pros retained is the same in the international series and in my series. And this is why I encourage all of us, when we're reporting our outcomes, to look at rates, not percentages, and not to say something is a rate, but it's actually a percentage, because follow-up matters. So when you adjust for the length of follow-up, you do see there's a difference. There's a higher retention failure rate in the international series compared to the, the domestic series at UCLA, but the difference is not statistically significant. But we do need to make sure that we are all reporting rates so we can compare outcomes in different parts of the world and even in the United States between different post-operative regimens. In the blue line, we see the retention in the UCLA series. In the red line, the retention in the international series. We see at three years, they are essentially the same. And when you compare that to the likelihood of survival of a first repeat graft or a subsequent regraft, there's no comparison. The Boston Cataprosthesis wins. So in conclusion, the increasing availability and utilization of donor corneal tissue internationally is leading to an increased number of corneal transplants performed. Corneal transplant uh, failure continues to be the primary indication for cataprosthesis implantation. So as more PKs are performed internationally, we're going to see more and more of those grafts fail. And again, more and more people become candidates for the Boston cataprosthesis. The decrease in cost and encouraging international outcomes of the Boston k will result in the majority of the procedures being performed outside the United States by the year 2020. We'll see if I'm right at the next World Cornea Congress. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. First of all, I would, I would like to thank organizing for having me here with you today. And uh, uh, I appreciate this uh, kind invitation to speak uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the department, of Cornea Department of uh, Pure of Eye Microsurgery Institute. Uh, so uh, this is the Russia and Moscow and the institute, which is located in the northern part of, uh, of the city, uh, as you can see here. Uh, this is basically our institute, and some of them, uh, some some of you have been been our guests uh, for a couple of years ago, uh, and enjoyed staying with us. And this is the main building, uh, the conference hall, a couple of outpatient building, and this small building is the facility where we produce some instruments, lenses, and keratoprothesis as well. Uh, this is our network of clinics uh, that are located all over Russia, and uh, we have 11 uh, clinics that look like uh, almost the same, uh, and they are located in the major uh, in the major cities uh, all over uh, all over the Russia. So, uh, of course, we uh, we, we were dealing uh, with the issues of uh, corneal burns leucomas for many years, and. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure that I will improve your statistics uh, uh, with regard to the numbers because we don't have precise numbers from the very beginning, from 1960s. But uh, I estimate the, <coughs> the numbers of KPROs uh, made uh, in, in, in Russia uh, for, for these years uh, as about 2,000, probably 1,000 was made in Ukraine. That gives us the overall number of 3,000 uh, cases. And this is a brief overview of different types and designs. And we even had the chance to implant Boston KPROs with the help of uh, Tony who was uh, uh, teaching us in, in, in this technology. And we had a chance uh, to welcoming Professor Dolman and Prof, uh, Professor Chodosh uh, for, uh, for our meetings um, uh, and uh, wet labs. So this is a basic uh, Russian K-Pro. Uh, we, we call it Fyodorov Zuyev uh, by the name of the two guys who, uh, who have made it. And as you can see here, this is a titanium foot plate with the central uh, optical cylinder and the temporary liner that, uh, that blocks the, the central opening uh, because the, the concept of, of doing uh, this type of procedures is intralamellar as opposed to <coughs> Boston Key Pro and intralamellar we do it in two steps First, we dissect the cornea, implant the foot plate, and uh, a couple of months later, we do refine uh, the central part, remove this spacer, and uh, screw, <coughs> screw in the, the optical cylinder. <coughs> this technology was, uh, uh, was published for many years, and uh, uh, this is one of the first uh, books on, on that technology that was in the 70s. And uh, we don't have uh, a lot of publications uh, uh, by, made by uh, <coughs> Russian uh, uh, surgeons, but we do have a couple of publications on uh, Moscow uh, K-Pro made by Chinese. Uh, some of them are trained with us, and uh, there are different variations of the names that you can find in the literature. Uh, this is Maikov keratoprothesis. Uh, Russia keratoprothesis and uh, Fyodorov keratoprothesis. So there is a high variation, but basically this is the same, uh, the same uh, device with a titanium foot plate and the, uh, that is in, implanted intralamellarly uh, in the cornea. But also we had uh, some other devices uh, and variations that, like this one uh, that, that is made of metal, and this was basically made for uh, patients with repeated corneal grafts, and the idea was to block the uh, the aqueous going through the cornea to the frontal uh, to the front part of the cornea uh, in order to decrease the pullus uh, of the epithelium in these particular patients. And it's also implanted in a step-by-step -step manner, uh, uh, pretty similar to the to the one that I just uh, showed you. And this is another variation made of uh, metal network, uh, also with the idea of to improving the, the biocompatibility and improving the retention rate, because this, uh, this uh, mesh is a little bit more flexible than the titanium foot plate, and it's biomechanically uh, uh, more uh, acceptable for, for the cornea. So, uh, starting from 1996, we started to use uh, uh, K-Pros uh, in the block uh, with their uh, uh, pre-implanted uh, in the cornea, and this uh, uh, this block was delivered to the surgical uh, uh, to the operating theater and then transplanted. And also, we had uh, experience uh, uh, for 10 years of uh, um, uh, we call it bio prothesis. This is uh, a concept which is similar to AlphaCore, uh, where the hydrophilic acrylic uh, optical uh, cylinder was chemically binded to the uh, biological tissue. Uh, in this case, this is a pericardium, and uh, this was implanted uh, um, uh, in the manner we do corneal transplantation. Unfortunately, unfortunately long-term res results were not very uh, successful with this type of uh, uh, procedures. So currently we are using the Fyodorov Zuev uh, K-Pro uh, specifically uh, uh, in adherent vascular e-commas and uh, these uh, uh, K-Pros are implanted into the UV cross-linked cornea 
and the idea is to improve the retention rate uh, specifically uh, for these uh, particular patients when we have extensive, uh, extensive um, um, pathology of the anterior segment of the eye, uh, sine here, and so on, uh, in which you definitely uh, uh, know uh, about these patients. So this is to present uh, one of the latest studies that we did uh, with uh, adherent vascular lecomers of 87 patients. Uh, uh, most of them were with uh, uh, burns, uh, either thermal or chemical burns. And they had a lot of previous surgical procedures, uh, including uh, tectonic keratoplasties, PKPs, uh, and even uh, some of them were uh, previously implanted with K-pros that were Russian K-pros that were that were subsequently removed uh, with uh, quite low uh, visual acuity. And of course, we were not being able to assess the IOP in these particular patients. So we, we did it by palpation and in about 50% of cases, uh, um, the, the IOP was normal, and the, in the others, it was uh, higher, than, uh, uh, higher than normal. Uh, we usually check these patients with UBM and uh, OCT uh, to assess the anterior segment structures, to assess the, uh, the extension of uh, anterior sinus here, and uh, to give an idea of how we will manage this uh, uh, interoperatively. The surgical technique is quite straightforward. We uh, First, we U, uh, UV cross-link the donor cornea. Then we made uh, we make a pocket, which is made by uh, hand, uh, me mechanical dissection, implant the, uh, the foot plate of the uh, K-Pro, then uh, make a central trifination and screw in uh, the cylinder, and then trifine the whole block uh, and this uh, pocket incision is sutured with interrupted sutures, and the uh, diameter of trifination is uh, about 11 millimeters. It's uh, bigger than uh, the diameter of the foot plate. And the surgical procedure uh, is uh, quite uh, straightforward as well, uh, although we are adding to this uh, uh, implantation of the corneal, uh, of the Ahmed valve. Uh, which is placed in the, in the usual manner. All these patients are receiving the, uh, the uh, valves uh, to prevent uh, IOP raise in post-operative period. And these are major steps of, of, the, uh, of the surgery, followed by covering uh, of the um, uh, K-Pro cornea complex uh, with the conjunctiva and uh, leaving the central opening uh, in this conductiva uh, for, uh, to, to provide vision. Surgical procedure uh, was uh, uh, usually uh, associated with the, uh, additional sinecholysis, cataract extraction, anterior vitrectomy, or iridoplasty, and visual potential uh, was, uh, uh, was um, mm, um, Unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a lot of pictures here. OK, the visual potential was uh, 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 depending on the condition of the retina and uh, uh, on the condition of the optic nerve. Uh, overall results, uh, we've got 20.7% uh, of aseptic stromal necrosis, which required additional manipulations. And retroprosthetic membranes was in 26.4%. Uh, percent of cases, and uh, uh, definitely this was uh, also uh, uh, indications for additional uh, manipulations, uh, including covering the eye with a buccal mucosa or autoconjunctival graft or uh, lamellar grafting with the donor cornea if there was a shortage of uh, local uh, tissues. 5.7% uh, uh, of K-Pros in these patients were removed uh, 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 with the subsequent uh, corneal grafting. And the results uh, so far were quite encouraging, uh, allowing us to say that this uh, technology uh, can provide reasonably good results in uh, patients with uh, vascular lecomas and achieve uh, good success in a, uh, quite a big number of cases. And I thank you for your attention.
sure how to announce this sure. next talk. <laughs> well, actually, the next talk is basically more of an introduction to a uh, joint effort from uh, the Pan Corny Society and specifically the Pancake Group, which is a group of uh, Latin American doctors, uh, Cape surgeons. Uh, 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 let uh, Victor say the introductions. Great. Thank you. I'm out of here. I'm turn it off. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Natalie and Jose, for putting this together, and to uh, Jim Murray, who's in Miami, uh, looking at us. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Pancornia. Uh, being in Miami, which is considered part of Latin America, uh, it's an honor to uh, establish a study group uh, that is dedicated to the study uh, of corneal external diseases all throughout Latin America. Um, you have heard from Jim and Tony uh, how the globalization of uh, keratoprosthesis it's a major concern, it's a great goal to achieve, but it's very important for this to succeed that we have right numbers and that we put together the data of our outcomes so we can do better. Well, when you saw most of those slides, you probably noticed that uh, the area of Latin America, which ironically is closer to us, uh, it was pretty much in blank. I mean, we really don't have that much data from the Latin American CAPRO group, and that's uh, kind of ironic because again, it's close to us. And certainly we know that there are K-Pro users uh, in Latin America that have trained in the United States. Uh, we've been very lucky to, uh, that's okay. uh, we created four years ago the Pancornia Society to exactly do that, help different organizations or themes throughout Latin America to get together and become a comprehensive group that we can actually be part of the international community. This is uh, as president for the next two years. Uh, our goal has been to create different type of study groups. We have created PAXO, which is an ocular surface group, uh, PANCONO, which is studies keratoconus. As, as, uh, uh, in my tenure as president, our goal has been to establish PANCAPRO. The goal of PANCAPRO is basically to collect data from all the Latin American KPRO users, being able to put it together, analyze it, and present it to the international community. So uh, uh, in contrast to other countries, we do have excellent ophthalmic surgeons that have been trained in the United States and are back in Latin America doing keratoprosthesis. So I think that our contribution will be very useful to this uh, group of um, scientists. Uh, our previous president, Jose Alvarez Gomez, created the Global Consensus for Keratoconus and Ectatis Diseases. And uh, our goal is to do the same thing for Pancorni, uh, for, for, for Pancapro, pre, uh, probably start in Latin America and probably uh, contaminate you as well and get you excited to maybe create a consensus of uh, Kpro issues for the international community. Uh, this is our website, uh, more in, uh, than welcome for you to visit and learn more from us. And as one of our first steps and towards this goal, uh, we've been actively creating a database of all the bank, uh, uh, all the KPRO users in Latin America. And uh, uh, Jose, under the leadership of Jose, we put this uh, study together, and I will let him to describe you a little bit what we're trying to do. Thank you. So as you heard, Victor, then, and, and it actually goes very well with the uh, previous talks in which there are, the more information we have, the more organized we are as a group, but the more we can learn individually, but also we can learn as, as, as regions. So uh, what we did was in order to, to really uh, able to incorporate such a big area and, and be successful at it, instead of saying one person picking all the information, we basically divided the, the uh, Latin American regions, region one, which is our colleagues from Brazil, region two, our colleagues from Argentina, region three, Chile and Ecuador, and all the other uh, countries that do CAPER within that area, region four, Colombia and Venezuela, um, region five, Central American Caribbean, and region six, Mexico. And in order to really be focused uh, on each region, we have people in each region that is sort of the, the liaison, the, 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 uh, the person that manages and helps the, uh, the surgeons in these regions to uh, gather the data, uh, incorporate in a database, and then not only have a, a regional, meaning each region uh, database, but also a global database within Latin America, and also individually each surgeon can then look at their own data, compare it to their region, or even compare it to Latin America, so that it goes both ways. And as you see here, the colleagues that have collaborated with us, uh, uh, with Lola Cortina is, is taking on the uh, region in, in Argentina, and with her connections and her uh, uh, colleagues over there in, Brazil, in, in Argentina, she's able to contact the, the higher volume surgeons and also the surgeons that are interested in being part of it. Andrea Cruzata with the region in, in Chile and the surrounding countries. Victor with Colombia and Venezuela, together with Juan Carlos also, and then Central, Central American and Caribbean, and then of course Guillermo with our colleagues in, Mex in Mexico. So with this effort, and it, it's already started, and it's not, it's not an a exclusive effort, it's an inclusive effort that we've reached out to the surgeons that have been more active, but also we want to include the, their surgeons that perhaps are starting so we can incorporate in their database and uh, be successful in 
not only learning about their outcomes, their regional outcomes, but also learn about uh, what modifications they need to do in regards to, say, for example, their, their treatment in endothelitis, as Sonia has mentioned, which is one of the things we want to, to attack. Is it something that's regional issues, or is it something that's global? And we need to address that, at least understand what the information we gather. So this is just basically the, the parts of the, uh, you probably won't see as well, but uh, so part of the data is it's pretty uh, user friendly. Uh, we share with all the data, with the, the, the uh, CAPE resurgence, and then we bring it back and uh, provide them with the database statistics that is regional and also the, their individual ones. And we're in the process now of gathering the information. We have uh, our colleagues from Brazil are very, very active right now and in incorporating in the database, as well as the colleagues from Mexico, Argentina, and also our colleagues from Chile are also are very, very active in this process. So it's an ongoing process that we look forward to uh, soon provide you with some more information and uh, hopefully more uh, uh, valuable information as a local surgeon, but also as a region. Thank you. Discussion time, right? Yep. So um, we should just open it up. Uh, if you have specific questions for speakers, please ask. Can we get the lights back on? We went a little bit over, so we can take, but we can still take five minutes. Question? Yeah. Good evening, Tom. Um, this brought up a comment and question for both of you. Uh, I think it's great and very fascinating that you know we're training surgeons to do keratoprosthesis elsewhere in the United States, outside the United States. Um, my point is as well, and I think we're seeing this in the United States as well. I don't know, especially in Florida. We get a lot of referrals of patients that get to our donor in our institute, then they go away. And what we call it, they get lost to follow up. Um, shouldn't we also be putting emphasis and energy in training ophthalmologists that would not do KPROS, but also to learn how to identify complications, not management, or maybe then teach them how to prepare a patient faster for institutes? So it's a good question. Uh, Radhika Tandon is pioneering a program in Delhi to, I, I don't know, I don't want to diverge too much, but uh, maybe some of you in the audience know about directly observed therapy in tuberculosis. Uh, that's Paul Farmer's innovation where the, uh, a nurse or an aide would go to the person's home and watch them take their medicines and make sure that they come for their follow-up appointments. So in uh, North India, the plan is to assign a social worker to each patient to make sure they have plain fare, uh, or train fare, to make sure they have their medicines and keep their follow-up appointments. We need to look at these some of the very difficult environments and uh, do better on that basis, but the plan is also to use and train local ophthalmologists to how to examine the patients and to use digital media to send images to more experienced surgeons who can identify what a, an infiltrate looks like around the stem of a Boston keratoprosthesis, prosthesis. Because uh, even our fellows sometimes miss those. And um, it, it just takes a bit of training and a, and a bit of attention to look specifically for what you know are the common complications. So I think, you know, Radhika's innovation, which is just getting started, uh, I think has the potential to make that happen in what's a very difficult environment for uh, placing care to prosthesis where patients tend not to come back as often as they might in other parts uh, and may not have, if the distances are greater and their financial resources uh, are, are not always great. So, uh, Radhika, do you want to say something about that? Yes, I think the similar thing that we, as you were saying, that we, we can always have a session in every conference as well. So. Um, for all surgeons to have some um, kind of uh, uh, orientation to the follow-up and maybe we can all contribute some kind of uh, pictures as a, as a manual, as a reference manual so that people can just idea. look at that and then and the other thing is cell phone, uh, they can take a picture and then send it and then you can have, have a look. Yeah, we, we've had a CAPRO course at the All India meeting almost every year for the last eight years. I didn't get to go this year. We, yeah, the problem is, of course, as you know, those who are interested in KPROs will come to the KPRO course. Those who aren't interested aren't going to come. Uh, and so the people who may be following my KPRO patients, for example, in Nevada, in Arizona, in Montana, in the Western states, they're not going to come to a course that we give at ASCRS or the Academy. So I identify the, that surgeon before I ever operate, identify who's going to do the follow-up, tell them exactly what it is I'm going to ask them to look for post-operatively after they agree to follow the patient. I give them then my, a link to my Dropbox where I have images of basically what to look for. Like you said, the infiltrator on the stem, 
epithelial defects and tell them, these are the things you need to tell me about. Epithelial defect present for more than two weeks, et cetera. They have, usually have a lot of questions about contact lens management that I try to anticipate what the questions are. And as we go through, I should probably make a frequently asked questions handout to give to these surgeons. The other thing is I'm really rabid about insisting that the patient comes back to me. And before I ever operate, I say, you, are, you were married, like it or not, and uh, we're going to see each other, and if you don't come to me, I will find you. It's helpful to do these follow-up studies a lot because I'm also bugging the local people who are following these patients for follow-up information and that mandates that they call those patients in if they haven't seen them, if the patient's not seeing me. So that's helped, but it, it is a problem, uh, Victor. And I think the idea that you're employing is an excellent one. It's harder to do in the United States, though, I think, as far as who's going to be paying the social workers. It's just more expensive, obviously, having somebody to do that, but that sounds like a great program that we should probably look at doing in other countries if feasible. Almost as difficult problem are, is, uh, are those folks or surgeons who dabble in the care of prosthesis and almost um, both among patients and for that surgeon and some of the surrounding area surgeons, um, their reputation goes down, their reputation of care of prosthesis as a whole goes down. So perhaps there should be these centers of excellence and others just until they get a lot better, hold off on doing them. So my, it's my personal view, I'm not necessarily shared by the US government or, or necessarily Mass and Air Infirmary, is that um, it's very tricky. We're not at the stage where we can put it like an IOL and walk away. Um, and I agree completely about centers of excellence. I think for right now, we need to follow that model and we should be very careful about who's placing it and, and what they're doing and we should work to train and develop centers of excellence that requires work on those people who are doing it and willing to do that. But I think that's where it has to be. I have the same concern about, I mean, this is, the device in some hands is like a loaded gun. If you put it in the patient and walk away, the patient will lose their eye to anaphthalmitis. So you've left that individual worse off, who might have had hand motion or light perception, now they have no light perception. So that's not something I want to participate in personally, and um, that's why we've tried to develop centers and focus on places where people are very serious and have the patient population to do it. So I agree. I, I agree with that, especially for patients that we know are higher risk. The Stephen Johnson syndrome patients, mucous membrane pentagoid, I think it should be very few surgeons who operate on those patients. And, and I really would think that that patient should be following up with the operating surgeon. In that case, for those high risk patients, you really need to be following up with an experienced catapocesis surgeon rather than a local ophthalmologist. That's my opinion. Yeah. So, so I think. We're done with our time? Yes, thank you very much. It's, I think so far we've gotten a lot of great information. So, so hands up, who was, was it worth it being here this morning for this first part? That's, so we'll keep it going then, perfect. All right, so the next uh, uh, session will be, what have we learned in the last 10 years about complications and how do we manage them? And for that, we have uh, our gracious uh, moderators, uh, Dr. Essing Atbeck and uh, Dr. Victor Perez. And uh, I'll leave it up to you guys now. Well, thank you so much for this session. I think it's one of the most important sessions that we have. We certainly know that when we put a K-Pro, we're going to get complications. So it's a great pleasure to share this with Edson, and we can start with the first talk. Um, the first talk is by Dr. Goldberg. Glaucoma, current problems and future fixes. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you. Um, at least for the direct interaction from Natalie inviting me and from Jean-Marie Perel um, for uh, amplifying that inter uh, invitation and uh, also to both of them for sending me material to sort of reorient me um, around how KPRO is being uh, used and addressed today and uh, also to uh, Victor uh, who I'll credit along the way um, uh, who we, he and I have been talking about the very topic that I want to sort of put out and propose today. Um, to this audience, um, we don't have to um, review. This is more review for me than for you. Um, but my understanding of glaucoma in K-PRO patients, and, and you know, with the preface that, of course, this is true in all of our cornea transplant patients in general, um, the cornea transplants you go do end up sending a lot of glaucoma work over to us. And of course, the glaucoma work we do ends up sending a lot of cornea transplants to you. So the truth is we're, you know, we're already a married couple, or, or as I would usually put it, in bed together. 
So uh, glaucoma in K-pro patients may be one of the most significant complications. Um, um, can be caused by a number of things, inflammation, angle closure, are probably the two uh, main ways that we think about that. Uh, IOP monitoring, I think, is a topic that uh, Bob Weinrab will come talk a little bit about later in the uh, session, later in the afternoon. Um, you know, I think of IOP monitoring in, in three terms. Uh, yesterday, which is finger palpation. I, I always love reading papers where finger palpation is, um, uh, you know, uh, reported with three or four significant figures, averages. Um, Today, I think that we can modify a little bit. The way I do it in my practice is instead of using my finger at the slit lamp, I use a cotton-tipped applicator and very lightly press on uh, the scleral at the side. And I feel like from my ex a greater experience doing that at the end of glaucoma surgeries, I feel like that indentation gives me a little more of a reliable um, uh, feel for uh, what the intraocular pressure ballpark might be than by finger, uh, but that again reflects the fact that uh, I sort of learned how to do it that way and people who have been on it for a couple of decades with finger palpation are gonna feel very comfortable and confident about that. Tomorrow, we'll hear about tomorrow's IOP monitoring, which is going to be reliable use of devices that can be implanted into eyes. How do we monitor for glaucoma? Optic nerve head monitoring has gotta be uh, one of our main approaches. Uh, that, of course, relies on a, a view in, but at least it does not rely as heavily on the patient having uh, an ability to do a visual field test reliably over time. We have a big problem with glaucoma in K-PRO patients with rapid progression. The need for surgical in intervention. I was raised on the premise in Miami that pretty much every K-PRO patient, every K-PRO should go in with a tube if it isn't there already. Uh, and preferably a sulcus tube and a vitrectomy. Now with endocyclophotocoagulation, that gives another approach uh, that, may be another, that may be another reliable approach to dealing with decreasing aqueous production over time, although your, uh, the reticence to keep going back into the eye um, in these patients is obviously going to be high. Um, um, Victor put me on to this paper a couple of months ago um, from Klaus, who I was uh, delighted to meet this morning, uh, where they looked at 106 eyes of 87 patients and really, to my mind, defined the issue of glaucoma. And that is, uh, I hope you can see this is downloaded directly from the um, journal website, uh, that we can appreciate that pretty much, you know, almost everybody either had glaucoma, 65%, uh, 66%, or develop glaucoma afterwards, 26%. Um, visual fields they found were only sort of reliable in 59% of eyes, so they used cup to disc ratio as the main outcome measure. And you can see in this graph that whether you had prior glaucoma in the green line or no prior glaucoma but developed glaucoma, the blue line, your uh, optic nerve head uh, indication of your glaucomatous progression is going to get much worse. Uh, even in the short time, few years after being followed. In this particular series, um, nine eyes out of 106 did not have glaucoma before or develop it after. Uh, they broke out in the paper uh, uh, different uh, indications for Capro, and my take-home message from this is it doesn't matter. Everybody gets worse. Uh, it, um, and so what to do with these patients? They pointed out in this paper that obviously um, protecting these patients with glaucoma surgery um, enhances the survival uh, uh, in these K-PRO patients, um, but um, you know, better than no glaucoma surgery. And, and actually, it looks like the shunt, if I'm reading it right, the shunt after putting the K-PRO is actually the worst case scenario. So again, put it in before or at the time of. So really, what do I think are the opportunities here? There's a lot of work being done in the laboratory and beginning to transition to the clinic for neuroprotection in glaucoma and other optic neuropathies and even regenerative therapies. And the problem that we're having in the standard run-of-the-mill primary open-angle glaucoma uh, field is how to test these things. So let me give you just a couple of tastes from the laboratory or early clinical data. Here's one example where if we knock down this gene called KLF9 in an animal, in a preclinical model of optic nerve injury, 
we can now get axons, which normally don't grow back at all in an, in an animal or in a human. Uh, we can get axons to grow all the way back through the optic chiasm right back to the brain. And we're now trying to develop uh, the sort of human usable approach to testing this uh, in early phase human trials. Another approach has been to use neurotrophic factors, and this, just as an example, is uh, neurotex encapsulated cell technology where these cells can spit out of this implant a neurotrophic factor called CNTF, and with a simple pars plana surgery, you can pop it in the eye, and it'll make CNTF inside the eye for years. And our early data from glaucoma patients and ischemic optic neuropathy patients suggest that this is going to be really... Um, uh, there's definite evidence of biological activity in glaucoma patients. Let's put it this way. It needs further study. Now, the further study is the issue. In primary open glaucoma, let's just say on average you have a population that's getting worse at some slow rate over many years, um, and then you're trying to test some neuroprotective or regenerative therapy. It can take a long time. These are long trials. It's very hard to get companies to go into these. So the idea that Victor and I have been talking about and very excited about, to my mind, is, uh, you know, in the case of a K-Pro patient, or you could say a cornea transplant patient, but in particular in a K-Pro patient, we know the very day that their optic nerve is going to start going downhill. And that's unlike an open-angle glaucoma patient. This will happen, as it stands right now, in a very high percentage of patients. And so could this be sort of a fertile testing ground in these patients who are going to get worse over a short time period, could this actually be a fertile testing ground where we could really team up and propose studies together to take neuroprotective candidate therapies out of the laboratory and start testing them in a, in a really viable and, and needed population in the clinic? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, the next speaker, as you know, KPROS, we attract all specialties. And needless to say, we need retina here. So it's a pleasure to introduce Bill Freeman, who's going to talk to us about preoperative evaluation and tamponade considerations in patients undergoing KPRO. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Victor. So it's great to be here. It's a very short walk uh, from my office across the street to here. So that's perhaps one of the nicest things. Uh, we're uh, privileged to have probably the only freestanding retina research center in the country, and we get to do a lot of interesting imaging and studies on many patients, including those uh, of Dr. Afshari uh, mm -hmm. regarding KPRO. Uh, okay, end of show. We got this started on the last slide, but here is the first slide. <coughs> Uh, so welcome, uh, everybody, to UCSD in La Jolla, and uh, if you want to visit the Jacobs Retina Center next door, just let me know. Uh, I have to confess that I'm cornea trained. I did a Proctor Fellowship, so when they tell me the problem is the retina, not the cornea, and I see Desmade's folds in the cornea, I actually can say, no, it isn't. But the K-Pro is a real challenge for retinal imaging, and uh, I want to just review with you. This is old data from the Medicare database. And when my good friends in anterior segment do what they do, which occasionally uh, includes anterior vitrectomy, uh, you greatly increase the risk of retinal detachment and other retinal problems, but that risk continues to rise over many years. So we have to respect the fact that some of these K-PRO patients either have or will get into trouble retina-wise. And, and of course, before we operate on these patients, we can't see anything. Sometimes after the K-PRO is put in, you may not see so well either with these uh, membranes that occur in the back. And I want to remind you that it's difficult to see retinal tears in eyes with poor media, but here is that same tear imaged with B-scan ultrasound. So if you're going to do a K-PRO and you're going to do this in a patient with a, that also has a retina history or has had an anterior vitrectomy, et cetera, a very careful B-scan exam will actually find retinal tears for you and certainly small peripheral detachments, and you may want to consider doing that. Uh, you can do it if a K-PRO is in place, but it's harder because you've got to work around the K-PRO a bit. Uh, Wide-angle OCT can pick up retinal tears, as you see here, 
And we've been trying to do that through the K-Pro, but you usually can't get out that far, so that's a problem. But the wide-angle OCT can get through fairly bad media. So if the cornea is not completely opaque, you may get some useful image in the retinal periphery, and it may be worth uh, doing. Uh, this is work that we published a couple of years ago, and you can see uh, small retinal detachments, you can see traction tufts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, you don't want to miss something like this and put in the K-Pro and realize that uh, the patient can't see and it's because they have a giant retinal tear. Uh, here's another image of a giant retinal tear. So when a K-Pro is in place and there's a retina problem, we have an issue because we can do posterior dissections, but it gets a little bit difficult to work in the far periphery. So we have to use other tricks to work around it. But of course, the wonderful thing about the K-Pro is it stays clear, and I have yet to see one suffer from corneal edema. <laughs> so for us, that's fantastic, and it's also fantastic because we can use, uh, uh, shall we say, la, el, la acete silicona, right? We can use silicone oil, and of course, we cannot use oil in a aphakic or even in some pseudophagic guys that have corneal transplants, so if the oil gets into the AC, that's gonna be the end of the cornea eventually. So a big advantage for us with the K-Pro is we don't have to worry about corneal toxicity from silicone oil. There's another problem with intraocular pressure, and actually as Jeff gave his very nice talk, it occurred to me that, that all of you who do cornea surgery should visit us in the retina room. Because we have a unique circumstance. We have a manometer attached to the eye when we do the vitrectomy. And we set the intraocular pressure at 20, 30, 40, whatever we like. And at the end of the case, we press with our fingers and we judge whether or not the retina, whether or not the intraocular pressure is too high, too low, is the eye hypotenuse, et cetera. But we have a manometer attached as well. So you could actually practice digital pressure, and I've done this, I've tried it with a Q-tip, I've tried it with an instrument, and I can tell you, even the kind of glove you wear makes a difference, and I promise you it's very hard to know what the intraocular pressure is by touching the eye in any way. And we have manometer-controlled intraocular pressures. In any case, we can deal with posterior problems, but the anterior problems are very, very difficult. And of course, as I mentioned, we can use silicone oil with impunity in K-Pro eyes. However, that could be associated with glaucoma as well, because you've filled the eye with silicone. Whatever angle is working that's left is going to be blocked. So the idea of a tube or some kind of shunt is a good one, but the oil may, may clog that. So these are some images through uh, eyes with K-Pros. And as you can see, this is all Heidelberg stuff. Uh, by financial disclosure, I don't own Heidelberg, but in the past they've supported our research. Uh, Heidelberg is between the Heidelberg and the Zeiss, these are the two most common SLO angiographic type instruments. And in your patients, you may find, this is a patient Natalie did, the patient was delighted with her vision afterwards, but the OCT gives you a very nice image and you see the outer segments are gone. So this is why this patient is only uh, 2100. This is a, a, another wide angle image, this is infrared, so it's very comfortable for the patient, but you can't get out to the equator easily and you're not gonna easily find peripheral retinal breaks. Uh, this is uh, one of the actual K-Pros inserted and you can see the fibrous membrane behind the eye, and I'm gonna leave you with some thoughts about that. Uh, but when you have a K-Pro and fibrin membrane behind it, the aperture to actually image the retina keeps getting smaller, and as you can see, you get a lot of reflexes, and it's very difficult with scanning laser OCT. You do get some image, as you see here, but it's very, very difficult uh, to image these eyes. So when you send the patients over, we know we have to get rid of that fibrous membrane, but of course it may well uh, regrow. And sometimes you just can't see uh, very much at all. So here is an eye with the multicolor, couldn't get a view, but with infrared OCT, you can see an area of retinal edema in the posterior pole. So the OCT can be pretty good if the media is not ideal. If the fibrins cover the whole K-Pro, you're probably not gonna uh, see a lot. So again, what we like to do 
is avoid this situation where we have retinal detachment, multiple membranes, and peeling them, especially because it's difficult to do this out in the periphery. And that's a real issue uh, with the K-Pro. And what I want to mention in closing is that what's really going on, I think, with these membranes on the K-Pro is that all of the debris in the eye, all the inflammation, will fall down to the bottom. And this is what causes inferior PVR. And you probably are just getting a scaffold growing actually on the K-Pro. I think it's the same problem that we have with PVR. Uh, and we've been addressing this by looking at a new intravitreal delivery system. If you have a K-Pro <clears throat> and you have a retinal detachment, if you fill the eye with gas or oil, all the debris is going to fall to the bottom. It's going to detach the inferior retina and grow over the K-Pro, and that's going to be a problem. So intraocular uh, therapy is becoming very popular, as you know, and we've developed a system uh, where we can load nanoporous silicon with drugs, in this case Avastin, and this will dissolve and release over a period of six months, but you can inject these particles. They're on this order size of triamcinolone crystals. So these drug delivery systems, if loaded with anti-proliferators, may be very helpful in the K-Pro world because I think that would probably inhibit the growth of uh, all of these membranes. So that's what we're working on in the laboratory that may be of interest to you. And actually, if you do scanning EM, this is nanoporous silicon that we then packed with drugs, and we can make the pores in the silicon such that they are on the same size as the molecule we want to release. So we can customize this, and this will be great to control inflammation and proliferation uh, in the very complicated patients that we all deal with. So thank you very much, Natalie, for asking me to come, and congratulations, we're still on time. And all the speakers for staying on time. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, my co-chair, uh, Essen, who's going to talk about extrusions and melts, another of our favorite complications. I have no um, related um, conflict of interest to my talk. Um, I apologize. I have the older slide, older version of the slide for um, distribution of keratoprostasis, but you have seen multiple um, presentations this morning demonstrating that the utilization is is um, getting um, higher and higher, both in U.S. and um, outside of U.S. So as we do more of more more and more of these surgeries, we started seeing more complications. Um, today I will be um, talking about sterile keratolysis and melt um, complication. We just recently published a paper, a retrospective multicenter case series in the Journal of Ophthalmology. Um, surgeries were done at five centers in US. 139 eyes um, were uh, included. Uh, the interesting thing about the study is that um, we had a long-term follow-up um, in these patients. Um, about um, half of the patients, about um, half of the patients had uh, four years or longer follow-up. So this is a good case series um, f to study uh, long, longer-term um, complications. The number one complication was sterile corneal necrosis, and, and the rate increased uh, with the increasing follow-up um, time. Um, although we had good um, retention rate, 67% at seven years, some of the prostheses had to um, be removed. 35 of the 139 keratoprostheses were removed um, by the end of the seven-year follow-up um, between one month to five years after surgery, but on average after two years. Um, the main reason for removal of the keratoprostasis was sterile corneal necrosis and melt. But um, uh, I have to um, state that about a, a, a fourth of the patients had ocular surface disease in the series, including autoimmune diseases and um, chemical trauma. Here's a patient that I received from um, Middle East. The patient has um, advanced cicatrizing keratoconjunctivitis. Um, this was presumed to be from trachoma. 
The patient had a good outcome shortly after the surgery, um, although the vision was not any better than 20 over 60 because um, the patient also had type 2 diabetes, which was not under good control. But as you can see, the uh, view to the back was crystal clear. Um, this prosthesis remained good for about a year and a half, um, about 19 months or so, after which she started having a melt around the optical part and um, a subsequent um, infection with gram-positive bacteria, and um, which quickly progressed into endoptomitis and the uh, prosthesis had to be removed and replaced with a tectonic keratoplasty. <coughs> In some of these case, cases, especially when there is no infection but only sterile um, keratolysis, the problem can be addressed with tectonic procedures. Um, we have used um, amniotic membranes um, to create patches around the optical part, especially MBO5 um, is a pretty good material. It, it is 110 microns and it can be used as multiple layers or just one layer, single layer. Um, it can be, the tissue can be treffined using regular um, treffins. We do use these reusable metal treffins at, at Wilmer um, to basically create a donut shaped patch which can be um, cut on either both sides or just one side and wrapped around the optical portion of the prosthesis. If the melt is not so bad, one layer or multiple layers of the amniotic membrane will do it. But if the melt is extensive and there's frank uh, exposure of the back plate, a thicker tissue might do better. Uh, I have used um, sterile corneal irradiated, uh, gamma irradiated sterile corneal tissues for that purpose. And, and the good thing about this is that they come ready um, treffined and you just make a slit and wrap it around the prosthesis. Um, and mostly these also work, but sometimes in these patients with um, uh, underlying autoimmune diseases, uh, systemic immunomodulation uh, need to be employed in order to um, prevent remelts. Here's a patient that, again, I acquired from uh, Middle East. The patient had a history of bad atopic dermatitis and atopic conjunctivitis. Both eyes were blind uh, with severe conjunctivalization and keratinization of the ocular surface. Um, perhaps looking back, perhaps I should have done a type two, but uh, I have to admit I have no experience in type two. Um, so I did a type one prosthesis in this patient and did a, a little bit of a tarsography. And initially I placed an amniotic membrane uh, right at the conclusion of the surgery. He went back home at around two months. He was doing great, um, but he started melting. Uh, he, he is uh, from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. They placed an amniotic membrane um, overlying the entire ocular surface for a melt and placed them on some um, fluoromethylone and um, uh, Vigamox antibiotics. The patient started, the, the melt um, started getting actually worse and worse worse. Even the amniotic membrane started getting um, thinner and almost disappeared. There's a little bit of a, a uh, almost an exposure of the back plate in here. Um, I uh, subsequently acquired a patient. I asked them to send a patient to me and this is um, how the prosthesis looked like. Uh, basically there's frank extrusion and exposure of the back plate, a, a thick retroprosthetic membrane. The, the first thing you need to do in these cases is rule out an infection, which needs to be handled in a different way, of course. This patient did not have any um, infection. I went ahead and placed crescentic um, um, grafts using MBO5 um, around the optical portion. And then Dr. Eilif, um, Nick Eilif, who is a, an, an oculoplastic surgeon at Wilmer, um, who is one of my best um, friends there, along with the glaucoma specialist and retina. <laughs> so um, he went in with me and we dissected the upper tarsal um, conjunctiva, pulled it all the way over onto the um, prosthesis and tucked it into the bottom portion of the bulbar conjunctiva, almost towards the uh, inferior fornix. 
uh, in that patient, there was no usable um, Balber conjunctiva. A Gunderson flap could not possibly be performed. Um, this is a sort of a drawing of the surgical technique. So this is the area, um, conjunctival area that, that we basically used. It brings down the upper lid as well. So it, it's good thing it um, decreases the interpalpable fissure and the exposure. Subsequently, about two, three months afterwards, a uh, small lamellar um, uh, opening can be uh, performed using uh, dermatomal punch trephins, uh, 3.0 millimeter in diameter. Um, this patient um, went back to where he was. His um, post-operative best ever vision was 20 over 100 because he also had hypotony in the same eye um, and macular edema, which is actually good um, at the setting of um, keratoprosthesis because they almost always get somewhat higher pressure. The one problem with this technique is that there's the crater effect, which is the same thing as we saw with alpha core keratoprosthesis. Um, dust and dirt gets in the way here and collects and um, blurs the vision. So frequently the patients will need to take a Q-tip, wet it with um, perhaps a topical antibiotic and clean up the optical portion. Another problem is that upper lid um, goes down and closes the um, optical portion. Uh, in most of the cases. Subsequently, uh, a uh, lid surgery will not, will, might need to be uh, performed in order to raise, raise the upper lid so that the patient can have um, some vision. Um, we have uh, some more details about the technique and, and um, the paper with the details is in press in the journal Ocular Immunology and Inflammation. Another, um, another advantage that we have at Wilmer is that we have PROS um, program, um, the large uh, diameter um, custom-made scleral lenses. We have that available. Um, sometimes in patients with not so bad ocular surface diseases, we fit the patient with PROS prior to the surgery. Um, here is a patient that came from um, Chicago. Um, alkali burn, eight corneal transplants, and he still had um, failure and non-healing epithelial defects. The patient was fitted with pros prior to the surgery um, after a tube shunt. In these patients, the tube shunt will need to be uh, performed in a special way where um, no need, it needs to be uh, inserted into the anterior chamber within the scleral tunnel and far away from the limbus as far as possible and uh, so that no need, uh, so there's no need for a, a basically scleral, scleral patch graft or, or a pericardium patch graft because otherwise um, it's harder to fit the patient with pros. As you can see, um, the um, limbal part um, fits nicely and this patient achieved 2025 vision and it lasted for over three years now. And um, with the tube, the pressures have been also very good. Well, in, in conclusion, um, it, it seems that there has been a recently renewed interest in the keratoprosthesis. When I first started, when I first started doing this type of surgery uh, back in 2004, only less than 100 of these um, had been placed in. Um, and frankly, my first keratoprosthesis surgery was using alpha core surgery. I had no intention to use um, Boston keratoprosthesis until um, I actually got yelled at by, by Dr. Dolman um, because it did, it did have, an, well, it was more or less viewed as a last resort in, in basically we would receive these totally blind eyes for this type of surgery. There was some, um, there was much misunderstanding about the surgery. Now, um, this is my go-to surgery for um, graft failure cases. I've, I've never performed um, any more than three grafts in, in a single eye. And, and I receive patients who have had thus far eight, nine grafts in the same eye. After the second graft, I switched to um, keratoprosthesis. So it's not exactly saved for the worst eyes. It, it's good procedure, wonderful procedure for um, just graft failure cases. In fact, I have a, a talk about that um, at the World Cornea Congress. It's a complex surgical procedure. It requires a team effort. Um, it's best to be best friends with glaucoma, retina, and oculoplastic surgeons. But at the end, it's, it's very satisfying to the patient as well as the doctor. Um, uh, most importantly, 
patients with ocular surface diseases are at risk uh, at a higher risk for um, all the all the complications than anyone else so they need to be watched very very carefully but they are eligible to receive the surgery even the type 1 thank you thank you thanks Essen. Uh, actually it's nice to be yelled by Dr. Dolman <laughs> <laughs> Better than by the professor. <laughs> There's nothing comparable to Dr. Foster's yelling. there. We've been there. <laughs> Too many times. So, so uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jose de la Cruz, who's going to talk to us about the other big complication that we most commonly see. Uh, and we still try to figure out why. Uh, Retroprostatic membranes. I'll be presenting on behalf of Dr. Cortina. She could not make it to the meeting, so of course they lay it on me. Um, so as you've, you've heard, uh, the different complications, as, as Dr. Rappick had talked about melts and so on, as I was looking at these, some of these melts, there, a lot of them you see there is a membrane behind it. Uh, and as we learn more about them, uh, sort of making correlations in regards to are these, to a certain way, uh, contributing to the situations. So I have no financial interest in to disclose. Uh, as Sadir uh, uh, Hanush would say, I have more of a, uh, a financial burden more than an interest. <laughs> Uh, so, anyway, so retroprostatic membrane, there is the most common complication of capo surgery uh, in some of the series. Between 25 and 65 percent of the patients uh, have that or present that with the RPMs. Uh, their clinic is significant in regards to their obscuration of, visual, of the visual axis, uh, and also in some cases, it might even uh, be a risk of curdle lysis. So, risk factors that pre diagnosis, uh, according to the uh, studies that have been uh, published, infectious heritiasis is 70.6 percent, and enteritics also or risk factors uh, as far as pre diagnosis. RPM development, as you see here with the Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, at the time of development of RPMs in patients undergoing the type 1 curative prosthesis. And uh, what do we, how do we evaluate and follow RPMs? Uh, prior to using uh, anterior segment OCT, we basically diagnose RPMs when they ever reach the optic. And then we had no idea if it was thick or, th or thin or what, where it was coming from. But as we incorporate anterior segment OCT, then we see that the, this is not only uh, uh, something that we see, uh, but also as far as the thickness that, that takes uh, uh, something uh, very important to take into account. This is an example of a, of a capro implanted that see the top left without the RPM, as you see here. And as time goes by, obtain uh, post optic week one, showing a thin, bright band forming at the backplate uh, aqueous interface with slight thickening of the backplate titanium ring interface around the stem. You see the arrowhead there. And then remaining figures from top to right to bottom, right show the RPM as it basically progresses over time. And uh, and some of the papers that have been published out of, uh, of Chicago and other uh, institutions, you see that we correlated the risk of melt with the membrane thickness. Uh, it was significantly greater in eyes that uh, developed melt compared to those that did not. In fact, the mean thickness, 268 microns uh, in the melt group versus 193 microns in non-melt group. So in the group, and just giving you a very quick uh, showing of the results of the study, uh, in eyes with melts, 100% uh, showed anterior segment OCT evidence of the retro backplate uh, RPM compared to 15 out of 44, 34% in eyes that did not melt in these cases. In eyes with a retro backplate RPM and anterior segment OCT, the risk ratio for developing a subsequent melt was 2.9 with a 95% confidence interval compared to eyes without evidence of RPM. So going back in regards to uh, uh, the, uh, the early uh, uh, designs of KPRO, it was about a 51% rate of melt with a solid backplate. And as we introduced and uh, as, as the uh, introduction of a new design with the uh, holes in the backplate, we allowed uh, aqueous humor to be in contact with the donor tissue. And that in, uh, with other, other things that were incorporated would uh, minimize the possibility of melting as that tissue receives more nutrition. So, a very dense RPM could potentially then limit aqueous nutrition to the graft by including the backplate. And, and some of you have seen these cases in which you have a person that's extruding, but they're sighted negative. And in fact, they walk around with a 20-25 vision, and the backplate is looking at you. And you're like, well, should I take it out or not? And then you're actually doing the surgery, remove the capro, and the cornea is nice and steady with a nice RPM, keeping you everything steady. 
So this is, you know, one of the sources that we sort of identifying is, is RPM a real uh, uh, player in these issues of extrusions and melts? Anyway, going back to RPM treatment, as we know, you do YAC laser in cases in which there's vascularization. We uh, do parsplenum membranectomies in these cases, and the k is removal or exchange. So where are the memories coming from? As you have read in the past from our colleagues from Boston, the, the, the paper that uh, came out from Boston a while ago in 2011, you see the high magnification of the whole scrap junction with the arrow there, disclosing a radiation of the fibrous membrane from the hypercellular stroma of the host cornea. The donor in the uh, corneal tissue at the interface is sharp and postcellular, as you see there. And further on, indications for exploitation in these cases were RPM resistant to YAG, Capro melt, one of the cases, desmetacil. So in this study, stromal down growth is the major contributing element to RPM formation, and metathacylic lens epithelium or tissue may also be present, according to the paper that was written in 2011. So we go further on, and we decided to then start removing these RPMs and actually doing uh, histopathological immunohistochemical Immuno, sorry, I'm Puerto Rican. These words don't come out sometimes. Uh, immunohistochemical analysis uh, of the melt associated uh, uh, RPMs. So, seven eyes of seven patients were explanted and sent uh, for histopathological analysis, and then RPMs were peeled and stained for cytokeratin 7, CDIA13, CD3, and so on, as you see here. An example here I'm not removing, or we're not removing here the donor tissue. We're actually removing the RPM itself. So as you see here, when they grow, they grow really thick. They're actually, in some cases, even thicker than the actual cornea. And you see here an example of a, 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 corn, a, a keratoprosthesis that it's uh, slowly thinning or melting. You see the gap here. But on the other end, you have the RPM at the bottom here, basically kind of saving you from having any type of entry of acris into the interior chamber or the opposite direction. So. Here we have then the results here. We have the division of the different cases, sequential conjunctivitis, AKC, uh, and iridia, and then the different stainings, and they were <coughs> positive or negative in these cases. AKC, you see the CD3, SMA, and Vimentin were positive. And uh, for example, uh, uh, limbosome cell deficiencies in Peters anomalies uh, were CD3 positive in, the, in Peters anomaly, but basically negative in the limbosome cell uh, deficiency uh, cases. And further on, as you see here. So just to give you an example here, the example of the uh, cytokeratin positive staining with positive inflammation, you see this is an RPM, which is completely different from which I'm show you later on. You see there's a lot of inflammatory components in this RPM. And going further on here, then I show you another example of a, a uh, cytokeratin negative in hypercellular membrane. You see here completely different. But these are all both RPMs. So they, they, they are behind the capro, but they have, uh, appears to be different etiologies. And, and further on, we did this sort of in a few cases, uh, in here you see uh, A and B in the top, uh, fluorescence and C2 hybridization using a dual color XY um, probe and diomidine to, that's a long word, counterstating showing a representative interface cells from donor recipient sex mismatched RPMs. And in C, you see in, in the RPM obtained from two female recipients who received male corneas. So 100% of the cells showed an XX carrier type, and in D, uh, one RPM from a male recipient who received uh, uh, the opposite there, as you see. So, in summary here, we describe a wider range of histological characterizations for melt-associated RPMs. A staining pattern suggestive of possible epithelial uh, downgrowth was evident in a number of our patients, and most specimens seem to originate from host cells, but, not, but, but donor cells can also contribute to RPM formation. Only some membranes have evidence of inflammatory cells, and steroids will likely not have an effect on every RPM. We know that in some way will, but not in everyone. So can we prevent the formation of membranes? You know, there's effective steroids. There's papers have been written about this. We basically focus it more on the patients that, that have more of inflammatory components that might have an effect. But as you saw in the hypercellular ones, they just might not. So then we go then to the, the materials, PMMA versus titanium. We have more experience with PMMA. We're, getting, we're starting to get more experience with titanium. Uh, and so we, 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 we theorized that we would get less RPM formation in titaniums because of the materials and the, and the interaction that we see here. Better cross-species of the PMA versus the titanium, and it's bulkier PMA versus the titanium because of the material itself. So, of course, with OCT, that sort of crews up all our studies because we can't use uh, the OCT very well to really see under titanium, even though we can go on the sideways. Uh, but we can certainly evaluate it at, at an angle. So quickly here, the study that we did here was basically evaluating the difference between uh, formation of RPM with titanium versus human backplates, prospective case series, uh, done all in Chicago. 
And we see here that the, the RP information is 46% of the RP in cases are from PMA versus 38% uh, of titanium. If we exclude patients with less follow-up than the mean time to develop RPM, then 6 out of 13 in PMA, or 46%, and 6 out of 12, or 58% of these cases, uh, develop RPMs. So patients with a 1.5 uh, uh, follow-up of months, follow-up only uh, in titanium group, we invite, and we'll see this paper more in, in its uh, entirety, which I'll present again, because Dr. Cortina couldn't make it, in the Aconia uh, Congress. Uh, so in summary, RPM is the most common complication after Capro. Risk factors are prior diagnosis of infectious keratitis and iridia. Steroids may or may not have an effect on progression of membranes due to a wide range of histological characteristics. Thick membranes increase in the risk of stromal melts, and the small cohort our institution shows no difference in membrane formation with titanium backplates. Now, the question would be is, where are they coming from, and uh, how do they happen? Well, like some of you, I remember in Spanish, we used to see this, this cartoon with the, the El Gran Mundo del Chico Adam. So the same thing, you'll, that's a, he would say, when he asked a question, he said, well, little Adam, that's another story. So that's what thing we'll, we'll, we'll do next, is finding out where they're coming from and why they're happening. Thank you. Uh, my associate, Guillermo Mezcua, will be talking about uh, infections and keratoprostesis. Thank you very much for the invitation for Dr. De La Cruz and Dr. Jean-Marie Perel. It's really a pleasure to share the podium with such experts in the field. Um, I also have no financial disclosures. My wife would like me to do more multifocals than Capros, and I'm sure Dr. Alfonso also, but um, I share a passion for this, and, and it's really great to be here. So the problem with the, uh, to understand the infectious uh, uh, problem with keratoprostesis, we need to understand the normal um, flora of the ocular surface. So if we if we look at this a very nice review of uh, what's in the ocular surface, we all know that gram-positive uh, um, organisms are, it's what, uh, has, it's what it's in, in our ocular surface normally. Um, very uh, very uh, um, few uh, uh, fungus can be uh, isolated readily, we can have gram-negatives. Uh, what happens if we, uh, if we take it from the eyelids of the tears? Um, about the same if the ocular surface is not inflamed. And if we put a contact lens in patients, we check patients that have a contact lens that's uh, asymptomatic with uh, um, uh, good hygiene, the uh, flora doesn't change that much. Uh, we have, again, mostly, uh, mostly gram, gram positives uh, that dominate the, the environment of the, of the ocular surface. If we examine pediatric patients, we're gonna find more uh, streptococcus uh, compared to, um, to adults. So, in Capros, we, we're putting a foreign body that's going to interact with all these organisms, and, we, and we're putting this foreign body from a sterile environment up to this area that has organisms. So depending on the pre-existing conditions of the eye, the medications that we're going to put in, and the time this is going to be there, um, and the, the interaction of the, of the host with the foreign body, um, it's a, a perfect recipe for infections, and I think that we've learned that uh, with the history of keratoprosthesis. So one of the complications that is unique uh, um, uh, for um, keratoprost keratoprostesis compared to corneal transplantation that we don't see a lot of endophthalmitis in corneal transplantation, uh, it's endophthalmitis. And that's what we want uh, to avoid in, in all of our surgeries with um, uh, keratoprostesis. So fortunately, endophthalmitis happens. Um, and it's really sad when you kept to treat this patient. This is a patient that I treated as a fellow. Uh, they came uh, to spend the winter in Florida uh, and came for uh, actually another problem in, in, in the contralateral eye with pseudomonas melt. And during the time, um, she um, uh, had autoimmune disease, she had Crescent syndrome, it was an um, immunosuppressant and developed this uh, candida endophthalmitis. If we look at this classic paper uh, in 2001, uh, the group in Boston reviewed retrospectively uh, 108 capros and they they uh, reported 13 patients that had bacterial endophthalmitis. And the organisms here were uh, mostly gram positives and mostly happened in patients with high risk characteristics, being Steven Johnson and mucous membrane pemphigoid, most of these patients. So they, they analyzed the data and they, they come up with the idea of maybe using prophylaxis uh, for this gram positive, being vancomycin, uh, the, what they decided. And, 
we can understand what happened with the first uh, years of keratoplastesis with this uh, nice study that, out of Canada where they uh, swabbed the fornix of um, patients with keratoplastesis that, that were on a prophylaxis with quinolones or uh, polymyxin, not vancomycin, and patients with uh, penetrated keratoplasty and controlled patients, quote unquote, healthy patients. And the ocular surface uh, uh, was pretty similar in, in all of them. Uh, the, the only difference was that in the patients with cardioprosthesis, there was a significant amount of resistance um, to uh, third generation and fourth generation quinolones. And this is probably what happened in the, and for the first 10 years. Uh, patients were having prophylaxis, but they were becoming some resistance, and then endophthalmitis started happening. Um, the idea of surveillance cultures came. Um, the, the, the reports from surveillance culture, cultures uh, out of the U.S., out of paper in Brazil, uh, it's not been promising, no significant difference in the flora from general ophthalmic patients. Uh, culture results do not predict endophthalmitis in this series of papers. Uh, there's a paper from the uh, University of Illinois uh, from Dr. De La Cruz uh, that shows that maybe culture in the contact lenses uh, would be a good idea in combination with the ocular surface to see if we can predict uh, infections. Um, so after the st uh, start of uh, uh, prophylaxis with uh, vancomycin, 40 milligrams per ml, and the recommendations to use it in collaboration with it, uh, in, in, in combination with a quinolone, um, this publication came, and it showed that there was a significant uh, decrease uh, in the number of endophthalmitis cases, even in the patients with high risk characteristics, in the Stephen Johnson patients and the patients with mucous uh, membrane pemphigoid, and we can see here reported in this in this graph. Um, the report from the, from the group in Rochester also demonstrated that the use of vancomycin is beneficial. All the patients that had endophthalmitis in their series uh, were not using uh, vancomycin as prophylaxis, and most of those organisms went gram positives. And just like everything in medicine, uh, once we started fighting uh, the gram positives, then a uh, the change in the flora happened, and we started seeing fungal endophthalmitis. And this report out of Boston showed uh, that there were cases of uh, endophthalmitis, or some definitive cases, some probable uh, cases, but endophthalmitis started to become a problem, and it's something that we need to be aware in patients that present with a low-grade vitritis. Uh, this, uh, this endophthalmitis is not, it's not as aggressive as the patients with uh, a gram-positive uh, endophthalmitis. Um, infection rate was higher in patients with receiving a prophylactic vancomycin, and this was statistically significant. And surveillance cultures, and like I mentioned before, did not predict the infection. I think another uh, um, uh, area that we need to be aware of is pediatric uh, keratoprosthesis. This is not very common. It's a very good idea because these kids can be uh, restored with vision fast. Uh, you can do amblyopia treatment much faster. There's no astigmatism, so it sounds really appealing. Uh, we, uh, fortunately, in Miami, we, had, we treated these three uh, patients, two of them referred to us, uh, and had you know, terrible outcomes with uh, streptococcal endophthalmitis. And the interesting thing is these patients were um, on the correct uh, prophylaxis. This, uh, the organism was sensitive to the medications these patients were taking. Um, one of the patients had the infection at the time of glaucoma, glaucoma surgery and, and lost the eye. Another situation that we need to be aware of is patients with caper and glaucoma. If we look at the, uh, sorry, if we look at the paper um, from, from Boston recently in 2014, I think this is an excellent paper that everyone doing keratoprosthesis should read, is that uh, the experience from, uh, from Dr. Dolman showed that um, 20 out of 30 cases of endophthalmitis had a glaucoma uh, implant, and uh, one of the patients, it was a blevitis that uh, caused the problem. So the management of endophthalmitis in Capro, you know, we do this by empirical experience. We don't have any uh, prosthetic uh, control trials. Um, we try to culture all these patients uh, sent for the micro lab. We use intracameral antibiotics uh, for broad spectrum. You could consider doing antifungals if you're suspicious. The timing of parsplanum vitrectomy, uh, it depends on who you ask. Uh, reversal of Capro into a PK versus changing the capro to another capro, it's another, it's another question that needs to be a study. And uh, when do we inject dexamethasone? How do we know we're not injecting dexamethasone in a patient that has a fungal endophthalmitis? So, so things that we need to study. The prophylaxis, what drugs, what antibiotics should we do antifungals in all of our patients? Uh, we, in Miami, we have a lot of uh, fungal infections, and thank God we don't see a lot of uh, fungal keratitis in, in keratoprosthesis. And what uh, medications are the correct ones for to prevent these infections? Uh, that also needs to be studying. How long we need to cycle this to prevent uh, resistance? 
So our protocol right now is to cycle antibiotics every three months or every, every time the patient comes to clinic. Usually we see the patients every two to three months. Um, we, uh, we use topical uh, iodine at every visit, change the contact lens. Uh, if the patient is unable to get fitted properly with a contact lens, we do a tarsography. We avoid nocturnal exposure. And in all of us that do care of procedures in Miami, we tell the patients before the surgery that they're not going to be able to go to the beach and uh, go inside the water and also in the, in, uh, swim in the pool. Um, this is data that uh, Dr. Gibbons is going to present later. Uh, this is just uh, our experience with AFIC and CAPRO for the five, uh, past five years uh, on the patients that we've done a complete vitrectomy with a retina surgeon uh, compared to the patients that had no full vitrectomy so far. The patients that we've done a full vitrectomy, we've seen uh, no cases of phlegmatomitis. Uh, we don't know how to interpret this data, but this is something that uh, we're very happy that we're not seeing as many complications since we're doing a, a full uh, vitrectomy. Um, this is a patient that recently uh, saw in, in, in our service. A patient had a capro for a severe corneal scleral melt after an uh, alkali burn from domestic violence. And then later on, she uh, came with this infiltrate around the stem, uh, suspicious for an infectious infiltrate. Uh, we look at the infectious keratitis in capro. I think this is a two great paper from Dr. Aldabi group and from Dr. Holland show that um, infectious keratitis is a problem that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of persistent epithelial defects. Um, uh, and, and the chronic use of bancomycin is predisposed to, um, to uh, fungal infections. There were similar rates of fungal infections in both papers. Both papers show that 50% risk of corneal melting in the setting of infectious keratitis, and this post-infectious melts can continue to progress even after the infection is controlled. So we need to be aware of that. And this is something that people are doing right now, trying to uh, use the cross-linking technology to make corneas more resistant. This is a publication from um, Greece that showed that this uh, corneas, that even in um, high-risk uh, patients, overall did uh, decently well. So we, this is some of the area that I've been interesting. Um, infectious keratitis and melting uh, can be controlled in some, in some reports with uh, cross-linking, especially bacterial infections. Here's an example of a severe melt on a patient uh, that came to my service. This is something that we see very commonly in Miami, severe pseudomonas melt. Uh, we cross-linked the patient was about to perforate, and now we can work on a patient that has a seal eye, it's not perforated, you can do a smaller graph, you don't have to do a large diameter graph. And this is the patient, um, I don't have the, this is the, the, uh, the protocol that we have with Dr. John Marie Perel. He built this machine for us, basically using the Dresden protocol. We believe that with this um, technology, we're making more resistance corneas. This has been already published. Uh, they're more resistant to enzymatic degradation. And uh, in this patient, the infiltrate got smaller. Uh, we also cross-linked the patient with, uh, with this uh, the patient with a capro that had the infiltrate. Um, but what about, what about if the patient had a fungal in it? We know that uh, riboflavin uh, cross-linking doesn't kill fungus very well. So we've been working uh, on a photodynamic therapy uh, protocol where we're using um, a different photosensitizer. And this is, uh, we're using rose bengal. Rose bengal is easily uh, accessible. It's uh, approved for ophthalmic use. And uh, we can activate this with a, gr a green light. And we've been doing this in vitro. We've been getting a very good result. We uh, published this in, uh, recently in AJO. We can show that we can kill uh, fusarium right here. Uh, we can kill aspergillus. We can kill candida, so very good to kill fungus. Uh, I think it would be a good option uh, to uh, sterilize patients with colonization of the ocular surface with fungus. It would be a good option. We can also kill very easily MRSA. And in summary, um, chiroprosthesis and, and, and the prophylaxis of infections, I think that this table resumes everything. You know, we, we uh, saw a spike in infections once they started the vancomycin, the changes in the, in the plate. Uh, uh, with the more holes to better nutrition of the cornea, started to eliminate a lot of these melts. We saw a spike in fungal infections, so we need to be aware of all of this and follow the patients very close. We need to educate our patients on the signs of problems, like decreased vision, redness, uh, floaters, and have those patients come back to our clinics uh, right away. And to finish, this is a, a patient that I treated in the past uh, few weeks, uh, sharing with Dr. Perez and Dr. Alfonso, that had a um, capro many years ago, about six years ago, and, and presented with a vitritis some months back. The vitritis got better with steroids and then came back a few months ago with the full-blown endophthalmitis. And when we operated this patient, I thought I was gonna find a significant uh, retroprosthetic membrane because I strongly believe on the, on the data of Dr. Jose de la Cruz that we're not nourishing this cornea as well. You can see this patient had a big fistula, 
here uh, superiorly uh, in communication uh, with, with the extraocular environment. Uh, when we remove this, uh, keeping with a biofilm, this patient has significant amount of biofilm in the posterior plate, and this is something that uh, Heather will, uh, from Dr. Parel's lab is gonna uh, present uh, later on today and uh, touch about the role of biofilm in infections in Campo. And with this, I thank you very much. I thank uh, the team in Miami and the, the team outside Miami that I constantly ask questions, Dr. Shoulders and Dr. Dela Cruz. Uh, thank you very much. And this is such an important session that I think we should take some questions and maybe take the time off from the top of the cloud. That was great. Could you flip back to the, your protocol at the Basque Department <coughs> visit and, uh, and treatment or prophylactic treatment? Well, it is contained a lot. We follow uh, um, your recommendations with vancomycin and uh, quinolone for, uh, mo for all the high risk patients and monocular patients. You know, I try as much as possible to keep this patient on vancomycin, but you can sometimes cost is a problem, sometimes the location, sometimes patients are in the Caribbean, you, you can't FedEx the, the compound vancomycin. So we, cannot, we usually alternate uh, uh, four generation quilinone for two, three months, with, and then polytrim for another two, three months, and you know, alternate that way. Uh, that's usually what we do. We're very strict with the Betadine uh, wash at the time of uh, the visit, and a new contact lens every time of the visit. I don't know if Victor, if you agree with that, that's usually what we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts, though? Hmm? What were your thoughts with the protocol? Well, it was <laughs> made a, a lot of sense. I'm, I'm just curious, does it, is it worthwhile changing the antibiotics coverage prophylactic every three months? We do. We, we, uh, that's um, I'm totally, totally empirical that I learned from Dr. Alfonso. We, uh, every, patient, every time the patient comes for follow-up, uh, we change if the patient is using moxifloxacin. Uh, we then change to uh, polytrim if the patient is a patient that's been uh, years out and it's a high risk, you know, it's a low risk patient, multiple graft failure that has a wet ocular surface with good lid closure. Um, those patients sometimes are not on vancomycin and, and are, yeah. I think Dr. Goldman's question, my question is, because I don't cycle antibiotics, if the impetus for doing that is because you see an increased instance resistant. of resistant organisms when you culture the k ocular surface as composed compared to a PKI or a non surgical eye, then are you comparing the fluoroquinolone resistance of those organisms on the surface in eyes which you're cycling antibiotics versus those you're not? Are you having an effect by cycling antibiotics? I mean, that's the question. If you can show that you're decreasing the resistance, then that would be a reason to compel all of us to consider starting to cycle antibiotics. Yeah. But until you show that, it's a, it it's makes big, sense, yeah. but there's no evidence to exactly. support it. Actually, we were talking about the, just during the flight that we, uh, uh, with the paper of De La Cruz, uh, using the contact lens. So trying to uh, do what they did and start removing these contact lenses and take samples of all the patients and see if we notice a, if we notice a difference. So that's something that we'll hopefully we'll present next year. Exactly. So see if there was an increase or decrease in colonies when the patient was on mycomycin versus a polyphenol, they showed that the patients that weren't on mycomycin, they still grow, they just grow at a lesser uh, amount than they did for using the polyphenol. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question for Essen. Essen, um, even though the cases you presented were pretty how much high risk, and as you said, maybe a type 2 or a osteodonto would have been better. Um, in your corneal melt protocols, um, maybe in the high-risk patient and non the high risk patient, do you have, uh, um, uh, do you use or start immunosuppressive therapy in patients that may not be on it or are on it and change it? Yes, yes, I, I do. I, um, um, if a patient has underlying autoimmune disease, I place them on um, oral immunosuppression about three months before the surgery. I usually like to use um, Celsect, uh, that's my go-to medicine because of um, good tolerability and safety. Uh, but for, for example, alkali burns, I, I don't do that. I just make sure that the lids are good and that I can fit a bandage lens and the eye surface is nice and wet. How long do you continue the immunosuppression? At least two years. 
And what, you know, the starting dose of cell sets, is it a gram BID or 500 BID or well, dose? Um, uh, it depends on the patient's size, but usually two grams. Okay, so one BID. Two, 500, two times a day. It comes in 500 tablets. Yeah, I mean. I've done three grams, I've done one gram total, but usually two grams per day. I mean, certainly in the, in the high risk patients, you know, the okay, and we so. it, yeah. Yeah, um, I'd like to raise some uh, comments and, uh, and uh, uh, suggestions. It seems that uh, all major complications are related to some, uh, to some risk factors. And the first is epithelial integrity, and the second is dry eye. The third should be uh, uh, persistent inflammation. And what about uh, uh, coronal anesthesia, the coronal nerves integrity? And the third is new vascularization. It seems to me to be that uh, the coronal planus is protective, uh, but what about the stromal new vascularization? It could be a risk factor or not. And regarding to that, I would suggest that epithelial integrity, since uh, often these patients are bilateral disorders, uh, what about uh, uh, a cultivated oral mucosa graft that can stabilize the epithelium? And the dry eye, is there any experience on the use of autologous serum hydros? And uh, for uh, innervation and also epithelial uh, uh, trophism, NGF could be a possible uh, solution. It will be, I hope it will be available soon on the market. And uh, for inflammation, what about topical biological? I don't have, I'm going to take this question. I don't have um, any experience with topical biologics. And I don't know of um, um, anything that's available in, in the US. Um, I've seen some papers about TNF alpha blockers being used um, topically, but I myself have no experience. Um, in terms of uh, panis formation, um, I agree with you that panis formation is good. And in fact, sometimes what I do is that, for example, for patients with herpetic hair that conjunctivitis, multiple failures, I will do a nimble teratomy, do my teratoperstasis, and pull, pull the conjunctiva all the way up to the um, optic. And act actually, I just suture it down so it doesn't um, retract. So pallus is good. In terms of uh, stromal, uh, stromal vascularization, unless there is uh, an interstitial keratitis, uh, an actively ongoing inflammation, I think it is still good. Neovascularization is a good thing. I do use cyclosporin topically in patients uh, with who, who are uh, prone to get melts in order to bring in neovascularization. Um, so whether stromal or um, superficial neovascularization is very good. Um, nerve growth factor, obviously that'd be great. Uh, but um, it's not yet available. I know we, we have um, studies ongoing in the, <coughs> in the US. Um, we just enrolled. So it is available. Don't pay. Pharmaceuticals is running a clinical trial where the first time to be enrolled about a week ago. We're talking about nerve growth factors. The problem is there's so many exclusion criteria for the study, including use of the top of the contact lens or any non preserved medication other than antibiotic. It's going to be hard to enroll a K pro patient. Mm -hmm. But those are the ones who I've been most interested in rolling in that study. Mm -hmm. But once it becomes available, obviously it, it'd be a good thing. Autologous serum tears, I actually did some studies on that myself. As long as the patient does not have an underlying autoimmune disease, uh, for example, like Sjogren's syndrome or mucous membrane pathogen, which I acquire a lot of those patients in my ocular service clinic, then the, um, autologous serum tears are very good. But I've done a small study, which was never published, um, when we, we checked um, certain inflammatory uh, markers, especially um, interleukin-2 and, and other inflammatory markers. I have, and, and again, N equals 12 or something. Um, I thought that the patients with underlying diseases um, have inflammation in their blood, so I would not like to use that. We do have a pharmacy close to Johns Hopkins. Allergenic, you know, that's interesting. We have a large serum tier program. We analyze over 100 eyes and we've included patients with autoimmune disorders. And we have not seen complications. 
and uh, we have not seen worsening of the disease. So it's interesting the idea of looking for a biomarker in the serum to see if indeed I think it is. And it's very small. Uh, Allogeneic, um, I have had a couple of patients where um, they both are females. The wife, um, 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 the one had a um, hepatitis C, I think, so the lab would, would not make the drug. And the other one, I cannot remember what the problem was, but we got um, blood from the husband. Um, their bloods were um, the same group. Um, I have uh, one last question uh, for Jeff. Jeff, if we, I love the idea of time zero of glaucoma. Um, if we're about to set up uh, a trial to proof of concept, how would you do that? How what? How would you design it? <coughs> well, what would uh, it take? You know, it sounds, in talking with a few of you today, even, and with you over the last uh, year or so, uh, it sounds like even across a few centers, we could probably think to recruit uh, or to have available for recruitment uh, perhaps easily 100 patients a year. And, um, and, and so I think it'd be very compelling actually to jump right into a randomized uh, trial design or a randomized crossover design where you might withhold something from a patient for the first year of follow-up or, or, or 18 months of follow-up and then offer it to them as long as everything's looking safe. And, uh, and there again, I think following patients with uh, stereophotography, OCT of the optic nerve, as well as whatever measures you can also get out of that patient would be very, I think, very reasonable. I think, you know, you're going to have to exclude patients in whom clarity of ocular media is going to be an ongoing um, uh, concern if you can identify that subset in advance. But otherwise, I think it's a very, uh, it's a very compelling group and it really answers for the optic nerve crowd, it really answers the question of, of, of in what patient population can we both ethically but also from a trial design perspective offer candidate therapies. Natalie, you're the organizer, so you definitely have the last word. Well, with regards to melt, uh, when nothing else has worked, I've used the vulcan mucosal graph and has put it, have put it around like a Y yeah. with an um, attachment adherence to the conjunctival. What are your thoughts, um, Essen? Yes, we have done that as well. Um, I actually learned how to do vocal mm -hmm. because the membranes are one now. <laughs> yes. Um, so it works in patients who don't have good conjunctiva. Um, it's harder to do because you have to go for the uh, mouth as well. Usually done on the general anesthesia. So. But I've done it. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll resume session now there. Thanks. <laughs> First talk will be by Dr. Della Cruz, Introduction of Imaging in K-Pro. Thank you, Dr. Kobe. It's a pleasure to be back here again. I don't really intend to be in the podium so much, but since people don't show up, I'll just sort of go in and, uh, and fill in. No, 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 no. I want to hear all you talk. That's the most important thing. That's why we're all here. So as Dr. Kobe had mentioned, uh, one of the things we want to talk about is imaging in this case. and. Uh, now, as I was looking at all the uh, uh, previous talks, uh, what I'm going to show you is probably just probably old news. So we'll throw in a little bit of a new stuff at the end. Uh, but as you know, as you know, there's different methods that we can image the the eye itself, especially in curative prosthesis. We have eyes like this that uh, we have basically the interior segment, and uh, we assume some we can operate, some we cannot. But at the same time, we don't even know what's happening inside the eye. So. We have different alternatives in regards to imaging the, uh, the anterior chamber prior or during uh, or after the procedure itself, talking about the keratoprosthesis, and it's between UBM and anterior segment OCT. This is, the, as you see here, some old uh, uh, examples of anterior segment OCT. I say old because you can tell this is actually uh, one of the uh, uh, threaded uh, capros that, that we expanded in the past, and this is one of the initial imaging techniques that, that we used. In fact, we even had these coronal images that, that we have here, and we sorted out this uh, these uh, uh, project at, at New York Eye and Ear. And we compared to then to ultrasound uh, by microscopy and uh, as far as preoperatively, it's always good to do a UBM. It gives you a lot of information, goes beyond the iris, which the, uh, the uh, OCT won't do. So you can plan in regards to your, your, your operative uh, approach prior to the capro surgery. But you see on the bottom, if you actually uh, image a uh, capro on a UBM, you're gonna get not much information. Otherwise it looks like the, the Batman symbol. Uh, 
So the alternative then, you know, as we all know, we've all written papers about and learned a lot from is anterior segmental CT and uh, how the, uh, the structures interact with the, uh, with the prosthesis itself. Uh, so some imaging examples here from those that you have not uh, seen or just not, not paying attention the whole morning, this is the actual capro itself. This is the front plate. We have the back plate here, sort of the remnant of an iris. And in this case, we have a, a, a intraocular lens that you see you're starting to have some prosthetic membranes is developing in front and behind. So this is a, obviously a pseudo-fake uh, keratoprosthesis. Uh, here, the same eye with the, uh, also with the tube here, and you see you do get some information from the UBM, but not as robust information as you would otherwise with the OCT. Another example of a UBM image, which give you, gives you a really nice view of the glaucoma tube, and in this case, this tube is in the interior chamber. Look how close it is to the capro backplate itself, and that's one of the ways that we started making our own recommendations in regards to where should we put the where should we put tubes when we're implanting them together with the capros and, and so on, and also seeing here, in fact, this is actually a, a old image, which we were all excited to show in the beginning, oh, great, we imaged the curve prosthesis. We forgot to show that actually this, this case was actually thinning and melting. But, you know, now we, of course, know that so we get much more information. Again, in this case, retroprosthetic membranes developing around the intraocular lens in this, in this particular case and basically coronal images of a membrane crossing through the optical component. <clears throat> Again, the, the information you get is not as robust with the UBM here. You see the, the, uh, the, the front plate or the optical component, the contact lens, and the, the secondary artifacts of the capro compared to the OCT. So clearly, once you implant the keratoprosthesis, OCT is an, ima is an image technique much more uh, uh, useful to you than it is uh, when you have the UBM post properly, but preoperatively, of course, UBM gives you more information beyond the iris itself. So going straight here, this is sort of one, one of the, 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 the papers that we wrote initially, which just gives you an overview of what the LCT can do versus what the UBM can do. And of course, once you implant the capro, a lot of the things that, uh, that, that predominate are with the LCT that can be seen versus the UBM, as you see here, other than just basically seeing your front plate, front surface with the UBM, but the rest of them are pretty limited. So now that we can see what's happening, is the capro causing problems or they really exist already? Because most of the patients that we approach for this procedure are patients that already have multiple uh, uh, failed transplants, multiple procedures. So we assume that the chamber's already been compromised, scarred, and so on and so forth. So we say when there is a complication, well, it's probably because they had scarred angles and so on and so forth. So how can then we differentiate that from us causing it? Us causing it, meaning implanting a prosthesis in the eye and causing more problems. Well. What we did was then we compared um, the, uh, the group of patients that, that had a primary capro, meaning that had no penetrating uh, uh, procedures prior to the, uh, uh, this test, and then the ones that had secondary ones, meaning they had multiple uh, transplants or multiple uh, intraocular procedures prior to the capro. So in theory, meaning that some had some scar tissue or did not have scar tissue versus the primary ones, which in, in theory had an intact interior chamber, meaning angle and so on. So you see an example here, you probably, as you've probably seen before, it's an example of the same eye, just at different angles. So depending on where you image it, you see here, say at 180 versus that, uh, that uh, sort of oblique angle, you'll see that, that it looks like the uh, iris is in contact with the, with the prosthesis here, causing some closed angle, versus some areas it's somewhat narrow, and in some areas it looks like it's open. So it depends on where you image it in regards to what you're gonna get in regards to uh, the, the view. So we looked at the uh, areas of anatomically closed angles versus the grading as far as the angle in different uh, cases, meaning primary to secondary. And you see here, 37% of the cases were primary versus 63 secondary, 20, 20 patients versus 34 patients. Aphakic versus pseudophakic, as you see here, we somewhat prefer the, doing the aphakic group uh, in our cases. And the back plate size also, we somewhat prefer the seven millimeter uh, versus the 8.5. And as you see here, 81% of the eyes with the com completely flat, effective functional tube chambers is not that much of a difference, even though it looks like there is anatomical meaning from the cornea all the way to the, uh, to the um, I'm sorry, from the back plate all the way to if there's an iris or not, and then functional from the, from, I'm sorry, anatomical from the cornea to the, to the iris if there's one versus functional meaning from the back plate to the iris if there's one there. Um, and as you see here, if you look at this picture here, you couldn't tell what's happening inside the eye until you look at the OCT, completely closed angle versus a, a somewhat open angle in comparison. So angle measurements, 
So you see here, there's some differences between the primary one versus secondary one, but over time, this, somewhat, this changes also. So, sorry, this slide didn't work. In 48% in of eyes with old percent of meridians image, there was an average of 8.81 clock hours of closed angle, 1.5 clock hours of shallow angle, 1.69 clock hours of open angle. This represented about an average of 264 degrees of angle closure, and 73.4% of the total angle was closed. And you see here, you also differentiate between PAS and closed angle, iris back leg touch, as you see here, and then basically the closed angle with PAS in the area. So also we looked at Sinequia formation in primary ones versus secondary ones. And as you see here, uh, mean clock hours in the primary one versus the secondary one, and as far as iris back leg touch, a number of eyes and mean clock hours, see the difference in both between primary and secondary. So OCT is uh, a, a valuable and non-invasive imaging tool to objectively evaluate iris behavior and iris angle status after caper implantation. In the majority of eyes implanted with capro, OCT imaging exhibited shallow anterior chamber depth, extensive angle closure, and synechia. These results suggest that capro implantation may induce anatomical changes in your chamber and angle, but I'm sure I'm not telling you something you already know. Uh, we just sort of, now we have an ability to compare between primary and secondary. We actually see that over time, these, uh, uh, the prosthetic device might affect the angle itself. So, trends towards decreased uh, um, anatomical closed angle and greater synechia formation in secondary capros, statistically significant decrease in ACA in three of the eight image meridians, and greater involvement of PAS and iris back plate touch in secondary capros, may be reflective of pre-existing synechial angle closure after multiple PKPs. Of course, the study limitation was the lack of preoperative imaging to assess baseline changes in the anterior segment prior to capital implantation, and analysis of anterior segment OCT uh, at only a single time point benefit of serial imaging, of course, in the, in, in, the, in the future will be beneficial. So how is this happening? So then we go to, remember the last meeting we had in Miami, we talked about the non-knowns and non-unknowns. Is surface contact adhesion polished versus non-polished an issue? And I bring up again, you know, little Adam here that's another story. So surface of Cape Rose, we, since we were talking about imaging, let's talk about unused Cape Rose. And some of you have seen these images before. This is an unused Cape Rose with an SEM, uh, nuclear microscopy image. You see the surfaces are somewhat rough and, uh, and, and it's sort of a Velcro type of image, uh, a surface. And then we compared here in an explanted keratoprosthesis and we compare the surfaces that are imaged, or I'm sorry, surfaces that are polished versus non-polished. The non-polished surfaces are very rough, so we're basically gathering a lot of biomaterial uh, uh, around all the surfaces here. And in the same eye, I'm just giving you sort of a, a more magnified view. In the same eye, we look at the optical surface, there, not as much biofilm gathered in the surface of itself. And in, in this actually particular case, we actually had a, 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 a intraocular lens, which was polished and did not gather the biofilm that we saw in the raw surfaces on the other eye. So, chronic inflammation could be a factor. RPMs and bioformation, the biofilm formation, probably all at some point together, but none unknowns. Recognizing the limited knowledge of the dynamic interaction of implanted capros with other anterior segment structures motivates us to keep producing the known unknowns. So, imaging provides a better understanding of interaction between AC structures and the prosthesis. Some problems are present, but most likely some problems we also cause when we implant the prosthesis. And perhaps the biofilm is playing a role to which we are starting to understand, whether it be something that also uh, uh, has to do with the uh, uh, overall uh, retention rate of the uh, prosthesis, this is something we'll find out uh, over time. So thank you very much, and also want to make a, a, a plug for actually all of you for the uh, involvement in the Curto Prosthesis book that, that's now out, and I uh, appreciate the help that you've all have given us to, to uh, make this happen. Thank you. Kuzar talking about glaucoma imaging in Capro. Good morning, uh, good afternoon now. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me to speak here. And I have been asked to present a brief review on how to follow up our Capro patients, particularly regarding imaging in glaucoma. Unfortunately, I have no financial interest to disclose. So glaucoma, as we have talked before, is one of the main unsolved problems in patients with keratoprosthesis. And they are technically very challenging eyes. We know intraocular pressure measurement has to be measured by finger palpation and all what that means. Clinical anterior segment and posterior segment evaluation can be sometimes impossible preoperatively and sometimes very difficult postoperatively. 
And so one reason imaging is so important is to have documentation for retrospective analysis and evaluate the progression of glaucoma, which sometimes can be very difficult in KPROIs. So first, as Jose de la Cruz already presented, the evaluation of the anterior segment. Anterior segment OCT is an imaging technique which provides very high resolution cross-sectional images of the anterior chamber and reproducible analysis of the angle configuration. It also allows us to observe the front plate, the back plate, uh, and the relationship with the other structures of the eye, such as the host cornea, the donor cornea, and possibly in some cases, the origin of the retroprosthetic membrane and peripheral anterior synechia. This is a reconstruction with images taken with the Fourier domain-based OCT, the RT view. But the real images you get with the anterior segment OCT RT view, as you can see here, are of higher magnification, but smaller field. We can assess the anterior chamber angles and compare them through time. Although sometimes, as Jose already said, it can be very hard to get good angle images in caper patients, particularly the ones with titanium backplate. Uh, it is interesting for us to study in a precise way the relationship between the angle configuration and glaucoma development, since even glaucoma specialists don't even really know how narrow the angle has to be to cause glaucoma or how much of the 360 degrees has to be closed. This is the anterior segment OCT uh, Visante. It has lower magnification but wider field. As you can see here, in one image you can see the whole capro and both angles. And as I said before, we can follow the anterior chamber depth and angle through time, as Kang did with the group of Chicago, as Jose presented, uh, in this study, from pre-op to one month post-op, three months, and six months post-op, showing the narrowing of the anterior chamber and the angle closure in a series of patients. More recently, Kian also did a similar study. An interesting paper that will be presented by Dr. Teneguchi in ASCRS shows that patients with Capro, even those without glaucoma, have narrow angles, and, then, and that they are as narrow as eyes with primary angle closure glaucoma and narrow angles. And probably this significant angle narrowing in Boston Capro eyes may contribute to the aggressive nature of this disease. And in another study that will be presented in the World Cornea Congress by Dr. Taniguchi, we compared the anterior chamber angles of eyes with Boston Capro with PMMA versus titanium backplates and the different size of backplates. And neither the material nor the size of the Boston Capro backplate had a significant impact on angle anatomy. Other purposes of the anterior segment OCT, we can take a close view of the capro graft interspace, and it may help in the early identification of corneal melting, allowing for closer follow-up, early intervention, and improved outcomes. So in summary, anterior segment imaging is useful to assess pre-existing angle closure prior to the Boston capro surgery, as mentioned before, due to the underlying disease or multiple surgeries done previously, and to follow up progressive angle closure post-operatively, as you can see in this case here, to aid in the medical or surgical treatment. Now the posterior segment imaging to monitor for glaucoma onset or progression by keeping an eye in the optic nerve. We know that the direct visualization is subjective and even variable within ourselves from visit to visit. So take these photos every six months or yearly, and if in doubt, even more often, to have a reliable documentation of the cap disc ratio. <coughs> Secondly, the retinal nerve fiber layer with spectral domain OCT, where we can objectivize the loss of retinal nerve fiber layer tissue. Cirrus is one of our favorites since dilation is not necessary and it allows us to get very good images. This, all of these are from caper patients. Also, the spectralis OCT is a very useful imaging tool providing optic nerve head and retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. It has the anatomic positioning system that uses structural landmarks 
to an always scan the same spot in every visit for each patient to track the changes and signs of progression. And of course, we recommend doing visual fields every six months to monitor functional changes. Usually, the optical part of the keratoprosthesis is enough to allow the KPRO patients to perform a reliable visual field. A good strategy for patients with low vision is to use the Goldman visual field and change the size of the stimulus from three to five. And this way we can integrate with all the previous glaucoma imaging and get a better analysis of the glaucoma progression and act accordingly before it's too late. And finally, wide angle fundus imaging to see the peripheral retina through the keratoprosthesis is possible. And there are three major systems presently available, the non-contact optos and the red cam and panoret that require contact with the ocular surface. The three cameras perform similarly, but the good quality pictures obtained with the non-contact optos, as well as its ease of use and safety, makes it our preferred choice. And the optos may also complement the B-scan in the examination of the peripheral retina through the keratoprosthesis, and it may even be superior in certain settings. Here in the first column, you see a patient that had a hypotony from a leak and choroidal detachment. And in the second column, you see a patient that had a vitreous tra traction band. So in summary, we want to monitor structural and functional changes with all useful means possible. In addition to regular visits every one to three months, depending on the complexity of our patient, don't forget to measure the IOP with finger palpation, Every six months, anterior segment OCT, visual fields, retinal nerve fiber layer, and disc photos. And once a year, wide angles fundus imaging, if possible, if you have any of these diagnostic tools available. Thank you very much. The talk will be by Dr. Joe Cialino, New Developments in Tissue Modifications for Improved Outcomes of the Boston k -Pearl. Thank you, Kathy. The, uh, the talk is really focused on collagen cross-linking of, of the donor cornea. And so I will, uh, there we go. All right, I have uh, no financial disclosures. And I'd uh, like to go straight into the problem here. Keratolysis or corneal melt remains a serious problem for Boston keratoprosthesis patients. As we saw earlier today in uh, Essence talk, over 50% of the eyes that needed a K-Pro replacement had a corneal melt. And other large uh, multicenter reports have also uh, found the same finding, that the cor uh, sterile corneal melts or infections related to corneal melts continuously are the most common cause of K-PRO replacement or K-PRO loss. So the question is, can we strengthen the tissue? Can we prevent corneal melts in K-PRO eyes? For over 10 years, we've had uh, suggestions and evidence that we can increase resistance of the cornea to enzymatic, uh, enzymatic digestion by cross-linking the tissue. And so this is an approach that we wanted to employ. So what we've done is we've taken human corneas and we exposed it to UV riboflavin cross-linking in different ways. One of the advantages with the tissue used for the K-Pro that you don't have for the treatment of, let's say, a keratoconic patient that you're treating in vivo, one of the advantages with the K-Pro is the graft can be flipped upside down. You could treat the posterior surface you could treat the anterior surface. You could soak in a riboflavin. You can re really, uh, you have a, a wide variety of different things you could do to the tissue to try to strengthen it. And so what we did is we started with the Dresden protocol and made some modifications from there to see which would be the optimal treatment. And then we placed the tissue in collagenase and looked at the time to degradation. So the, uh, the output here, the, what, what the number we're looking at is the time of degradation. And so what we found is that if you take a tissue and don't treat it at all, in the collagen solution we were using, it degrades in about five hours. 
And then if you cross-link the anterior surface, that's what the A stands for, you get progressively more, uh, you, you get a progressively slowing, if you will, of time to degradation. So we've also looked at cross-linking the anterior surface and the posterior surface. And what we found is you don't really have that much advantage to cross-linking the posterior surface. So in the end, what we found is that the Dresden protocol was actually the optimal protocol of the, of the, uh, the methods we studied. And interestingly, there was a very linear dose response to the cross-linking, meaning that if you cross-link for seven and a half minutes or 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you had a nice linear response. It peaked at 30 minutes. There didn't appear to be an advantage to cross-linking the tissue more than 30 minutes. Another interesting finding is we looked at gamma radiate tissue. There's a lot of advantages with gamma radiation tissue, particularly storage. And uh, it's been hypothesized that maybe it is more resistant to degradation than untreated tissue. So we've looked at it, and basically we found that gamma radiate tissue degrades at the same rate as untreated corneal tissue. Um, one of the very interesting findings, I think, is that there's some, there must be something, must be some effect that the gamma, radi gamma radiation has on the collagen fibrils because even after the tissue is gamma radiated, if you cross-link it, it nullifies the effect of cross-linking. So the tissues that were gamma radiated and then cross-linked um, degraded at the exact same rate. This isn't necessarily completely surprising. We've seen um, evidence of this when tissues such as the tendons that are gamma radiated, they've shown the same. And polymers used for drug delivery has the exact same results. Basically, when you um, irradiate polymers such as PLGA, you decrease the molecular weight of the PLGA. So there is, there is some support for, for this finding, but I, I still found it a little bit surprising. I expected that you know, maybe you'd have a, uh, some sort of synergy here. But um, it didn't seem to be the case. So what about human studies? That, those were all benchtop studies. We, uh, we obtained um, an IRB at our institution uh, approval for a pilot study and also physician IND through the NIH using that Dresden protocol uh, that we found to be optimal in benchtop studies. And so far, we've only, we've only uh, treated one patient. This is a patient who had a corneal melt before. This is the preoperative images. And afterward, this is uh, at one year. At two years, we've followed him, and he looks exactly the same. At the, at, so for this one patient, we haven't seen any melts. But that's only one patient. I think you really have to look to Dr. Kenilopoulos's, uh study. He has the most experience with this. Um, he, he reported 11 patients with an average follow-up seven and a half years. And none of these eyes developed melts of the crossing donor cornea. And these were eyes that are high risk of melts. One eye developed a melt in the host cornea. So that's very interesting. So it developed in the host cornea, but didn't develop in the tissue that was cross-linked. I, I think that might tell us something. Um, however, these are just case series, and it's really hard to say whether there's actually a benefit. So when that's the case, a prospective study is needed. Ideally, a prospective, randomized, multi-center, double-mass, vehicle-controlled clinical trial. Um, so we've, uh, we, we're actually a finalist for a... Uh, um, a DOD grant, and we were looking at that exactly. And so we have a uh, uh, collaboration between an iBank and also one of the leaders in the cross-linking industry, and the tissue would be randomized, treated by the iBank, half would be treated, half would be just uh, given a little bit of riboflavin on the, t on the surface so that there's, so that the investigator can't really tell whether or not they've received a treated tissue or non-treated tissue. Um, the tissue will be, like I said, randomized, cross-linked or untreated, then sent to the mass investigators who will then undergo the standard of care. And then we'll, uh, we have a, a mass central analyzing site that would be at Mass Ioneer that would analyze some images, including OCT, looking at melts and quantifying if there's any melts involved. The primary endpoint is time till K-Pro loss. So in summary, uh, despite the improvements of the K-Pro design, and there have been many, corneal melts or keratolysis remains a problem. Cross-linking appears to substantially increase corneal resistance to collagenase, at least in benchtop studies. The K-series and, and, and older reports have been suggestive that it actually works in humans as well. 
but for, um, but for us to determine exactly, I think we need a prospective study. For the human cornea, it's about 30 minutes of anterior cross-linking appears to be optimal, and that's basically the Dresden protocol. In our studies, the gamma radiation had no effect on corneal resistance to collagenase, and it appeared to nullify the effect of cross-linking. And once again, um, there's a need for a prospective study. Thank you very much. Um, so the constant evolution, even our existing devices, and my co-moderator, Dr. Catherine Colby, will discuss the advantages and disadvantages in new backplate size and materials. Okay, I changed the title a little. Uh, oversized backplates, are they the answer to our remaining K-PRO problems? I have no financial interests. Uh, this is a truly a labor of love. Uh, we know that retroprosthetic membranes are the most common complication after Boston K-PRO in up to two-thirds of patients. While generally thought to be an annoyance both for the patient and the physician, they can underlie more serious conditions like corneal melting. Our early work in a retrospective mixed group study showed an indication that the use of the titanium backplate might reduce the risk of retroprosthetic membranes. This slide has also been shown already from our paper from 2011, a histopathologic study of four explanted uh, K pros that suggested that the RPM was originated from activated keratocytes in the host cornea, suggesting that if we eliminated that pathway for movement of the keratocytes to the back plate, that we may reduce the incidence of retroprosthetic membranes. So this is my first oversized back plate patient. He's coming up on five years now, and when we first showed this picture at the Federated Society meeting, uh, literally a gasp went up from the audience that what are those crazy doctors in Boston thinking of now that you are going to put a 9.5 millimeter backplate into an eye? So here is uh, an, a posterior view of this, and you can see with the oversized backplate that the donor is here and the backplate overlies this. Uh, Andrea showed this image uh, from our paper uh, about a year and a half ago in cornea showing that the, there is a reduction in the swelling of the graft, graft host junction when uh, the large uh, backplate is used and no compromise on the angle structures which has also been supported in subsequent uh, work that will be presented at the upcoming World Cornea Congress. So the surgical technique here uh, is really well within the range of anyone who does k pros. This is my fellow sitting at the head seat. I'm the one uh, holding the needle driver somewhat ineffectually. And we've found that uh, the best way to get these in is with everyone having toothed forceps. Uh, and you basically can just ovalize the wound, slide them in, and uh, you'll see finally now I'll switch to another toothed forcep and actually provide some assistance to the fellow doing this uh, procedure. And there you go. So it's pretty straightforward to get it in. Uh, you'll see that this is uh, in uh, conjunction with a pars plane of vitrectomy. The ports are, are readily visible. So I reported on the preliminary data last year in Salzburg. Uh, currently I have 22 eyes of 20 patients uh, about equally split men and women. Most of them were oversized by one and a half millimeters, which means in a standard eight millimeter opening, uh, putting in a 9.5 backplate, you can also oversize using the 8.5 backplate and just create a smaller opening in the host cornea. Makes the suturing a little more challenging because you have less uh, donor cornea to sew to, but it can be done. The age range was uh, from adulthood. I did not include any of my pediatric K pros in this study. And then the indications, not surprising, mostly failed grafts, uh, some aniridia, and these were the two bilateral cases uh, neurotrophic, vascularized, scarred corneas, and then two patients had K pro replacement. So the mean follow-up is 21 months, but that patient I showed the clinical of is approaching five years now. And the pre-op vision is as expected in this population. Most were count fingers, a few hand motions, and then no one better than 2,200. 
Uh, preoperative glaucoma uh, was uh, not present in nine eyes, uh, and the remaining 13 were either on medications and or had prior surgery. And we did place either concurrently or before the KPRO uh, 13 valves. So the visual outcomes, I want to spend a minute on this because this is a little different than what I talked about last year in Salzburg. Uh, you can see in yellow the pre-op vision poor and the post-op vision in red better. But uh, again, I want to call out to you, uh, there are two patients in this series now that have gone to no light perception. We alluded to this in the first section of the, the meeting today. Everyone who's a cornea surgeon can put a K-Pro in. It's keeping the patients from having complications that really is the mark of a true K-Pro surgeon. And really, it's, I cannot overemphasize the importance of follow-up and aggressive management of complications when they occur. So in terms of retroprosthetic membrane, I reported in Salzburg three YAGs that I had done. I'm pleased to report a year later I have YAG no one else. Uh, the first one was an aneritic who uh, had, unfortunately, his valve tube came right across the central visual axis and seemed to act as a nidus for uh, the RPM formation. I yagged it, it recurred. I removed it, surgically it recurred. And then finally I went and replaced the K-Pro, moved the tube to the back of the eye, and he has been doing quite nicely with uh, 2070 vision, and he is about uh, eight months out now. There was one lady who had had failed graft for ice syndrome. Uh, she had an RPM that I yagged, and she's done very well. And then one of my K-Pro failures, uh, a, a man who had had multiple surgeries since birth, uh, who had the, the development of a, a retroprosthetic membrane, which was yagged, it recurred immediately, uh, associated with a lot of membranes in the vitreous cavity, which subsequently produced an RD. And despite PPV, he eventually ended up going to tysis and failure. So glaucoma, uh, 16 of the eyes have been stable. Four eyes did develop new glaucoma, uh, and most of which were managed medically. One had a CPC. And then interestingly, the um, one patient developed a progressive optic neuropathy, never had a high eye pressure. And this was a guy who had failed grafts. He had a K-Pro placed. Um, he then had an episode of sterile vitritis. Uh, he was tapped and injected, then had a retinal detachment. And when everything cleared, he had progressive optic neuropathy with loss of vision to the 2,500 level, but never documented high IOP. Uh, two graft failure patients had progression. One had a valve and one had a CPC. And we are looking at this data prospectively. The imaging systems are really wonderful. We will certainly, in five years, have much more data about the, uh, the natural history um, as these studies are completed. So five retinal detachments, and uh, J.C. Abad, who will present his data a little later, and I were chatting about this over the break. Um, this, I, I can't think of a way that this is related to the oversized backplates, but nonetheless, there were five detachments in my 22 eyes. Two patients had a prior history. One patient had had an open globe trauma. Uh, the patient uh, that I spoke about with the multiple prior surgeries, and one aneritic who'd had multiple episodes of vitreous hemorrhage, hemorrhagic choroidals, and eventual retinal detachment. Two people had sterile vitritis, or as we really should call it, idiopathic vitritis. Uh, one patient had a subtenons injection and was fine. And the other patient, interestingly, had multiple episodes of vitritis that occurred five to seven days after major dental work. And uh, after a discussion with my ID specialist, we placed this patient on amoxicillin prophylactically because uh, he was in the midst of a major dental reconstruction. And uh, although it's anecdotal evidence, uh, he took two grams of amoxicillin four hours before his dental work, and uh, the vitritis did not come back. So six eyes lost vision. Uh, I think this is very important when we talk about uh, K pros because um, uh, one of my younger colleagues was saying he really worries about causing blindness in patients. And I told him, 
uh, don't go into K-Pros if you uh, have a fear of inducing blindness because we, we certainly do despite our many successes. I've talked about a couple of these already and you can see many of them are bad vision to start with and bad vision after, but two, no light perception. And this one I probably feel the most bad about, and I'll discuss this in a moment. Uh, he was 2400 before and went to no light perception. And then this was the patient I had mentioned earlier with a progressive optic neuropathy without high IOP. So I'll spend a moment talking about this one disastrous failure. Uh, this was, again, a man with uh, congenital eye problems, had had multiple, multiple surgeries, and he was sent to me by an, a referring ophthalmologist for a CAPRO because he'd had grafts that had failed, and this was, of course, his good eye. He uh, was count finger, his vision had been as good at 2060 when his graphs were clear, but he came to me count fingers and his IOP was 12 on three glaucoma medicines. So we performed an aphake at K-Pro with a valve and a full PPV. Uh, I did oversize him into his graft, existing graft uh, opening, which was seven. I put an 8.5 millimeter backplate and he had a shallow RD that was noted intraoperatively that was repaired by our vitreoretinal surgeon. He, his K-Pro was stable. His vision improved to as, much, as uh, good as 2,600. And then five months postoperatively, an RPM formed, which I did an uneventful YAG. The vision did not approve, and he just quickly went downhill from there. The membrane recurred. He developed hypotony and a funnel retinal detachment. And despite uh, a pars plane of vitrectomy, uh, that was uh, not able to be repaired. And he is now no light perception, uh, understandably not happy with uh, his outcome, and, uh, but his K-Pro is stable. So in conclusion, uh, in uh, let me answer my own question, are oversized backplates the answer? No. They do seem to reduce the amount of retroprosthetic membranes. So those of you who are uh, hesitant to put in an oversized uh, rigid device into the eye, uh, the, you can do this by making sure you have very good opposition of your posterior graft host junction. There were no wound complications. There, was no, there were no melts. There were no infections. Uh, and they are relatively easy to insert, as shown by the real-time video of my fellow putting that K-Pro in. Uh, the, I would say, uh, and this is really a take-home message, the two patients who I implanted bilateral K-Pros, they insisted that I put them in. And I was very hesitant. They're young aneritics. And the, you can understand the allure for a young aneritic. Uh, they, they've seen poorly. They're in their 40s or 50s. They have aneritic associated keratopathy. And you do one, and they're improved to 2080. And they think that's the best thing ever. And both of these patients really pressed me to put a bilateral K-Pro in, which I did, and both of them, uh, their second eye has had complications. So I really would encourage you to exercise caution in putting bilateral K-Pros in. Probably a much safer and uh, approach which will prolong the amount of useful vision that a patient has is to put one in, let them live out the lifespan of the K-Pro, leaving the other eye for uh, the future when needed, but you will get you will get pushback from your patients, especially the aneritics who find this to be much better than their their own corneas. And then finally, uh, even as we've reduced the retroprosthetic membrane rate, we need to realize that these are complex eyes. Putting a K-Pro in someone who's had two graft fails, failures is a different thing than putting one in someone who's had 15 different eye surgeries prior to the time they get to your office. Uh, and you do need to monitor the um, post-operative complications. Thank you. Our next presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Natalie Afshari. Um, she'll discuss uh, in the presence of silicone oil, no prior corneal surgery, and post-op contact lens use. Thank you, Dr. Rosenblatt and Dr. Colby. This symposium has been certainly very much intellectually stimulating, and I keep taking more pearls home. So thank you, everyone, again for being here. Uh, hopefully this afternoon we'll have some time you know, right after the photos to, to take a tour, as many of you have been asking for that. 
So um, I wanted to share with you our experience with um, presence of silicone oil in the eyes that uh, we are putting in keratoprosthesis, as well as some of those patients who are having keratoprosthesis as their primary corneal procedure, and then the experience with um, the mini scleral lenses. So several colleagues have described silicone oil and their outcome before. Here, um, some of them showing good visual outcome. Not many of them have shown retroprosthesis membrane. Here is one from SN ACPAC showing that um, patients had any, any vision from hand motion to 2800, but they had improved visual acuity. Another one that shows retroprosthesis membrane, seven out of the 13 patients. And here is another one showing that there was retroprosthesis membrane in one eye. Also, there have been studies with showing uh, keratoprosthesis as the primary corneal procedure. Here is a study by our own Jose de la Cruz and Dr. Cortina. Um, in um, 19 eyes, patients did quite well as the primary procedure, and that is not surprising. So I wanted to show you our outcome in patients who are having keratoprosthesis with silicone oil. And these are my patients, and you could see that the visual acuity of the patients who have silicone oil in their eye actually quite low, and compared to the patients who are having uh, no prior corneal surgery, sorry, this is so small, it's actually even difficult for me to see. Patients who are having, uh, who had no prior corneal surgery and are having keratoprosthesis, you can see their visual acuity quite good after keratoprosthesis, anything, 2020, 2025. However, patients who have had prior silicone oil injection, their visual acuity quite low. And people who are having scleral lenses afterwards, their vision could be anything, but we are putting scleral lenses instead of bandage contact lenses. But what about keratoprosthesis? Keratoprosthesis and retroprosthesis membrane in patients who are having, who had silicone oil before. In my series, 100% of these patients have retroprosthesis membrane. So, to me, silicone oil is one of those difficult set of patients that I deal with. And uh, many of these patients have had retinal detachment and the retinal doctor would like to keep the silicone oil in. Now talking with Dr. Dolman as well as um, Dr. Chodosh, this experience has been similar that most patients have retroprosthesis membrane after silicone oil that has been placed in their eye. The reason I'm presenting here I like to get a group of colleagues here together so we can talk and find out what are those set of patients that do well that have silicone oil in their eye and get keratoprosthesis. Are there certain factors that certain patients have that don't develop retroprosthesis membrane despite the fact that they have silicone oil and certain amount of patients that develop retroprosthesis membrane heavily even when you take it out and take it out again and yag it and yag it and yag it again. So that's the main thing that I wanted to present this little data to you. Basically, to me, implantation of Boston K-Pro-1 should be considered with caution in eyes with in, uh, intraocular silicone oil. There should be a good discussion with the patient, and we need some further research into the pathogenesis of retroprosthesis membrane, and then skull contact lens is well tolerated and should be considered for use in eyes with limited visual acuity or ill-fitting bandage contact lens, and um, in I have talked to other colleagues who have used it and have good results. Now, in the interest of time, I kept this quite short because I wanted to show you a video, a video of what our patients who feel they have the bionic eyes see and some of our patients who have amazing vision and can drive and can see every little pixel and have the precision and some of our patients who don't quite have that. So here goes the video. Is the sound? Silicone oil is coming out, just like an oil refinery. This procedure here is the oil refinery. This procedure was in conjunction with Dr. McEwen, my dear colleague at Duke, who said, um, you know, when Natalie comes, we run the other way because she does care. 
This is what some patients see. I think Dr. Dolman recognizes the patient. It was the patient who was in Boston and later saw me at Duke. Here they see every. of cutting the cucumber from the, from the pixel quality of keratoprosthesis. So again, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for making the trip. Um, we have a, a movie store. <laughs> we, we have an addition to the program. Um, so uh, and for this session, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dirk Uwe Barch um, to talk about OCT imaging of K-Pros. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to present a few of the images. Uh, thanks, Dr. Afshari, for sharing some of your patients. Um, so I just wanted to share some images that we took with the Spectralis OCT system and to show the, some of the capabilities. Now, the Spectralis, is, this is the wide field, 55 degree uh, infrared view of uh, the patient. You can see here an air bubble under a contact lens that's there. And then this is the 55 degree fundus view, so um, a very clear media. And this is an OCT here of uh, the cornea here. This green line is showing you the location of the scan line. And then when we zoom in, we can see here the, the difference here. And you've seen some of the anterior segment OCT images with the other devices. The difference between the Spectralis system from Heidelberg, it uses a shorter wavelength. It's only around 880 nanometers rather than 1300. And the depth of the scan window from the top to the bottom is only about 2.3 millimeters. So it's not uh, sufficient to image uh, the posterior edge here of the K-Pro device, which is somewhere located down here. You'd have to do that in two separate scans then. Um, here, a little bit more showing the, the angle here and the edge of the K-Pro. And then this is zoomed in on the same image. And then this is uh, looking here in a vertical cross-section of the uh, retina. And you can see here some, uh, photo or some retinal restructuring in this area here. This is not the normal uh, retinal configuration in this patient. And this is the, ver uh, the horizontal cut here. And then this is uh, our second case. Again here, the, the OCT of uh, the K-Pro device. And again, you cannot appreciate the posterior edge of the device due to the limited axial uh, range of the scan window. And then this is here, in this patient, you had a very healthy looking retina uh, shown here in the um, cross-sectional view. You do see a little bit here of the bubbly appearance. So that is probably a membrane forming, and sometimes the membranes can be appreciated as uh, giving shadows in the scanning laser ophthalmoscope image. So just thank you very much. Just a brief image. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so our next talk, I, I see Dr. Kakawa there uh, coming in, will be on uh, novel approaches to the K-Pro and oculoplastics perspective. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think uh, most of the time you don't have to call an oculoplastic surgeon too much for these types of cases. I think we all remember ways in our careers that really teach us a lot. So I'm going to share one case that kind of... Um, taught me a lot about keratoprosthesis. So to get on about this gentleman, you, you probably wouldn't realize that my, our first history is back uh, with him about 10 years ago. But as we all know, the keratoprosthesis creates a problem because it's a chronic foreign body. Uh, there's is maybe issues with exposure and lubrication. Uh, this is a gentleman who I saw many years ago for a morph morphiform basal cell carcinoma. You can see here, this is the gross outline of what we thought was uh, 
the tumor. Um, he subsequently had Mohs excision. The defect extended considerably larger than what was initially thought, it involved the right eye. Uh, the left eyelid margins were still positive for tumor. Uh, when we re reconstructed him initially, we ended up doing a scalp flap. We just thought the left eye was pretty much going to be used as a spare tire. We focused our efforts on saving the right eye as uh, the vision, primarily the, the vision eye for many years. He did quite well. This is him uh, after the reconstruction of the left side. The right side functioned quite nicely. This is a split thickness skin graft. Um, and I wish I could say the story ended here. Um, he did develop a recurrence of his right tumor. You can see here, this is him about 10 years later. This is morpheiform basal cell carcinoma involving the right ocular surface. This eye subsequently became exenerated. He had deeper invasion. He had a big orbital mass. So this is kind of how we're left with him when I called upon Dr. Afshari to become involved. Um, and I, I know you uh, have, have all probably discussed the type one versus type two already. Uh, what we did at the time of his initial repair was that I, I brought conjunctival flaps over the surface of his left eye, and then we brought the scalp flap down. So there was a, a native both bulbar and palpebral surface that was sequestered underneath this flap. And the first step was to try and open up, you know, first of all, see if there was vision potential. We did CT scanning, we did MRI scanning, we did B scanning of that left globe. He did have light perception through closed lids. He was able to perceive some color. So we thought that there was some vision potential. Uh, the first step was to try and open the lids. This is what we saw when we opened it. As you can see, there was a superior fornix the inferior lid had kind of scarred down. There was inferior symblepharon. He essentially didn't have much of an inferior fornix. We tried to keep him at this level for a while. Uh, his cornea subsequently broke down. He had a dense cataract. Um, so Dr. Afshari uh, performed an open sky cataract extraction, placed a type 1 keratoprosthesis, prosthesis. And we did this in a, in a combined procedure since the ocular surface was still compromised. Uh, we elected to cover everything with a mucous membrane graft. This is the keratoprosthesis in position after the cataract extraction. We took uh, bulk of mucosal membrane just as a temporizing measure to try and rehabilitate this ocular surface. This is how he was at the end of the procedure. Uh, after a few weeks while this healed, we did open this up. And I would say he did well at this stage for several months. So this is how he was probably for, how long would you say, Natalie? Four, four, four or five months? OK. But you can see the chronic problems with this. The eye doesn't blink. He's got an exposed uh, rim of the keratoprosthesis at the interface between the, 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 the prosthesis and, and his native cornea. Eventually, this breaks down. And you can see here the foot plate is starting to become exposed along the inferior aspect of the keratoprosthesis. So that, that leaves us with a huge dilemma. What do we do now? I mean, he's a monocular patient. Uh, I think this is kind of where at least our thinking kind of has to be somewhat out of the box. There is good palpebral conjunctiva and, and that can be used. So what we ended up doing was we split the lid margin along the mucocutaneous junction. Uh, at the same time, Natalie had placed some uh, tectonic sclerographs to bolster up the attachments of the keratoprosthesis to his native uh, ocular tissue. And then we did a um, tarsorophy so that you can see here, this is, these are the flaps that were created. We ended up closing, giving him essentially a new um, you know, tarsorophy-based uh, closure that could subsequently be opened at a different time. This is a skin graft that gets placed on top of these um, conjunctival flaps. And this is how he was when he healed um, a couple months after that procedure. Recently, and the question is, what do we do now? Do we, do we open it? Do we leave it? You know, he's monocular. He wants to see. So what we thought we would do is just try and give him a very small opening. In fact, this was earlier um, uh, this week where we just took a small tree find. This is a two millimeter punch tree find that's used in the dermatology offices as a punch biopsy. And you know, by our guess, best guesstimate, we're trying to find the center of the ocular surface to try to open that up. Uh, and here he is just with a little tiny opening. You know, the question is, is will this contract? Will it scar down? Um, I think we're still kind of in the, the watch and see period with regards to this particular case. Uh, the, uh, the actual prosthesis looks quite good. I think the edge of the uh, optic is now uh, covered, the footplate's covered. And I think the question is how, how big do we make this opening eventually? 
Um, so I think that probably you know goes over at least my you know main contribution to this wonderful conference is how we deal with these difficult lid cases. And I don't know how many of you <laughs> how many of you see that sort of. Uh, um, but I I'll take any. I know we have time for questions. If anyone has. Uh, Type twos, we use in some cases like a hydroxyapatite uh, uh, rim around this. So, with the idea being that uh, the tissue or the skin will sort of vascularize in and will, incorporated will, will, will prevent the retraction. Yeah, we, we haven't used that. I don't know. I defer to, to Natalie if that's a, you know something that might have worked in this particular case. Uh, hydroxyapatite based uh, integration. Yeah. yeah. So, do, is this like um, how thick is the hydroxyapatite that you basically use? use uh, this is. Through our oculoplastic uh, mm -hmm. colleagues, we make you like a, a rim and then basically sort of like a skirt around the type 2 and then let it vascularize into the, uh, the tissue as you. Type 2 will protrude through the skin. Right, right. right. So then, because before we'd have issues when we contract it and then we yeah. put This is almost, the, uh, I mean, the, uh, kind of a hybrid between yeah. the 1 and the 2 where we're trying to make, you know, the, the lids are there, they're just not functioning due to the extensive skin cancer. Uh, and we're trying to make that ocular surface opening as small as possible so that maybe the exposure issues aren't so much of a problem. Uh, I don't know how much of it is just the breakdown of the, the interface between the prosthesis and, and the, the native sclera, or you know, is it just an exposure issue where, you know, regardless of how big we make this opening, if, is he still going to run into the same problem? So, great. I think we'll have an abbreviated question and answer period and get started with the rapid fire papers. So can we have right. the room lights up, Thank you. please? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. So I, I was sitting listening to the talks on anterior chamber angle and also Kathy's talk in there. Something I think we've done poor service to in teaching curative prosthesis, which is suture. So I can tell you that I you know, recently had a fellow say, when I commented that they were tying the suture extraordinarily tight, it's just a capro. So I've also seen and in teaching that people think it doesn't really matter how deep the sutures are because it's just a capro. But it's, I think for issues of both avoiding flattening of the angle, if your sutures are too tight, potentially uh, inducing retroprosthetic membrane if they're too shallow, that we should pay more emphasis when we teach capro on deep or frankly full thickness sutures that are not overly tight because I think we can impact both of those instances by proper suturing, both angle depth to some degree by not over tightening and retroprosthetic membranes, at least those that seem to evolve from the posterior graphose junction through a gap. And so we should be suturing deeply, but with care not to over tighten. Over tightening, I think also creates some of the uh, persistent or recurrent epithelial defects that Tony has done a lot to highlight because I've noticed when I've seen those epithelial defects, they seem to occur where there's a tight suture. I don't know, Tony, what you think about that. Yeah. But if you, you create that, you've got the capro, which is a set thickness and curvature, and now you flatten the cornea adjacent to it. And although there's no data for this comment, I think that when you over-tighten, you create a greater potential to flatten the cornea under the front plate, creating access for organisms, uh, enzymes, and potentially break down the cornea next to the stem. So we, we rarely talk about suturing when we do courses, uh, but I think we should all uh, endeavor to do better at that because I think it may, it, in, in a subtle way, impact our outcomes at several levels. May I comment again on, on corneal melting? Uh, I would like to start uh, by saying that I'm not an expert on uh, keratoprosthesis. I'm uh, much more involved in biological uh, tissue reconstruction so, and uh, uh, in any disorder, in, in any problem, I always ask myself uh, what is the underlying cause of the problem and what is the pathophy pathophysiological uh, mechanism of the disease. So, when we talk about uh, 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 corneal melting, is it a, a matter of the strength of the cornea or is the cause of the uh, uh, melting that is the, the issue that we have? To, to solve, and uh, I'm thinking of uh, the epithelium, the stromal keratocytes, and the nerves, as well as the vessels. So if we think at a cross-linking, we are transplanting a tissue without keratocytes, and we know that uh, in a cellular tissue prevents repithelialization, and the epithelial defect can promote uh, stromal melting. So I don't, uh, in, in a, uh, 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 
in a certain point, I believe that uh, cross-linking uh, stromal tissue can, instead of preventing melting, promoting melting. And that's something that we have seen uh, uh, using the, uh, uh, the lyophilized tissue or frozen tissue for epicaretophagia in the past. We have seen much more problems when we use those tissue compared to fresh tissue because they had a keratocyte instead of a cellular tissue. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So I have limited experience with gamma radiated tissue for yeah. patch grafts, but it always epithelializes rapidly, and I've always maybe you can explain why that would happen. So gamma radiated tissue presumably has no living cells, but I've been amazed that how rapidly it can epithelize. <coughs> that, probably that depends on the recipient. If the recipient tissue is a, is a healthy, you will have a very good reptilization. But in these cases, we have a, a very severe disorders with epithelial problems, with nerve problems, tear film problems. And in those cases, we have a problem of uh, uh, epithelial migration and, and healing. So, and I believe in those cases, fresh tissues are much uh, safer and better than uh, uh, life lies or uh, frozen tissues. So Essen's not here anymore, but Tony, you've used those gamma irradiated tissues as carriers, and I don't think you've reported any problem with epithelialization, have you? Right, in our series we did not see it, in the series from Sumer LP series of cases done uh, in Beirut, I think with 18 eyes, they did not. However, I, I selected the cases that I did use the gamma irradiated cornea for, to be the second eye of a patient, which had already done a keratoprosthesis in the contralateral eye, in case the patients did fine. So I knew if there was problems with rehabilitation, problems with necrosis, I'd blame it on the donor tissue, not necessarily the recipient patient. So I cherry-picked those cases. I have not used the vision graft, the gamma radiated cornea, for patients with severe upper surface disease. So I can't comment in that population, what you're talking about. I, have, I don't have experience in that population. Can you cross link on top of a cape roll that is melting or that you're suspicious of these infiltrates being gram positive? Uh, interesting. I just reviewed a manuscript for cornea about that and in situ infection in a K-Pro. Uh, so it certainly can be done. Uh, we're, we're hampered in the United States by availability of cross-linking and, and Joe is applauded for going through the hoops of getting an IND and allowing this to be done. Uh, but there, yeah, there are starting to filter into the literature reports. And my guess is if you ask um, John Penelopoulos at the World Cornea Congress, he would have probably the most experience with that. You have to be careful. I will go straight to the fovea, so you have to occlude yeah, the. You protect uh, the. You protect the it, but otherwise you can you can do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much for an interesting session, and we'll uh, change moderators and move on to the rapid fire first. Uh, thank you very much for moderating, Dr. Rosenblatt, Dr. Uh, uh, Colby, and now we're going to move on to the free paper session. So it's going to be rapid fire. Each presentation will be six minutes. We'll have as moderators uh, Natalie Abshari. And uh, one of our will be also one of our moderators. So we'll try to keep a tight schedule. You'll see me waving this thing when I start getting nervous. That means that your time is either up or, or I can't throw it at you. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie, one. Yes. Who wants to enjoy La Jolla this afternoon? <laughs> we got to be on time. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Michelle White. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to start by talking about the instance of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and chemical burns. And this morning we heard about the global burden of uh, corneal blindness in general and the value of K-PRO when corneal transplant fails. But what about the patients that uh, standard corneal transplant is virtually hopeless for. This subset of patients, Stevens-Johnson syndrome and chemical burns, um, where keratoprosthesis is really the only option for them. Um, some of you have seen patients like this with advanced ocular surface disease and Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or perhaps someone like this, this is a 12-year-old boy um, after multiple failed penetrating keratoplasties for chemical burns. Um, 
so part of figuring out the problem is defining it, and we wondered how many patients um, or how many cases there were each year of chemical burn and uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and there's really very little literature defining these diseases, and so we, um, we did some work and are about to publish on the first um, population-based instance study on these two conditions. Uh, we originally wanted to include um, mucous membrane pemphigoid, but the presentation of the disease is indolent, and so uh, we couldn't capture it in this study. And in this study, we used the emergency department um, in order to, to identify these patients. And um, in particular, we use something called the Nationwide Emergency Department Sample. It's part of the government's healthcare cost utilization project. It includes 20, between 25 and 30 million patients, and the records are in over 950 hospitals. And we used a, um, a series of algorithms using ICD-9 codes and emission codes uh, in the emergency room to define Stevens-Johnson syndrome and chemical burn. I first presented this data a year ago, and the chemical burn number has gone up quite a bit after we changed the definition and were able to include more patients. But you can see almost 4,000 um, patients um, in 2010 and 2011 in the United States with Stevens-Johnson syndrome and almost 16,000 cases of chemical burn each year are seen in the emergency departments in this country. And when we think about um, these, these patients, we want to know really how many of them um, are going to have moderate to severe vision reduction, how many of them may benefit from a keratoprosthesis. And since we couldn't get the data directly, directly from the, um, the emergency room, we turned to the literature, and roughly a third of cases would be moderate to severe for both Stevens-Johnson syndrome and chemical burn, and that results in about 1,300 cases of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and um, 5,400 cases of chemical burn per year. And then the next question was, well, uh, that's good for the United States, but how many cases are there worldwide? So we applied, we, we uh, found the incidence rate uh, in the United States. We used the number of cases per year, um, divided it by the US population of about 311 million. And so the incidence rate for Stevens-Johnson syndrome is 12.35, and the incidence rate uh, is 51.10 for chemical burns. Uh, that we think that the Stevens-Johnson syndrome number is fairly accurate to apply worldwide, but the chemical burn number is probably grossly underestimated since the incidence of chemical burns, um, especially in the developing world, is uh, much higher. So this is, a, this is an underestimate for chemical burns. So we applied the incidence rate to the world population of 7 billion, and what we've come up with is about 29,000 cases each year um, of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and about 122,000 cases of chemical burns each year that are moderate to severe with vision reduction. And so in conclusion, this study uh, shows that there's an estimated minimum of 150,000 new cases of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and chemical ocular burns with moderate to severe um, ocular involvement worldwide. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Aldavi, uh, who will be talking about international outcomes of Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis in SJS. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Before this, introduce the subject. This is obviously the most challenging patient population, and so it's a pleasure to present what I think are very encouraging results to you this morning 
on international outcomes of the Boston Type 1 KPRO in patients with Stevens Johnson syndrome. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk. The purpose of this uh, study was to determine the factors that influence outcomes of Boston Type 1 KPRO implantation in patients with Stephen Johnson syndrome and to compare the results with those implanted in patients without SJS. This is an international multi-center study uh, involving patients seen at Stein Institute and my, my uh, patient uh, population at Disha Eye Hospital, surgeries performed by Dr. Samar Basak, and at St. Luke's Hospital in Manila, Philippines. Uh, these are patients of Dr. Mangita Padilla. The main outcome measures are the typical outcome measures with keratoprosthesis, visual acuity, retention, and complications. So there were 40 procedures performed in eyes with Steven Johnson uh, uh, syndrome, uh, 27 eyes and 26 patients. In the non Steven Johnson group, there was 194 procedures performed in 182 eyes of 175 patients. You see that there was a difference as far as the age with the Steven Johnson patients being on average one decade younger than those without Steven Johnson syndrome. The follow-up was shorter, about a year and a half on average in the SGS group as compared to two and a half year follow-up in the non-SGS group. There was also a difference as far as the indications with a significantly higher percentage of the procedures done in the SJS group being performed for repeat K-PRO as opposed to the non-SJS group. Glaucoma, significantly less common in the group with Steven Johnson syndrome, 26%, versus the group without Steven Johnson syndrome, which is 72%. There's no difference, however, in the percentage of eyes in each group that had previous glaucoma surgery. And as far as previous corneal transplants, in the group with SJS, two-thirds of the K-PROs were performed as the initial corneal surgery. These patients had not had keratoplasty previously as compared to about a quarter in the non-SJS group. So preoperative and postoperative visual acuities. This is what I thought was most striking. Here we see the number of eyes in the SJS group over time, the non-SJS group. The numbers are very small, three years and beyond, even fairly small at two years, but I think we can at least draw some conclusions through two years. Looking at the percentage of eyes that are 2,200 or greater, at baseline, none in the SGS group, 5% in the non-SGS group. At six months, you see it there, 96% of 2,200 or better vision at six months in the SGS group, and that's 100% thereafter. And the non-SGS group is 71% at six months, and you see it goes all the way out to 60% at five years. So at each time point, at six months, one year, and two years, significantly higher percentage of eyes in the SJS group that had 2200 or better vision as compared to the group of eyes without SJS. I thought also very encouraging in the non-SJS group with a larger population, we see a fairly steady percentage here all the way out to five years of eyes that obtain and maintain 2200 or better visual acuity. Looking at complications, there are certainly complications. We all know this in all, all KPRO patients, especially in a SGS population. We are not surprised that the percentage of eyes that develop stromal necrosis, 60% in the SGS group, is significantly higher than the percentage of eyes in the non-SGS group, which was 8%. That led to a significantly higher percentage of eyes that required KPRO replacement in the SGS group. Infectious keratitis. 30% in the SGS group as compared to 10% in the non-SGS group. Significant difference. Persistent epithelial defect formation, which we and others have shown leads to a higher incidence of infectious keratitis and stromal necrosis. Significantly higher in the SGS group as compared to the non-SGS group, which led to a significantly higher percentage of eyes that required tarsography in the SGS group. Very encouraging, however, is this. We talked this morning about enophthalmitis. None of the eyes in the SGS group developed enophthalmitis as compared to 2% in the non-SGS group. I think that's encouraging data in both groups. Also, Dr. Dolman and colleagues have shown a higher incidence of retinal detachment in eyes with autoimmune uh, disorders like SJS. We did not see a significant difference between the two groups in this study. Looking at retention rates, well, this is what, again, we expected, a significantly higher retention failure rate in the eyes with SJS. 18 retention failures per 58.75 eye years, or 0.3 retention failures per eye year, as compared to 0.06 in the non-SJS group. So about four to five times higher failure rate 
in the SJS group. And again, that's not surprising. Here we see the same data, but presented in a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. In the red line, this is the non-SJS group. In the blue line, this is the SJS group. Now, this looks a bit deceiving. This does not mean that all of them had retention failure. This, this line going to zero means that the patient with the longest retention ended up having to have the cardioprosthesis replaced. So here we're looking at characteristics associated with KPRO retention and removal. I want to know when a patient comes into my office who has Steven Johnson syndrome, are there factors that I can identify in the preoperative exam that will tell me, will this patient do well long term, will this patient not do well? So we looked at time from SJS diagnosis to initial procedure, perforation at or before the time of keratoprosthesis implantation, presence of bulbar conjunctival keratinization, and lid valve positioning. None were significantly associated with retention failure, but we do see what I think is a nearly significant uh, association with bulbar conjunctival keratinization. 43% of patients with keratinization of the bulbar conj required a keratoprosthesis re uh, removal following the implantation as compared to only 8% of the eyes without keratinization on the bulbar conjunctiva. No association with perioperative characteristics either. So for me, I look for that keratinization of the bulbar conjunctiva, and typically when I see it, I'll tell that patient they're not a candidate for a type 1 keratoprosthesis. This data supports that. Well, how are the eyes doing that are not in that visual acuity table? The visual acuity table I showed you with that very impressive visual results for the SJS patients are only those who retain the K-Pro. What happens to the eyes in which the K-Pro has had to be removed and was not replaced with another K-Pro? Well, here they are. There's five eyes, preoperative visual acuities in the far most uh, column to the left, current visual acuities on the right. Better vision, same, same, better, better. The first case. This is a patient in whom I would now never consider a type 1 keratoprosthesis, but back in 2004, I was young and naive. You see this diffuse keratinization of the bulbar conjunctiva, near complete obliteration of the inferior fornix. So this, of course, is what happened, twice. I learned my lesson, sent the patient to Dr. Chodosh and Dr. Dolman, and Jim, this is your work. This is eight and a half years later now. This patient's seeing 2040. Quite amazing. So in conclusion, as eyes within which the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis is retained, 100% in this series had a one-year visual acuity of 2,200 or better. None of these patients had that level of vision prior to surgery. 96% of eyes have a final visual acuity of 2,200 or better with an average follow-up of 20 months. At six months, one year, and a final follow-up, the percentage of eyes with vision of 2,200 or greater was significantly higher in the SJS group as compared to the eyes receiving the KPRO for other indications. Why? Well, I think probably the most obvious reason is significantly lower percentage of the eyes in the SJS group that had preoperative glaucoma. That is the big enemy as far as obtaining and maintaining 2200 level of vision. As far as complications, significantly higher incidence in the SJS group of PED, stromal necrosis, infectious keratitis. But encouragingly, that group, the SGS group, did not have a higher incidence of enophthalmitis, which was not observed in any eye, or retinal detachment, which the incidence was no different than that in the eyes without SJS. As far as retention, the retention failure rate in the SGS group is four to five times higher than that for other indications. Majority of these KPROs had to be replaced because of stromal necrosis, some for infectious keratitis. However, if you looked at the percentage of eyes which today a keratoprosthesis is retained in the SGS group versus non-SGS group, there is no difference. You may say, well, that's because you have a shorter follow-up for your SGS group. What well, is shorter, we see here 20 months versus 32 months, but that difference is not statistically significant. So the prognostic factors indicative of retention failure, things I can look for preoperative examination, there were none that showed a significant association with retention failure. However, the presence of bulbar conjunctival keratinization is associated with increased incidence of retention failure. So you see maybe with a longer series, longer follow-up, more patients, that p-value may become significant. And improving outcomes in SGS, what I'm preaching now is it really requires a proactive approach as opposed to a reactive approach to preventing postoperative complications. In these patients, the SJS population, we are routinely now covering the donor cornea with conjunctiva, either bulbar conjunctiva or tarsal conjunctiva in the form of tension-free flaps, and performing now routinely extensive medial lateral tarsorophies primarily. And I think this will even further improve the outcomes in this challenging patient population.
Thank you very much. Alvarez de Toledo, who will be talking about Boston type 1 um, keratoprosthesis in high risk corneas. Hello, good morning. I'm going to present our results uh, in two centers in Salzburg Eye Institute University and the Center of Ophthalmology of Arraquette in Barcelona in high risk cases. Uh, I know you all know that uh, for a good indication in the, in the Boston K prototype, you have to have a functional tear film and a very good eyelid function so, so you can have good uh, results. The classical contraindications for this surgery were the severe dry eye, severe eyelid dysfunction, non-end stage glaucoma, non-controlled autoimmune diseases like corneal melting, Stephen Johnson, and severe chemical burns. So we started this study because uh, we started in 2006 and then we are gaining more experience with the Boston K-Pro. We have better knowledge of its complications and the, their management. And we also have in our clinic a very long experience with other types of uh, keratoprosthesis like biological OKP or TBL OKP, more than almost 60 years now. So we have like a backup surgery just in case if this K-Pro fails. So we study to extend the indications of Boston k to uh, cases of Steven Johnson, Lyell syndrome, and chemical burns. So the purpose of this study was to analyze the anatomical and functional results, complications, or surgical additional procedures of the Boston k type 1 uh, implantation in high-risk cases in two separate ophthalmology eye centers. This is a retrospective case series in which 21, 20 uh, patients were included. They were chemical burns or mucocutaneous syndrome. Standard Boston K-Pro type 1 was performed following the classical indications. And the outcome measures were visual results, anatomical retention, postoperative complication, and additional procedures. So 11 patients were operated in our facilities and eight patients were operated in Salzburg University Eye Clinic. 85% of them were male, and the mean age was 45.6. You, we had cases with alkali where acid burns, non-specified burns, Lyell syndrome, pemphigoid, and Stephen Johnson syndrome. You see the numbers in the graphic. So the mean previous graph the patient have, had had was almost two. The follow-up of the study was, had a mean of 36.17 months. We have three cases now with less than six months of follow-up. The visual acuity preoperatively was 2.11 in logmer units. The best ever corrected visual acuity was 0.744, and the last visit best corrected visual acuity was 1.34. We see a decline in the visual acuity over the time. The, retain, the retention rate for all these years was 17%, 14 patients. The mean post-op extrusion time was 26.5 months. We had retentions starting month four and, retention, and extrusions in, in uh, month 52. We have we had six cases of extrusions in the whole series, in, in which we did two tectonic keratoplastic, four K pro replacements, in which three of them were retained and the other was, was extruded, and we had to do a new tectonic keratoplastic. The complications we saw 45% of retroprosthetic membranes, 35% of glaucoma, 30% of extrusions, 20% of melting, 15% of choroid detachment. We had three cases of endophthalmitis, one case of vitreous hemorrhage, and one case of dysemetacine. The additional procedures we had to, to, do, to, to perform were uh, YAG laser membranotomy in 45% of the cases. We had to replace the prosthesis in four cases, four tectonic keratoplasties. One, in, one eye was enucleated. We had uh, to perform in one case a conjunctival and corneal lamellar tectonic graph and one pars plana vitrectomy. This is a case of Steven Johnson syndrome. The, we did surgery in the left eye. The right eye had no light perception. We did this prosthesis. The result was a spectacular. The patient was seen 0.7, three weeks post-op. He went to Africa because she, uh, he lived in, in Africa. And two months later, he came back with this inferior extrusion. So we had to do a capo replacement. It was performed. And three months, months later, the vision came back to 0.6. It was a very good result. The visual field was good. The echo was clean, and one year later, patient had a, this dysematocele, periphery, peripheral dysematocele. We had to perform a lamellar tectonic partial keratoplasty with a conjunctival graft to recover all this area. The patient came back to 0.75 vision, and the right eye was lost because of all the uh, Stephen Johnson problem he had. 
So in conclusion, the anatomical and functional results of the Boston K-Pro type 1 are moderately satisfactory in high-risk cases. The presence of, the presence of serious complications is common. Additional procedures are frequently added and needed, and the final long-term outcome can be compromised. And better knowledge of K-Pro type 1 results in high-risk cases will allow us to extend its indication in selected patients. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And I'm, I'm going to talk about our experience with long-term outcomes with Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis in ocular burns. I have no financial interest in this presentation. So as a short background, why should we attempt to develop keratoprosthesis for corneal opacity when a standard corneal transplantation is well established and relatively safe? We, we all know that PKs and LKs are effective measures for the surgical management of the vast majority of causes of corneal opacification. However, according to the World Health Organization, 10 to 12 million people with corneal blindness in the world. In average, 100,000 corneal grafts are done worldwide per year, which are not enough for the 10 million people. And the global distribution of corneal blindness shows a large prevalence in low-income developed countries. And worse yet, there are patients with a poor prognosis for standard PK, like patients with uh, victims of chemical burns, such as these photos that we can see. And in these situations, the prognosis is questionable. The survival or transparency rate is low, something around 20 to 30 percent in two years. So the combination of the not accomplished demand with a poor prognosis in this kind of patients just to find a necessity to look for an alternative uh, approach such as keratoprosthesis. So the purpose of this study was to report the long-term outcomes with type 1 K-Pro in the management, management of ocular burn injuries. It's a prospective study of all cases of type 1 K-Pro implantation for ocular burns at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Data were collected regarding the patient's ocular history, surgical procedures performed, and post-operative outcomes, including visual acute, retention, and complications. We used Kaplan-Meier to analyze, to evaluate the survival. We used uh, the mean visual acute compared between the pre-op and post-op using the Wilcoxon test, and a p-value lower than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. So we had 13 type 1 k pros implanted in 12 eyes of 12 patients with a mean follow-up of 61 months. The pre-op visual acuity ranged from, from counting fingers to light perception. In the post-op, visual acuity was better than 2200 in 83% of the patients and better than 2016 in 58% of the patients. The overall retention rate was 83%. The visual acuity improved significantly in now post-operative times we measured. In a longer follow-up, it remained statistically better. However, when we take a look at this graft after four to five years, it looks quite bizarre. And this might be due to a small sample size or maybe to the fact that not all the patients achieved the long follow-up or maybe it could be due to comorbidities such as glaucoma. This Kaplan-Meier survival curve shows a high probability of retention close to 85% in five years. The most common complications were heteroprostatic membrane, 41%, corneal melting, 33%, infectious keratrites, 8%, progression of previous glaucoma, 50%, new glaucoma, 8%, and retinal detachment, 8%. We were concerned about the incidence of stromal necrosis, and we decided to analyze if, could be, if this could be associated with the tear production measured by the shimmer test, and we did not find any association uh, with the shimmer test. We also decided to investigate if the stromal necrosis could be associated with a previous limbus stem cell graft, and we figured out that patients submitted to ocular surface procedures as limbo transplantation prior to K-Pro implantation had a lower incidence of corneal melting or thinning. 
However, this number was not statistically significant. Again, might be due to a small sample size. So this study has some limitations, the case series, uh, but in conclusions, we, we can say that the anatomical and functional results found in this study support the use of type 1 K-PRO in managing bilateral limbo stem cell deficiency secondary to ocular burns. RPM and glaucoma remain challenging, especially in the subgroup of patients, and stereostromal necrosis seems to be more prevalent in limbo stem cell deficient patients. Thank you so much. Well, next paper will be presented by Hatem Kopten from the Department of Ophthalmology of Cary University. Well, thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, Cairo uh, University is in Egypt, and Egypt is in the north of Africa. Today I would like to share with you a case in which the Boston K Pro managed to save a patient's eye. This is a gentleman who's 34 years old, presents with a month history of a refractory corneal abscess. Notice that there is extensive cornea melting and iris pigmentation. And then after one month, he has this extensive vascularization. The treatment included topical aggressive antimicrobials as well as amniotic membrane transplantation. But the, 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 the real thing is that the, there's too much vessels entering in his stroma. They're both superficial as well as in the deep stroma. The ultrasound shows a total RD with extensive anterior PVR. Notice that the retinal folds are parallel, which means that there's a lot of anterior posterior traction. So the surgical plan was to perform a three-port pars plan vitrectomy through a temporary cartoprothesis or the Landers cartoprothesis. <coughs> However, the debate would be in the preoperative planning at the end of the procedure following flattening of his retina. Do we use to turn back his, the patient's own cornea, which is basically completely opacified and will not <coughs> permit any further intervention? However, it will allow time for the new vessels to be treated and then have a better prognosis for a future cartoplasty in the setting where he will be removing his silicon oil. Or place a new graft, which will have better visibility at the end of the procedure, but has a high probability of rejection due to the extensive new vessels. This is the Landers as compared to the Dolman's type 1 cartoprothesis. The advantage is that you're working through an 8.2 backplate and this gives you excellent view of the periphery of the retina as compared to the dolmen, which gives you very little, if any, view of the periphery of the retina. So just to remind, refresh your memory about what's PVR, this is the intraoperative appearance of the retina. This is called the stage uh, C5 PVR, in which there is a fold of retina that has been dragged posteriorly because of the contraction of the vitreous base. It's covering the pars placata, so there's basically no aqueous entering inside the eye. There's extensive hypotony, which makes terrifination very bad. Um, the other thing is, after you leave, you relieve all the contractions in the posterior segment, and you dissect the retina from the back of the iris, you will have to do an extensive anterior retinectomy, retinotomy, okay, to relieve the anteroposterior shortening. Okay, so just illustration of what happens inside the OR. You remove the patient's cornea, you place the temporary cartoprothesis, you dissect the retina eventually from the back of the iris and from over the ciliary body. You have this con retraction of the retina, which is dramatic because of the extensive retina shortening. And then you do your perfluorocarbon flattening up to the iris and beyond the border of the giant retinal tape which you've, which you've just created. And then comes the part where you perform your silicone perfluorocarbon oil exchange and then the most critical part is that you will have to remove the temporary cartoprothesis and place the patient's own opacified cornea. Notice that this amount of fluid 
will result because of the sudden hypotony, some silicon oil will extrude and some aqueous will enter into this dangerous recess. Should you decide to inject silicon oil at this point from the pars plana, you might induce fluid to enter beneath the retinal flap, what is known as posterior slippage. And this will excite a detachment in the very early stages. This is his first two-week postoperative anterior segment view, and this is his three-week postoperative ultrasound view with a complete recurrence of the detachment. So now we have to plan our second reoperation. And in this case, we decided to review each and every step, and we thought that, that we had induced in the first procedure a posterior slippage, and we have to avoid the posterior slippage of the giant retinal tail which we've just created. So the surgical plan was to use a Boston Capro. It has a better visibility during the procedure and it was invented in the, in the first place for high risk cases in which rejection is most likely. However, you don't have to start with it the entire procedure. You can use the temporary cartopothesis, flatten the retina, and then remove the temporary cartopothesis place your Boston K-Pro, even if some peripheral carbon oil, sorry, even if some peripheral carbon uh, ex uh, exits the globe, you can, in a completely pressurized, with perfect view of the center part, inject peripheral carbon bubble in the middle of the bubble, get your peripheral carbon beyond the edges of the break, inside the three port infusion system, making sure that you've turned off and disconnected the aqueous so that there is no chance for having aqueous inside your system and then do your silicon peripheral carbon exchange in a completely pressurized system. This is his first week postoperatively. His vision has had an uncorrected visual acuity of 624. However, one month later, he develops this retroprothetic membrane and so his vision drops. However, the retina uh, continues to be attached. Okay, so in conclusion, the case demonstrates the importance of using both the temporary and the Boston K-Pro in cases in which the anterior segment will not allow for a cornea graft and at the same time you have to timely intervene otherwise the PVR will become a closed funnel and you will compromise the patient's vision. Prognosis. Um, as they say, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, the credit of this case goes to Dr. Dolman, who invented this in the first place. Uh, and I'm very grateful for having me here. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. John Canalopoulos. Is John? I don't see him. So, right, Jose? Do you see? Yeah. So, why don't we go? Um, Kind of short, excuse me. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Navas, who will be talking about Boston Tagline Sterioprosthesis Assisted Intraprosthetic Amniotic Membrane, Amniotic Capro Sandwich. Thanks. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, corneal melting and endophthalmitis are few complications after Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis. Microorganisms uh, may have a direct path into the eye because the, poten the potential space between the anterior plate of the capro and the corneal stroma. Uh, in this video, we present a couple of cases with severe ocular inflammation and corneal, corneal blindness managed with Boston type assisted with intraprosthetic amniotic membrane and we, we call it the uh, amniotic capro sandwich technique. Uh, the, the donor cornea was trephine and the front plate with the stem was fixated with an amniotic membrane disc positioned beneath the front plate. Then we, we used uh, nylon tenno interrupt sutures to, to secure the, the membrane prosthetic complex. And here you, you can see the, the, the centration. We protect the, the eye that's just 
couple of minutes of, of the light. And here you can see the, the post-operative status with the caper well placed and centered. And uh, we use the, the, the membrane and a bandage contact lens. Okay. Here we present another case with uh, several corneal graft rejections and failure where we decide to combine the amniotic membrane with a new one-piece titanium fixation backplate, also having uh, satisfactory results. After the, the placement of the amniotic membrane with the, 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 the titanium backplate, uh, it, secure, it secures by itself with uh, obviously no, need, uh, no, no ring needed. Uh, in, in this case, we, we decide to, to, to use more amniotic membrane tissue like a, a squirt. Uh, some Indian friends recommend us to, to use the burka amniotic apro technique because we use like, like this to, to cover wider area of the, of the affected tissue. And then uh, also uh, we can use glue or, or, or suture as, as the preference. And, and uh, it's, it's hard to, to talk about these because we need larger series and uh, better sample sizes. But uh, the, this, this could, could be a potential, obviously, the disadvantage of this, this cost and, and that effect is temporary. But uh, we, we published a part of the results recently. And well, I'd like to thank all the KPRO mentors and, and, and friends and looking forward to see you all in the next World of Talmologico Congress in Guadalajara, Mexico. Thank you all very much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to allow me to present our data. So the talk, the title of my talk today is going to be Prognostic Value of Periprostatic Tissue Loss for Corneal Melting and Longitudinal Anterior Segment OCT in Patients with Boston Type 1 Cartoprosthesis. As we all know, and we already uh, hear a lot this morning, corneal melting is an important complication of Boston Capro surgery, ranging in incidence of about 3 to 16% is responsible for 40 to 80 percent of cases of BKPO removal or replacement. And the main complications related to corneal melting are endophthalmitis, acros leakage, hypotony, choroidal retinal detachment, choroidal hemorrhage, or BKPO extrusion. The anterior segment OCT provides high resolution images of the anterior segment, allowing the visualization and measurement of key structures, which could not be seen in the slit lamp examination of BKPO eyes. So based on that, the, aim, the main aim of the current study is to evaluate and monitor longitudinally the presence or absence of tissue loss that we are going to call as gaps between the type 1 front plate and the donor cornea, in addition to the epithelial coverage of the front plate edge that we are going to call as epilip using the anterior segment OCT. So this is a prospective study that we included 42 eyes all patients uh, underwent implantation of the BK Pro at Messineer between 2010 and 2014, and we performed anterior segment OCT in the four cardinal quadrants around the K Pro at two time points with a minimal interval of six months between the image and acquisition. So the emphasis during image acquisition was on visualization of the device donor cornea interface. The presence or absence of corneal tissue covering the edge of the front plate was determined, as you can see in the yellow arrow in the left image. And areas of thinning and or melting were measured using the caliper function of the OCT machine. As you can see, a gap between the front plate and the donor cornea in the right side. And here we are zooming in and the way how we quantify the area of the gap. Briefly, the demographics shows that 50% of the eyes had titanium backplate, 50% had PMMA backplate, 
the, uh, the most common indication for the KPRO implantation was multiple failure graft, followed by the infection keratitis, trauma, congenital conditions, or, and their pericaritis. So all four OCT quadrants of the 42 eyes were analyzed at the baseline visits. And interestingly, 55% of the eyes showed gaps in at least one of the four OCT quadrants. And the underlying disease and the backplate material did not imply difference in the incidence of gaps. When we compare the area of the gaps between quadrants that had the presence of epilepsy versus the quadrants without the presence of epilepsy, interestingly, we find that the OCT quadrants with epilepsy showed a significant decrease in the gap area compared to quadrants without the, the presence of the epilepsy. So among those 42 eyes that we uh, did the analysis at the baseline, we followed 25 eyes during the follow-up visit with a mean follow-up time of 1.3 years. And from the baseline to follow-up, the mean gap area progressed in six eyes, remained stable or regressed in nine eyes. A new gap merged in three eyes, and seven eyes remained without gaps. If we consider only the quadrants that had a gap stable or regressing over time, 88% had epithelial growing over the edge of the front plate. So 88% of them had epilip. When we consider the quadrants that had a gap in progression or quadrants that had a new gap uh, over time, 70% had epithelial growing over the edge of the front plate. And interestingly, if we consider only those quadrants without the presence of the gaps in any time point, 98% had epithelial growing over the edge of the front plate. So I'm going to show some clinical case, rep some representative images of this case. So out of those six eyes who had the mean gap area progressing over time, we had two patients with history of corneal melting and BK probe extrusion in the previous surgery. So this is the first case. It's a male, 65 years old. It's the second KPRO of this patient. The first one extruded due to corneal melting. And if we see at the baseline visit here, we have no gap in this image. And after six months, we have a small gap in this area. I know that this is small, but it's interesting to see that the location of the scan is exactly the same in both images. This is a second patient, second case, female, 68 years old, the second KPRO of this patient as well, and she, this patient also has a history of KPRO extrusion due to corneal melting, and there is no uh, tissue loss at the baseline, and after two years, we start seeing some tissue loss here, and it's interesting that uh, at the baseline, you can see the epithelial growing over the edge of her front plate seems to be thicker than um, at the uh, follow-up visit. Uh, we have another patient, a third patient, that developed corneal melting, leading to BK pro extrusion during the study. So, the top, so this is a female patient, 82 years old. It's the second K pro of this patient. She also extruded the first K pro due to corneal melting. And if we check the baseline, we have these gaps in the inferior location. And after six months, it's clear to see that now we have a communication between the external environment with the anterior chamber. And if we check the location of the scan with these thinning areas here at the follow-up visit, we can see that they are exactly matching with the baseline gaps here. So in conclusion, anterior segment OCT allows evaluation and monitoring of the presence of potential tissue loss between the BK Pro front plate and the donor cornea. The presence of corneal tissue covering the edge of the front plate may be a protective factor for developing the corneal melts. The progression of gaps between the front plate and the donor cornea may be an indicator for higher risk for corneal melting and BK pro extrusion. The early detection and monitoring of tissue loss may be useful to prevent clinical complications due to corneal melting. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you for having me. So um, today I'm going to be talking about our experience with primary K-Pro placement at UIC. 
Um, this project was done under the direction of Dr. De La Cruz and Cortina. Um, so traditionally, we think about um, implanting KPROs in patients who have had multiple graft failures in the past. However, we've all seen patients who are at high risk for graft failure even with a first graft. And this can be for a variety of reasons, but um, generally patients who have significant neovascularization uh, or in our study actually a large proportion of patients who had limbal stem cell deficiency who uh, in order to rehabilitate vision may require both a limbal stem cell transplant and a corneal graft which uh, can benefit them but comes with the burden of systemic immunosuppression and prone to significant failure rates in the long term. So these are sort of the type of patients that we think may benefit from primary care capro placement. So the purpose of our study was to report the visual outcomes and complications of primary Boston type 1 capro placement um, in patients who are at high risk for traditional corneal transplantation. This was a retrospective study of patients um, from 2009 to 2014 at UIC who had a capro placed. Uh, of course, these patients did not have prior corneal transplantation, and we wanted to have a longer-term follow-up, so we excluded anybody with less than 12 months of follow-up. In total, we had 22 eyes that met the inclusion criteria. These are indications for KPRO in this population. About a third of the patients had aniridia. 27% um, had chemical injury. There were a couple other patients with other etiologies for limbal stem cell deficiency, um, and then uh, uh, variety of other high-risk characteristic patients. So preoperatively, the median vision was counting fingers with 91% of eyes having a vision of counting fingers or worse. Postoperatively, the vision improved to a median of 2080 to 2100 with 68% of eyes achieving greater than 2200 vision and 36% of eyes achieving greater than 2050 vision. Our average follow-up time was 42 months. In terms of complications, um, RPM was common. Uh, we had it in 45% of our patients, and all of these patients underwent a YAG. One did undergo a surgical membranectomy. Glaucoma, as uh, many have discussed today, is also, was also an issue in our patients. 64% of patients had increased IOP after the surgery. Most of these were managed with drops, but 14% uh, of patients did require surgical intervention. Um, also of note, 9% or two of these patients had a pre-existing tube shunt prior to KPRO placement. Both of these were still on drops afterwards, and we had two patients who also had concurrent uh, shunt placement with the KPRO, and these patients had well-controlled IOP post-op without the need for drops. Um, we've heard a lot about corneal melting today, and uh, certainly this was an issue in our study population. We had 23% of patients who developed corneal melting. All of these patients um, eventually underwent a replacement KPRO. Um, in terms of underlying diagnoses, three patients had aniridia, one with EEC and one with chemical injury. Two of the aniridia patients actually had recurrent melting, um, and in terms of RPM as a risk factor for corneal melting, four of these five patients did have RPM. Persistent epithelial defect was a little bit less of an issue in our patient population. There were 9% or two patients that had a PED, um, and both of these patients improved with a hybrid contact lens and lid procedure. Retinal complications, 23% of patients developed CME, um, 3 out of 5 did well with drops, and 2 of 5 uh, received intravitreal injections. One patient had a retinal detachment that was uh, fixed surgically. So this is just a table going over the complications as I have discussed previously. Also of note, none of the patients in our population developed endophthalmitis. This is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve for the retention of Capro in our study. We had six patients who ultimately underwent replacement of KPRO. Five of these were due to melting, and one of them uh, at the time of surgical membranectomy and RD repair. Um, it's kind of interesting to know that there's a group early on that melted. There was one patient that melted at 49 months, uh, and with fewer follow-up, that's uh, the reason for the big dip at the end. Um, so just briefly, this table, we just wanted to compare our outcomes with KPRO versus what's been reported in the literature for PK or limbal stem cell transplant. Um, so in comparing these for KPRO, we're talking about percent retention of KPRO for PK, the clarity of the graft, and for limbal stem cell transplant, the maintenance of a stable ocular surface. So in general, we do uh, on par with, you know, kind of the higher end averages or better, um, except in the category of aniridia, where, um, as we discussed previously, we had several patients who melted, and so the numbers are lower there. 
uh, put this in here just to emphasize that um, this is a table showing just percentage of patients with improved vision. Um, and even though those anoridia patients who melted and required replacement K-pros um, you know, experienced significant morbidity, many of these patients ultimately did well, went back to their baseline vision. And so um, they require close follow-up, uh, follow but with prompt treatment um, can do well from a visual perspective. So in conclusion, um, we believe that primary k placement is a reasonable option for patients who are at high risk for graft failure. Um, in our study, at an average of 42 months, 68% of eyes achieved greater than 2200 vision and 36% of eyes achieved greater than 2050 vision. Our most common post-operative complications included increased intraocular pressure and RPM. Um, and then uh, the other point to keep in mind is that especially our patients with aniridia appear to be at higher risk for melting, requiring replacement of K-PRO, close follow-up. Um, however, in the end, they did uh, do well in terms of visual outcomes. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Alison Gibbons. I'll be talking about the impact of PARS plan of vitrectomy on complications in aphakic Boston keratoprosthesis patients. I have no financial interest to disclose. Well, the Boston Capro is the most popular artificial cornea available currently, and changes in its design, technique, and period of period of management have actually had a very positive impact on its survival and its final results. The aphakic model specifically is usually reserved for patients that are previously aphakic, have anterior chamber IOLs, or unstable posterior chamber IOLs. Studies have suggested a better refractive outcome when compared to the pseudophakic model, but have suggested maybe an increase in the rate of posterior pole complications. The purpose of the study specifically is to aim and establish if a complete plan of vitrectomy performed at the time of surgery has a positive impact on the rate of complications in patients with an aphakic snap-on Boston Capro type 1. We chose to maintain the model stable so as not to include other confounding factors in the analysis. The methods, while well, this consisted of retrospective chart review, all the surgeries were performed at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, and they all had at least 12 months of follow-up. We finally were, managed to include 48 eyes, so 45 patients, and of course, patients were divided later for analysis whether they had received a partial vitrectomy at the time of surgery or not. The age of the patient, even though the average was around 60 years of age, it was very diverse. We can see the range is very, very wide, and the follow-up was at least uh, on average, over three years, but as I said before, they all had at least 12 months follow-up. As usual, the main indication was multiple graft failures, and we had significant amount of comorbidities. I will not show them all, but most importantly, glaucoma in over 70% of our sample, and over one quarter of our sample had a previous part plan of vitrectomy as well. So at the time of surgery, all these patients received some uh, form of combined surgery, and specifically regarding the vitrectomy, 22 eyes, nearly under half of our sample, had a complete pars plan of vitrectomy at the time of implantation, and by complete I mean through the pars plana and all the, um, peeling all the way to the vitreous base. 26 eyes, or a little over half of our sample, did not have a pars plana of vitrectomy. They usually had either an interior approach or they had had a previous pars plana of vitrectomy, which we do not know whether it was complete or not. They also had variable amounts of iridectomy, complete or partial. A lot of them were all previously aneritic. They had different types of lens surgery and glaucoma surgery as determined by the surgeon. If we analyze the visual results and we compare three time points, the preoperative vision, the best ever, and the final, there were no differences between the group that received the partial plan of vitrectomy versus the one who did not. But of course, if we compare within the group, preoperative versus best ever, there was a significant gain of vision in both groups. The metric of 2200, which is usually used in KPROS, I deferred to use it at this point because of the um, potential vision in this group seemed to be particularly low when they fake it. So we used the metric of uh, initial visual gain and it's maintenance. We can see around 70% of the sample over time kept their initial visual gain. But now if you subdivide this group versus the ones who did have a pars plana vitrectomy at the time of surgery versus those who didn't, we'll see that there was a significant trend towards the pars plana group to um, maintain that initial visual gain. Same thing could be said about any complication. If you just group all patients, any complication present, over half our sample had any complication. And specifically, a little over one quarter of our whole sample had a posterior pole complication, endophthalmitis, retinal attachment, choroidal attachments, et cetera. Now, if we analyze this by groups, we'll see there was a significant decrease in the overall number of complications in the pars plana vitrectomy group, as well as a significant decrease in the 
uh, posterior pole complications in our part of plantar vitrectomy group. Uh, retrostatic membrane, we had present in 16.7% of our sample, but this, since the study was done in retrospective fashion, we only chose patients who had an intervention for retroprosthetic membrane. It was very difficult to quantify all the data when you do a retrospective analysis. So this is retroprosthetic membrane intervention, be it laser or surgery. Also, glaucoma progression was something we did see. This is visual loss attributed to glaucoma progression, and it was seen in a little over 10% of our sample. Again, if we divide this by groups, we'll see that the intervention, the necessity of intervention for retroprosthetic membrane was significantly less in the group that received the pars plantar vitrectomy. And uh, visual loss attributed to glaucoma progression clinically was also significantly less. Corneal melt around 10% of our sample as a whole, and retention rates were high around 90%. But again, if we divide this by groups, we'll see that there was a definite trend towards a, a less frequent corneal melts appearing in our patients that had received a pars plantar vitrectomy at the time of surgery. And the retention rate, even though this, these events were quite rare, there was no uh, significant difference statistically. Regarding posterior pole complications and analyzing them individually in the phlomitis and retinal detachment, we can see we have a little over 10% of each. But again, if we divide them by groups, we can see the pars plantar vitrectomy group did not have any events in the first five years as reported in this graph. And this was statistically significant, but much to our surprise, there was no difference in the amount or rates of a retinal detachment over time in both groups. Of course, the study is limited by its retrospective nature, and also it probably reflects changes in care and management over an extended period of time, basically the eight years this model has been available. If a Boston cable type 1 surgery can significantly provision in selected patients, but of course complications lead to loss of the initial visual gain experienced by all these patients. And pars plantar vitrectomy at the time of surgery significantly decreases the incidence of glaucoma progression and ophthalmitis and interventions or necessity for intervention for retrospostatic membrane and tends to decrease the loss of the initial visual gain over time and corneal melts. Thank you so much for your time. And since everybody is ready for lunch, um, we won't have discussion. We'll have discussion during the lunch, which is served right outside. There's a patio. Feel free to sit outside. Um, the restrooms are right across the patio, so if you want to go walk across. For the afternoon session, we'll come back here. Actually, instead of 2.10, we'll come back at 2 p.m. here. So that way, we'll have an extra few minutes if we want to take tour this afternoon. So we'll be back at 2. Then at 2.50 or so, we will go to in front of the Shaili Institute to take a group photo. We got to have a special wave or something for Jean-Marie Perel, who did so much, who put the program all himself together with Jose de la Cruz, and he's not here. So I think we, should, we need to send a little video clip this afternoon waving to him. We got to come up with something creative. All righty. Thanks. See you. Do Dr. De La Cruz just mentioned we have something special going around, which is a secret sign before some big father of keratoprosthesis who sits in front gets to the room. We want to make sure everybody signs it so we can give it to him. Is he around? Not yet. Good. But if you're next to him, don't pass it to him. Perfect. And on that note, we wanted to let you know that we are so glad everyone is here from around the world. And um, thank you. Dr. Chodosh and Dr. Manis for um, moderating this session. As you know, this is the last session in this auditorium. After this, we will go take a picture. Um, for a few minutes, we can take a tour of the Eye Institute for whoever is interested, and then we will have a session downstairs in the conference room downstairs of the Shiley Eye Institute. We are just trying to get you closer to the beach sooner. Okay, <laughs> that's why we are moving down. So Dr. Dela Cruz. Thank you, Nelly. So we're moving on now to our fifth session in which we'll discuss a modified osteodontal keratoprosthesis in Boston Capro type 2. And uh, we have great moderators for the session. Dr. Jim Shoders and Dr. Mark Manis will join us as moderators. And uh, Jim, please. So Dr. Maria De La Paz will give her first talk on tibial keratoprosthesis. <laughs> Victor's going to talk about improvement in MOIQP current <laughs> procedure and updated complication management. See, your title was too long. I couldn't read it. 
It's a reflection of the procedure. Well, once again, um, I want to thank uh, Jose and Natalie for organizing the symposium, and Jen Marie Parel, who's uh, in Miami, looking at us again. And thanks for putting a great course together. Um, what I'd like to share with you for the next 10 minutes is our experience, and I'll say humble experience, because certainly there are attendants in this meeting that have more experience in the use of biological keratoprosthesis in the care of patients with systemic inflammatory diseases. I have no financial disclosure. In fact, I'm a financial liability to Dr. Alfonso and the Vasco Palmera Institute. <laughs> uh, and certainly, I want to start with this slide because um, you know, the indications for keratoprosthesis pretty much is like real estate. It's patient selection, patient selection, patient selection. And certainly, the type of patients that we're going to be talking in this session today are the patients with severe corneal alterations, chemical burns, Steven Johnson's patients, uh, thermal burns, pemphigoid. And these are patients that certainly not only have an autoimmune characteristic and inflammatory capacity of the ocular surface, but certainly, which I think is the most important thing in all these patients, is that they make no tear whatsoever. Uh, fluid and tears are essential for the success of any type of corneal surgery that we do right now, and patients without any tears would not succeed. We learned this very quickly from Klaus when they published that patients with severe um, ocular surface diseases don't do well with the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis. And certainly when we look at the other type of keratoprosthesis that are available, we think of them as biocompatible, biointegrated, and biologically. What I would like to focus today in the use of the Falcinelli or Strampelli Falcinelli MOOKP. Uh, certainly we also, uh, and Jim will be talking later about the type two keratoprosthesis, and certainly uh, these are two options that um, we are lucky to have for this type of patients. Um, when uh, I joined Bascom Palmer, uh, having a conversation with Dr. Alfonso, decided, well, we should do this procedure. And uh, I went to Italy naively, not knowing exactly uh, what I was getting into. But certainly, the basic concept uh, created by Dr. Falcinelli, uh, student of Trampelli, is that you use a biological tissue, uh, the tooth and the bone of the maxillary region, uh, to use it as a transporter of the optical cylinder to put it in this arid, non, completely hostile ocular surface, so it integrates. A very important part of this procedure, as I said, we need to address that dryness, is that the ocular surface microenvironment is completely replaced by the oral buccal mucosa. And of course, we all know here how well the buccal mucosa, it's uh, served the ocular surface of the eye. Uh, briefly in this procedure, again, uh, the buccal mucosa, and again, is very important. It's used to cover the dry, hostile ocular surface of the eye on these patients. Patients undergo a vitrectomy, lens removal, complete iris removal, and uh, um, tooth, in most cases, the canine, which is the longest tooth with the longest the single root, is used as a transporter of the optical cylinder, which is placed over the surface of the eye. The only thing that goes into the eye is the optical cylinder, and that whole complex is covered by the oral mucosa to provide that protection and integration. We did our first uh, patient almost five years ago uh, with a relatively good success, but certainly I'm here to uh, tell you of our experience of what we have learned from this venture. We've done a total of uh, four cases at the Bascom Palmyra Institute. These are the different indications. Most of them were Stephen Johnson's patients. And certainly we have uh, had our, our learning curve tested. Uh, if there's something that we learn is that this is a very difficult procedure to do. And certainly the learning curve is uh, extremely uh, steep. Um, most of our patients, two of them, had good initial outcomes. The other ones were uh, known and changed and I'll explain to you what exactly happened to those patients and what we have learned. Uh, well, one thing that we've learned is that these patients obviously are susceptible to infection. Obviously, in a form, the immune system is not perfect, and this is our first patient who developed an abscess in the place where the keratoprosthesis was placed to incubate for three months. Uh, we were able to remove how we handle this complication. We were able to immediately remove the keratoprosthesis, rinse it with antibiotics, and place it in the clavicle, subclavicle space where it rested there for the rest of the, of the time, and then we were able to successfully use it uh, as a keratoprosthesis. But lesson to learn, this patient needs to be followed fast and expeditiously. Uh, Bocal mucosal ulceration, most of these complications, Jim already mentioned them, and it's completely true. Uh, these patients, as our first patient, had a horrible 
according uh, to mucosal ulceration. But what we have learned from this is that they actually, the mucosa is very friendly, and you can actually patch it and patch it again. This is our second patient. Uh, I, we believe that some of this ulceration, it's not only because this patient also has mucosal disease from their Stephen Johnson's or pemphigoid, but also you know, how they get vascularized in the center of the, in the, of the cornea, and they might undergo a small period of necrosis. So the, again, the, the thing is that these mucosas can be repatched, repatched, and repatched, and eventually be used. So that's a good learning lesson from that point of view. Uh, right now, uh, in our future plans, is to actually start with the mucosa step, because we figure out that it takes, we can waste at least as much as three months trying to get the, the mucosa correct, and we want to minimize the time of that the tooth is sitting on the subcutaneous space. So uh, from what we learned from the OKP, uh, I'll show you three things that we've been uh, trying to uh, improve. First one is improve preparative uh, screening, uh, minimize bone resorption, and uh, I think the most important development is can we develop a new artificial eye. Uh, this is case number three, which we were very excited because anatomically went well. The patient immediately went from light perception to non light perception, and sure enough, when we look at the posterior segment, the patient had already advanced glaucoma. So this actually uh, increased our impetus to really try to improve the preparative evaluation of these patients for visual rehabilitation. And even though I'm giving you an example of OKP, I think this can also be applied for other forms of keratoprosthesis. So we started doing uh, endoscopic examination to directly look at the posterior segment. We use a 23 gauge endoscope. This procedure really takes five to 10 minutes with no complications, and we can directly visualize the posterior segment and take a look. This is a, uh, uh, one of our cl uh, classical patients that have ocular, severe ocular surface disease. And basically, once you find um, the limbus and go three to three, four uh, millimeters uh, posteriorly into the skeletal tissue, uh, you can actually go inside with the endoscope. You don't need to do, you don't need to do a vitrectomy or anything like that. Uh, directly, you can go and find the posterior segment. And as you can see, even though it looks really, really dark, at the end of the day, you find the light at the end of the tunnel. You're able to evaluate the optic nerve very well. And this patient was extremely cop, and we decided not to do the procedure. Uh, we published our preliminary data where we saw, we evaluated 10 patients preoperatively with the endoscope, and out of those patients, three only, we decided to do keratoprosthesis, and the visual outcomes were improved. Um, certainly, uh, the patients have a good visual feel and vision, and, when, and, and I'm lucky to have Dr. Jean Marie Parel, and uh, with the work of Victor Hernandez, we've been trying to assess what exactly this patient sees through the keratoprosthesis. Uh, Victor developed a camera with an adapter where you can put the optical cylinder, and this is a little bit of an idea of what these patients see. Uh, basically, when they're outside, um, it's a lot of glare, especially in this day in Miami where it's rainy, as usual, but once you go inside, the patients are able to detect more detail. So uh, we've been using this to improve the optics of the uh, optical cylinder, and uh, of course, uh, trying to get comparison results, asking patients how real this is. Uh, patient number two had a, was a patient with a severe uh, chemical burn. Uh, we performed uh, the osteodontokeratoplasticis in his left eye. He was 27, he corrected to 2030, uh, 11 months before leaving Bascom Palmer by going back to Texas. And I got the famous call, I was punched in the eye. So 13 months later, uh, we came back and certainly uh, we could not find the optical cylinder. And the reason that we could not find the optical cylinder is not that it was fault, that it was not there, but that it, with, uh, it got introduced into the osteodontokeratoprosthesis. Again, I have Dr. Parel and, and his lab, and we were asking the question how hard or how resistant the lamina can be, and he actually developed this experiment where the, uh, controlling the speed and the weight of this ball, we can actually assess how resistant the lamina can be. The lamina of the tooth is right here. If this is equivalent to less than five kilograms uh, of high impact, uh, the tooth holds actually pretty well, but more than that certainly will destroy the tooth. But of course, we're not that strong <laughs> when we go uh, in a fight. So um, when we do a CAT scan with a bone reconstruction uh, of the patient's uh, keratocoprosthesis, what we immediately noticed was that the patient had a hole, basically the optic was floating using the keratoprosthesis, indicating the third complication that Jim mentioned, which is reabsorption of the lamina. So um, our first case uh, ended with bad result because of reabsorption. She complained of floaters. Uh, actually, this was probably 
uh, leakage through the uh, reabsorbed lamina, and that's why the patient ends up with and extrusion of the keratoprosthesis. So what affects reabsorption? I think it starts at the time of surgery. If you think about it, this is what we do. We, with a high-speed saw, we cut the bone, and all the way to the maxillary area, the bone is removed, and certainly once we do this, we expose the eye and the, uh, the keratoprosthesis to more thermal stress. This is uh, us using a high-speed uh, knife to put the keratoprosthesis. So as we're doing and giving more and more heat to the keratoprosthesis, we believe that that starts the process of reabsorption. So thinking that in mind, uh, Dr. Parel and his team, we've developed, we asked him, we want a meal. And that's exactly what he did. He developed a meal where we can actually minimize the amount of, uh, of time preparing the tooth. And certainly, uh, it works very nice. It's manual. Uh, we keep the tooth always in the water bath to minimize the temperature rise within the bone and the lamina. And you know, compared to be freehand doing it, uh, you can do it very automatically. And the results uh, anatomically are very good. Uh, we've looked. This is when you do manual um, carving of the tooth. You see that the temperature is always pretty high despite manual irrigation. And by using the meal, we certainly can, um, the, um, sorry, the previous one was the meal. This is the, using the manual. Uh, we also cut the time of the, uh, of how to, uh, the time to prepare the keratoprosthesis. And this has been covered, uh, will be covered later on, but the, the surface of the keratoprosthesis is also very smooth, which we believe will minimize uh, biological filming. So uh, the final improvement for us is to develop a, an artificial eye tooth. And in collaboration with Joe Sawatari, our, or, our oral surgeon, which is really good to work with, we develop what we think an artificial eye tooth. Uh, we envision having a keratoprosthesis that will be placed over the surface of the eye. The optical cylinder will go only in the eye. And as we learn from the keratoprosthesis, we will cover this with oral mucosa. This is the, uh, the MITIK pro, the prototype. And certainly we're installing that. So the, this surgical surgery works, but we can do better. And certainly I would like to finish saying that uh, there are low risk cases and low risk cases still there's nothing wrong with a corneal transplant when you have more um, uh, significant, uh, never, repeated uh, graft failure in a wet healthy ocular surface as we described today, the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis is a procedure of choice. But when you have these patients with high risk characteristics and autoimmune disorders, certainly uh, the biological keratoprosthesis uh, is uh, one solution. And uh, us and Jim will be discussing the type 2, which have uh, come back uh, into use. And we're very happy to collaborate with him. I really want to thank uh, first the KPRO team at Bascom Palmyra Institute. Uh, corneal surgeons, Dr. Alfonso Guillermo Mesqua, that helped me take care of all these patients. And Dr. Jean Marie Parel is not with us presently today, but he's been the impetus of improving techniques. Our oral surgery team, and certainly uh, our Dr. Abdina Barrocal, a retinal surgeon, and Dr. Juan Giancarlo Falcinelli and Johnny Falcinelli, who help us uh, institute the osteodontocaratoprosthesis, and of course, for the funding of the different institutions. Thank you. So good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will make a, a, a presentation about Tibia Capro, which is probably something that most of us here, we are all probably Boston Capro surgeons, but this technique has probably, it's not probably, have you, ha you probably haven't seen it, uh, the video, or you probably haven't even read about it. So just a little background from my team from Barcelona, which I'm, I'm very pleased to represent, especially Dr. Temprano, who developed the technique. We started doing uh, different types of keratoprosthesis in the 1950s with Professor Joaquin Baraquer. Then in the light, late 1970s, we started doing Strampelli, so OKP, which was uh, wonderfully presented by Dr. Victor. In the late 1980s, Dr. Temprano um, um, developed this technique of using the tibial bone as an alternative to tooth. And in 2006, we started using the Boston Capro. So I agree with the previous presentation that we should, I don't really think we should push the Boston Type, Pro K, type 1 Capro in extreme cases because we want very good results with the Type 1. So I think we should really consider doing a biological Capro in cases which have severe keratinization, simblepharon, and um, autoimmune diseases. So this is um, stage 1A. You clean up the ocular surface. I think any ocular surface surgeon can do this. 
you do the mucosal um, graft, and this is the um, the 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 this is how the eye looks after implanting the oral mucosa a few months after. And uh, probably most of us haven't seen this video. Um, how do I click on it? Right here is the, uh, oh, the, right the, there. Okay, the mouse. So this is a surgery that um, we opened up the skin at the upper inner third of the tibia with a Bard Parker knife. This is a, a trifine burr, which is about 10 millimeters in diameter. We want to go into a depth of about four to five millimeters. This is a cornea surgeon doing the procedure, Dr. Temprano himself, and I have done a couple of cases myself. You just close it up afterwards, put some antibiotic powder, and now we are fashioning the tibia um, lamina into our disc of about three millimeters in height. We are using dental instruments here, just like when we do the OOKP. We want to um, smoothen out the edges to avoid the cubitus ulcers. And this is done under, um, without even using the microscope, but just a simple surgical loop or even just reading glasses of, of about plus four. So this is the view of the, um, the tibial caper lamina. We create the central hole and um, Dr. Temprano um, put some peripheral holes for better biointegration using simple dental instruments. That we enlarge in the central hole. This is the, a carbide burr. It really isn't that difficult because if I have done it myself, I think everybody can actually do it without even asking for an, of, um, a trauma surgeon to do it or an orthopedic surgeon. Then we use um, the resin to stick the cylinder into the tibial bone. So that's the finished product. And just to summarize, this is uh, the upper inner third of the tibia. This is the trifine burr. Sometimes we want to harvest two um, pieces just in case we have extrusion. This is how it looks like. This is implantation into the inferior um, orbital socket. And this is the appearance of the eye a few months after stage three. So I will present our results in the Baracare Eye Center. All patients were operated by Dr. Temprano. Um, 113 patients with a mean age of 53 years. 40% were female. Our mean follow-up time was 4.2 years. We decided to use only one eye per patient to, to uh, decrease, de decrease statistical bias. We defined anatomical success as retention of the keratoprosthesis lamina and functional success as visual acuity above or equal to 0 0.05 on the decimal scale. So about one third of our patients were chemical or thermal burn, Stevens-Johnson, pemphigoid, trachoma. And we, when we take a look at the, at the anatomical retention, we have a fairly good result of about 70%. Five years, 54% to 10 years. When we take a look at the diagnosis, we see that there's uh, some kind of a difference and chemical burn seems to fare out really well, especially in the long term. This is in years. You see some patients actually have about 20 years of the carrot prosthesis in place. When it comes to different age groups, it seems that older patients fare out better and we think that this is due to decreased osteoclastic activity in older patients. When we take a look into the complications and how it affects the anatomical retention, we can see that if the patient only had glaucoma as a complication, then it obviously does not affect the anatomical retention. So to summarize the anatomical results, we have good success rate 70% and 54% at five and 10 years respectively. Diagnostic group of chemical and thermal burn have the best prognosis, while OCP and Stevens-Johnson have the worst, although statistically not significant. Patients between 70 and 89 years of age have statistically significant better prognosis, again due to probably less osteoclastic um, activity. Patients with post-op glaucoma and retroprosthetic membrane have tendency for better anatomical retention than those with multiple complications and infection. Now, when we come to the visual results, it seems that we have very discouraging results with 34% at five years and 19% at 10 years. But I need to explain that 
Um, Dr. Temprano developed this technique as an alternative procedure which is less aggressive to an OOKP, so probably these results are a little bit skewed, okay? But when we take a look at the different um, diagnostic categories, there does not seem to be any difference. Um, the same thing with age. And um, when we talk about uh, functional results, we can see that glaucoma probably um, has the, and retinal detachment have the worst uh, visual prognosis for these patients. And of course, patients without complications fare out better. So this is just a short summary of the main pre-op visual acuity of, the, of all the patients, which is light perception. They improve to 0 0.17 and end up losing some lines at the final follow-up. So to summarize the functional results, we have fairly acceptable um, visual acuity, statistically pre-op diagnosis and age of the patient don't seem to affect the functional results, and patients without any complications obviously have better uh, visual results. So probably the question now is, how does the tibia capro compare to the OOKP? So let me present our results. 145 patients with OOKP, 113 patients using tibia, mean age is uh, comparable, same with the sex, and the mean follow-up time, of course, we have longer experience with the OOKP and 4.2 years for the tibia capro. When we put all together all the patients, it seems that tooth fares out anatomically better than the tibia, although statistically not significant. But when we look only into the chemical burn cases, which is um, one third of our cases, then we see that really it seems that even tooth, uh, it's really, there's no much difference uh, between tooth and tibia. And so with age, we don't have any statistically significant uh, difference when it comes to this age group, which is uh, the mean age of our study group. And then when we, took, when we take a look at the visual results, again, there's a little bit of skewing when we compare tooth with tibia. Tooth seems to fare out better than tibia. Again, I explained it because of probably skewing, res skewed results because of uh, choosing the technique for patients with worse uh, preoperative um, evaluation. So this is um, comparing the two. When it comes to chemical burn only, we can see that there is really no difference when it comes to visual, um, visual acuity results. And then with the age group, also without any statistically, uh, significant, st statistically significant difference, so in conclusion, when we compare OOKP versus tibia, when we adjust for diagnosis, which is chemical burn, or for age, OOKP and tibia have the same anatomical results at 10 years follow-up. Functional results are slightly better for OOKP at 10 years, and these results are based on 145 cases of OOKP and 113 cases of tibia, with a mean follow-up time of 9.5 and 4.2 years, respectively. So um, our take-home message with regard to the KPRO is that it is an alternative procedure for patients who are edentulous or those who have um, deciduous teeth or pediatric cases. In my opinion, it's a simpler surgical procedure, which any cornea surgeon can do. We, in our hands at least, we do not need an orthopedic surgeon. We do not need... Um, need to reconstruct the leg after doing the surgery. Intraoperative and immediate postoperative complications are less alarming. You will not have the very feared complication of an oroantral fistula. I have not seen any case of osteomyelitis. At least I have never um, heard about it from Dr. Temprano or his publications. And I think it is comparable to the gold standard of OOKP in terms of retention in the medium to long term. So I really encourage everybody to look into these procedures, especially the biological capros, and that we are very open in Barcelona to, uh, for people who would like to learn this technique. Thank you. Our final speaker in this uh, section is Dr. Chodo. She's going to talk about the differences between type 1 and type 2 capro. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have a short session. 
blessedly. Uh, Jose asked me to talk about the issues of type one, type two, try to create some perspective with the MOAKP. I'll do my best to do that. Um, <clears throat> this is the standard Boston design, Boston type one character prosthesis design that was used uh, almost exclusively up until a couple of years ago. And it's a three-piece design with a PMMA front plate and stem, which are lathed from a solid PMMA rod, a back plate, which up until a few years ago was always PMMA, and a titanium locking ring. And here you can see the device from the back, and I think uh, almost everybody in this room is familiar with this device. This was called the snap-in design because you would hear a, kind of almost a snapping sound as you push the locking ring onto the device. More recently, we have FDA approval for the click-on back plate, which combines the features of the titanium locking ring and the titanium backplate into one design. So it no longer makes a loud snapping sound. Sometimes you hear a little bit of a crunch. You certainly can feel it, um, but it's extremely easy to put together. It has the structural stability of the snap in design, and uh, you don't have to worry about your locking ring tiddlywinking onto the floor and searching for it for 20 minutes while the patient is under anesthesia. Uh, so uh, we know also about what the general disorders are that we treat with keratoprosthesis. This is corneal graft rejection, aneritic keratopathy, mucous membrane pemphigoid. Here's pemphigoid with uh, a dermalized surface, and this happens to be a Stevens-Johnson patient who's developing ankylobleferon. So, okay, we have these conditions. I think this hits the general range of what we have to treat. Um, this is a patient of mine uh, that I showed earlier with an alkali burn. The other eye was burnt out of the socket, was no light perception. And this patient had hand motion vision after a failed graft. And with a Boston type 1, this was the snap-in with the PMA backplate. The patients had an outstanding outcome. Indications for this device, the Boston type 1, have been evolving, but I think most of us would agree that the best cases are those with multiple corneal transplant failures or rejections. Aniridia is also very commonly used. I use this as primary surgery in my aniridics. I don't like to do grafts anymore in these patients. Any patient with corneal scar and significant vascularization after infection, uh, patients who are post-chemical or thermal injury, assuming that they have an adequate tear film and good lid function, other sources of limbal stem cell dysfunction, and severe ocular surface disease can be considered in the absence of keratinization or some blepharon for type 1 surgery. However, although we've heard talks today about using the device in Stevens-Johnson and Pemphigoid, I agree with Dr. Aldave that this should only be done by people who have very thick skin, who make themselves completely available to their patients and have a strong interest in these diseases and see a lot of them in order to gain the experience because the, the uh, disasters are frequent and uh, you need to be ready to see the patient at a moment's notice and take care of them. So this I showed earlier, too. It's from Donald Tan's article showing the osteodontal character prosthesis, which I think in terms of retention and vision, um, depending on which article you read, uh, still has an outstanding track record of longevity if used in the right patient. However, there's this need for oral surgery. Um, we heard a little bit about this already from Victor and others. You have to have the certain tooth size. If you're below that tooth size, you can't have the surgery. Uh, good dental health, which uh, if we remember that many of the severe corneal blind are poor, guess what other kind of care they don't get? They don't get good dental care. So even though they may have normal sized teeth, the teeth may be unhealthy and that may eliminate them from having the surgery. The tibial K-Pro obviously would be a, a choice from there. The necessity for at least two lengthy surgeries. Some groups break these surgeries up into three and sometimes even four uh, surgeries. Victor mentioned knowing the optic nerve health. Uh, in Chennai, the, the first part of the procedure is to remove the cornea and they do the vitrectomy and intraocular surgery and look at the optic nerve uh, before going forward with uh, some of the more aggressive components of the surgery. And then the final cosmetic result is unacceptable to some patients. Uh, in, uh, in England, the um, patients all see a psychologist before and after surgery because uh, when they finally can see and see themselves, there's uh, sometimes horror at their appearance. The protruding eye adds tremendously to the thickness of the eye and its protrusion, and there are um, prosthetic devices to wear over it, but not all patients can wear them. And then we have the mucosal complications and tooth loss. So uh, I've spoken at meetings with Professor Falcinelli, and he very much encouraged me to, to keep going with the type 2 character prosthesis. 
Um, this is the FDA approved click on version. The only difference is instead of this smooth front plate, we have this anterior extension which extends out between the lids sort of like a telescope. In 1992, when I was finishing residency, um, I saw one of the less than 15 character processes done uh, in the world, and that was done by Milton Bonyak. He, uh, I'm not sure what the design, it was a collar button design, I don't know whose it was, but he took um, fascia lata, he took mucosa, he had pieces of all over the body in that eye, and then <laughs> covered it with a mucous membrane graft, and it was a Down syndrome patient who I think lost their eye about a year later. But I saw one and was fascinated, and it started in me an interest, an intense interest in the surgery. Go 20 plus years later, and there were 1,200 Boston Capros implanted uh, worldwide. However, only about a dozen of those were type 2. I forgot to ask Larissa the exact number, but I'm guessing it was about a dozen. And I would guess that uh, probably 9 or 10 of those were ones that I did. So when would we do a type 2 keratoprosthesis? Uh, of course, corneal transplantation not amenable to routine corneal transplantation, or uh, and not likely amenable to type one. So, if you think a corneal transplant is going to fail, but yet the patient has uh, neural vision, that's when we think about a type one keratoprosthesis. But when you also think that that type one is likely going to fail, that's when you should start to think about type two surgery. So, patients with severe symblephron uh, and keratinizing dry eye; those are contraindications to type one surgery. So. This is a patient with Stevens-Johnson syndrome 14 years prior. You, the patient had decreased blink. You can see the dermalized surface. I don't think there's any way the corneal transplant could possibly survive this eye. And I personally don't think that a type 1 keratoprosthesis will, will uh, survive it, maybe with extensive lateral and medial tarsorophies, uh, removal of the mucosa, sort of what we call a modified type 2, where you put in a type 1, but you do it almost everything else the way you would a type 2. And this patient did well with a, with a type 2 prosthesis. This is a patient I showed earlier uh, who's doing very, very well with a type uh, 2 prosthesis. She, I don't know how, but she somehow made it into USA Today as a success story. However, we know that we have to look at data. I'm always impressed with Tony's papers because he's very data-driven, and I respect that. This was... Um, I didn't know that you would be here presenting um, when I brought this paper, but this is really the paper that I look to as a benchmark publication on success with the type 2 character prosthesis. And uh, this is uh, from Barrique. And the two-year functional survival, which is defined as better than 2200 vision, was 63% for osteodontal character prosthesis. And they had 10-year survival data, which is fantastic. We don't really have that for the Boston device and they had over a third of patients retra retained ambulatory vision. So again, I don't have to, it's like preaching to the choir. I, I think that's a fantastic outcome because these are patients who without surgery would be light perception or hand motion, and yet they have ambulatory vision. So these are my benchmarks as, as we go forward with the type two, and our results are something a little bit less. In patients with at least five years of follow-up, and this is the last decade, not the current decade, but uh, 2,200 or better vision was maintained in almost half the patients, and those that uh, didn't maintain it had the, the obvious and typical reasons for not getting there, glaucoma, retinal detachment, age-related macular degeneration. Uh, and again, so if we're looking at five-year survival of 46.2% versus 10-year survival of 38%, I would expect that if we took those patients that make it 10 years, that we would see something less than the 38% but we're still working on it. Uh, in conclusion, the type 1 and type 2 can be used to treat virtually any blind and corneal condition not amenable to conventional corneal allograft. Uh, current decision making between those two devices requires attention, really, to the eyelid function and anatomy, the fornices, and m probably most importantly, the degree of wetness of the ocular surface. And also, I think uh, patients need to be informed before either uh, any type of keratoprosthesis uh, particularly type 2 surgery and especially the OKP, what they're likely to look like. I have a patient who recovered from hand motion in 2020 who every time she comes in, she says, I don't like the way this looks. And my only response is, but you didn't know how you looked before, <laughs> and, and now you can see yourself. So, you know, mostly I'm telling her stop complaining. Um, she's not suicidal, but there have been patients who have attempted suicide after uh, some of these surgeries because of their appearance. 
Um, I believe that outcomes with the type 2 device are improving. We're going to have to wait another five years to really prove that. We're learning more and more. But the problem with all these devices is gaining enough experience where you can draw legitimate conclusions, and that's uh, where the problem is. So with that, I will stop, and thank you very much for your attention. Put the lights up. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with a question for Victor. Uh, the intraocular endoscopy is uh, intriguing, but I wonder whether uh, if the nerve uh, is not completely white, uh, you're really going to get as much from that as you would from a functional study of some sort. So do you use PEP, ERG, color discrimination uh, to either augment or... Oh, I'm sorry. He's asking about cloth. Well, go ahead. So, Victor, go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a very good point. And, I mean, are we saying no to some patients that could potentially be helped by the keratoprosthesis? And that's always a possibility. I mean, we don't run all the battery of tests that, that you mentioned. Um, so, you know, we, we do have a low threshold to decide anatomically who's yes, who's no. So in our limited experience so far, the optic nerves need to be completely cut for us to decide it's not going to be a good candidate. And we also have the chance to look at the macula as well. Sometimes you find surprises that in ultrasound you would never find out. I have a type 2 patient that when we finally saw in the eye, we, everybody said, oh, no, because it was cupped. But the patient's 20-20 mm -hmm. with an ambulatory field. That's a good pressure. So sometimes you look at the nerve and you, it looks bad and the patient sees and sometimes it doesn't look that bad and they don't. Um, I wanted to ask Maria a question. So uh, Geetha uh, and Bhaskar Srinivasan published a paper where they used uh, bone morphogenic protein and um, bone powder to increase the lamina that had been resorbing. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And I, I, what I read in the literature is that the tibial K probe, the main problem has been resorption. So the question I had is maybe uh, some combination of uh, bone, tibia, for example, and some uh, biological could actually enhance or keep that bone intact. Yeah, Dr. Liu for the OOKT patients recommends um, giving supplements of calcium. But I guess um, bone resorption also has to do with age. As I mentioned, older patients bear better than the younger ones. But Christopher has no evidence that that makes any change. No. Yeah. So in Miami, um, Dr. Mark, he's the oral surgeon uh, that actually introduced me to Dr. Sawatari, who's my partner. And he's actually one of the inventors of BMT, I mean, oral surgery. And he's suggested to use osteodonto. However, as oral surgeons, they keep looking at us and asking, how does this work at all? I mean, in their experience, any type of implant, even in the mouth, it's very difficult for it to take. So they're still pondering. <laughs> How exactly how this works. And, you know, we've tried to talk to Dr. Falcinelli, or maybe we can talk to Dr. Temperano. It'll be interesting to go now and see the patients that have long term results <coughs> and actually look at bone reabsorption and see exactly how much you need in order to fail. So, my question is both for Victor and Maria, and with the advances in 3D printing and the whole idea that uh, potentially you can have bone. Um, and 3D printed, do you still need the tooth, the tibia, and uh, would you be able to have the perfect capro? We, um, we're actually working on that for both. I hope to have results maybe for next year and the next two years. Well, I, I noticed that um, uh, with the same technique and okay. from different places, uh, that would considerably considerable difference in outcome, which really shows that uh, it's very difficult to compare devices in between surgeons and, and so on. It is the, the severity of the disease and all kinds of vicissitudes that in the final analysis uh, determine the outcome. And uh, I think in the meantime, we just have to uh, work on the device that we believe in and try to make it long-term safe. I mean, that's long-term safety is, is everything. But I don't think we can readily discern one device against the other just 
uh, by outcome. <coughs> Other questions? Jim, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, what are you doing now for, I mean, I know we're trying to put this together, uh, maybe a message to other K pros uh, in autoimmune disorder patients. Uh, what are your thoughts on the immunosuppression, especially for the type 2 K pro? So, uh, it's in Stevens, but I don't use immunosuppression in the pamphloid patients that I see. Most of the ones that come to me, um, I, if the patient had active inflammation, I wouldn't do a K pro. Most of the ones that come to me are completely keratinized, dry, quiet surfaces, and there's really no residual conjunctiva to have inflammation. So it's not, a, it's not an issue. I don't think that it, I know a pamphlet can affect the skin, but it's not very common. So um, I don't think there's an inflammatory problem in those patients. But the Stevens-Johnson patient is a different uh, situation. And in those patients, we, if, if we have access and we can carefully monitor them, they're often, uh, George Pavliotis will put them on cell set. Now, I was interested in this uh, discussion about SGS before about infections. So I had a couple of patients while on cell set developed significant infections. And uh, I had one patient who developed su two successive infections in their K-Pro, and we, in a type one patient, and she is now 2020 again, but she's off her cell set. So I think immune suppression in the right patient, my problem is, and I'm still doing it, my problem is I'm not really sure the right patient, how long to use it, how much to use, when to stop it. And we're dealing with such uncommon events and uncommonly performed surgery it's very hard to draw conclusions from an individual um, you know, case. It's like if you walk out the front door of your house today and a bird lands on you, you know, maybe you should never use the front door again. So uh, rare events are rare events and we have to keep that in mind. Uh, and we're doing rarely performed surgeries. So it's a big problem. I don't have the answer, but I still look in Steven Johnson syndrome for immune modulation at very minimal uh, before operating. Yeah, we're doing the same thing. We're keeping a very, very low dose. But you know, I do think that you know the fact that they're dry, that there's not still inflammatory component. I mean, there are other sites of inflammation from the eye that can be active, and you know, if you have one, it's bad as well, especially because you have to go through the whole exercise. In a type two surgery, there's no mucosa left. I remove it all. So, but I don't think there's any mucosa left. I don't know where the inflammation is going to target, and we're not seeing skin ulceration in these patients. In a type 1 surgery, that's a different story. Have you tried a uh, type 2 with uh, oral mucosa instead of using skin? I, I personally haven't done that, but there are quite a few cases that have been done, cases that I've been present for. Um, we actually took our uh, Lucia modification and extended an anterior extension to make it sort of a modified type 2, which is being done in certain centers with uh, mucous membrane grafts. And you know, it has its pros and cons. You, it, like, there's no free lunch in, in anything, and certainly not in keratoprosthesis surgery. Some of the patients have done well. In Chennai, they had a number of extrusions of the modified osteodontal keratoprosthesis, about the seven-year mark. Uh, the tooth would resorb, and they actually stopped doing surgery until they figured out this BMP uh, study. Now they're back doing them again. And they were taking their extruded patients and putting in our Lucia design with an anterior extension. And some of those patients have retained some vision and are doing okay, but they're prone again to mucosal complications and uh, uh, breakdown along the edges and all these things. We, we'd like to redesign the type two so that um, there's more titanium and less PMMA adjacent to the tissue and then maybe be able to surface modify that titanium to make it more biologically uh, appropriate. Um, but that's, we have designs, but we haven't uh, even put them in an animal yet. So I can't really tell you whether that's a viable strategy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an end of one, but I had a patient, nine-year-old, uh, Steven Johnson's. I did a type two uh, like 15 years ago and uh, through a oral mucosa. And he ended up living like 12 years until he died of unrelated causes. So, I mean, it's something else to keep in mind. I think the mucosa has a lot of advantages. Um, it's certainly easier to re-op those patients than it is to open their lids after type two. <coughs> Especially if they're perfect. Jim, I think you've seen also, I think Jaime in Etiopia uh, in, in Spain, he's, he's dabbled with neural passion, I believe, which is also sort of interesting to, to see how that outcome is over time, over long term. I don't think we have the ultimate answer yet, personally, for these autoimmune diseases. Thank you.
you so much, Dr. Manis and Dr. Chodosh, and again, um, the men behind the scene, um, Dr. Jean-Marie Perel, who is going to, we want to wave to him, and also Dr. Jose de la Cruz. So next we will have our photo shoot, which will be done in front of the Shiley Eye Institute. So we are all going to walk down the steps or take the elevator down, walk through the, uh, the corridor, which is in between Hamilton Glaucoma Center and Jacobs Retina Center, and then walk through Shiley Eye Institute. We do not have a cornea um, institute. We have the Hamilton Glaucoma Center, the Jacobs Retina Center. So when you see Dr. Weinrep, please make sure you remember. <laughs> we got to fix that, yes. And we're not coming back here, correct? Uh, we are not coming right. back, so after the photo, um, we can have a 10 minute tour because I know many of the colleagues have asked for that. Otherwise, at 3.20, we will reconvene at the conference room uh, right by the side of Shidi. So where we take photos, it would be about 10 steps away from there. Um, so we can all head that way. Um. Welcome back. We'll start the uh, next session. Uh, and I, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, co-moderators, uh, Dr. Klaus Dolman and Dr. Bob Weinrab. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for hosting us uh, here. Uh, we really appreciate, uh, I'm sure, all the effort that uh, you and your faculty put uh, together to, to have this uh, happen. So thank you. And, and very impressive uh, facilities. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we'll start with the first presentation, and it'll be uh, In Search of True Integrating Artificial Corneas uh, by uh, Dr. Rosenblatt. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Jean-Marie and, of course, Jose for inviting me. and. Also, Natalie, for being such a gracious host. Um, it's a little bit intimidating being in front of such an august group who's made uh, many of the seminal contributions in keratoprosthesis, prosthesis, and hopefully um, I, I can bring up a few things to think about. I don't know um, how, much, uh, how much it will contribute exactly. Um, I do have some financial disclosures. We work in biomaterials and have some intellectual property related to using silk biomaterials for reconstructing corneas. All the other uh, um, disclosures are not relevant. Um, so when uh, Jose um, asked me to speak, I thought this would be a relatively straightforward uh, uh, talk. Uh, Keratoprosthesis integrate, they don't integrate, they might integrate partially or fully. And I, I thought about this for a while, and the more I thought about it, the more confused I got. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what integrating meant. Um, so to combine one thing with another so they become a whole. Um, well, anything we do to put things together, a whole part of a whole. I, I wasn't exactly sure where he was going, but I hopefully uh, will go in some directions. We think about how much integration we would want, whether integration is always a good thing, and, and what we might do to try to improve the amount of integration of the keratoprosthesis that we're using. So if we're going to have an integrated uh, keratoprosthesis, do we want it to look like a cornea um, structured just like this with epithelium that's stratified on the surface of the keratoprosthesis to really integrate it and serve as a barrier? Do we want a stroma that's organized just as our Native stroma is, is organized in a highly um, organized way with very particular spacing, or would we rather use a piece of plastic, which wouldn't exactly integrate? Do we even want to think about an endothelium? Endothelium are hard to grow. Uh, they're hard to work with. Do we want to create an, uh, a K-Pro that needs to have an endothelium? Um, I suspect perhaps not. So how much integration we really want? Whether we want it to work with all of the native tissues or just part of the native tissues in order to reform um, the new cornea? That, that's an important question, I think, which we really haven't answered completely. And finally, do we need it to be innervated? Um, we know that corneal nerves uh, do a lot of important things on the cornea. It's something that my laboratory works on extensively. But quite frankly, I'm not sure that an effective keratoprosthesis needs to be innervated. May maybe in some cases it does, but in some cases it might not to be, need to be neurally integrated in the way that a standard cornea might be, particularly in patients like this. Um, uh, is it reasonable to expect that we could form all of these beautiful layers of the cornea and have them meld effectively with a cornea that essentially looks like a piece of skin? Um, we wouldn't ever think about suturing a piece of native cornea to a piece of skin. Why should we uh, create an artificial cornea, perhaps that looks like skin, and try to have it grow in this kind of environment? And um, so, so I think we need to think about that very carefully. These inhospitable environments might call for corneas that either don't integrate or that look very different than, than the standard cornea for integration. Why might we even be concerned about integration? Well, one, if we can get the cornea, the artificial cornea, to bind in some way, to interdigitate with the standard cornea to have um, collagen formation that binds it, it might be more mechanically stable, certainly would be resistant to melting, perhaps. 
we'd want it to be immunologically tolerated. Um, we'd want it to be seen as a foreign body and attempted to be extruded. So the more native it might look, the more integrated it became, both mechanically and immunologically, the better it might be. Um, we, we learned a little bit earlier about uh, you know melting and infection, et cetera. So perhaps if there was a, a epithelium particularly intact to separate the outside world from the inside world, this would um, prevent chances of infection. I know that's one of the things we worry about very much when we send our patients out into the world. Sometimes when they disappear, they come back with horrible complications related to infection. And all of this, of course, is related to conceptually to retention. We want them to retain the devices, not only to retain the devices, but, uh, but to retain them in a manner that allows them to see well. So what sorts of integration might we be interested in? Traditionally, we've thought about uh, more of a peripheral type of integration, that you'd have a central uh, portion of the keratoparesthesis, particularly something like a, a Boston K-Pro or an OOKP, that, um, that has a, a central or inorganic a plastic part that then somehow integrate effectively with a peripheral piece of cornea or even sclera into which we're, we're suturing uh, the devices. So this would be more of a peripheral accommodation. Um, would we want a, a part of the K-Pro that would integrate and then degrade? So if you had a biopolymer um, that bound to native cornea and was then replaced by, by stroma, then you wouldn't necessarily need, um, need, need to maintain that excess piece of artificial cornea over time, and it might be better tolerated. Or do we want some sort of complete integration, like I mentioned earlier, where essentially you're trying to replace a cornea uh, with a new um, engineered cornea? I think that that probably for these um, particularly inhospitable cases, that would be um, uh, not very um, tractable. Um, in fact, um, the cases for which we often want the most integration are the cases for which um, integration may be very, very difficult to have. Um, for these standard graft failure patients, we actually do very well with our existing uh, devices. It's the ones where we have melts and highly immunologically based diseases that we hope for integration, and quite frankly, those might be um, the least likelihood of being able to achieve effective integration over time. So what about integration on the Boston K-Pro? Well, we tend to think of this uh, essentially as non-integrating. Perhaps we think that the cornea integrates with the peripheral cornea, much like a, a penetrating keratoplast test does. But you know, we think that the, the PMA or the um, PMA or the um, or the titanium essentially doesn't integrate at all. I, I think that perhaps we have evidence to the contrary. Um, some work that was done um, was been done by many folks, including our group um, when I was in New York City, um, looked at how epithelium can grow on the surface of the keratoprosthesis. So much like cells, epithelial cells can grow on tissue culture plastic, it seems that um, epithelial cells can grow on the surface of the keratoprosthesis, and essentially this is a form of integration. Um, it's allowing the host cells to interact with the device in a way that then forms a barrier. Um, Often we, we don't like these cells growing on the surface. They're not often growing in multi-layered in a smooth fashion. We have to peel them off to allow for good vision. But at the same time, those cells, when properly placed, may in fact um, serve as a barrier to infection. Um, that's something I think that we could think about whether we should permit the surface of the, of the devices to have some limited amount of um, epithelialization to at least allow for this barrier function. Um, we had heard some talks earlier about retro K pro membranes. Um, one might argue that this is a form of integration. Um, it's a maladaptive integration in terms of what we want the K-Pro to do, but it is, again, um, the, the, you know, the, the host tissue interacting with the device. Um, I think uh, Jose showed a, a photo earlier where it was melt, but it was the retro K-Pro membrane that was essentially preventing um, outside contents from going, uh, inside contents from going out and outside contents from going in, so it was adaptive in a sense there. So retro K-Pro membranes, again, a maladaptive form of integration, but there is interaction between um, Boston K pros um, and the host for sure. How about the MOKP? Well, biological K pros are thought to have the most uh, amount of integration, perhaps, of the devices that we use, um, and uh, and that is true to an extent. Of course, the the plastic uh, stem um, is put into the bone, etc., but doesn't really integrate per se. We don't expect. Um, bone to grow into that, uh, that's, that's that optical column. We don't expect the optical column to grow into the bone. So in a sense, that's more of a, of a gluing or, or, a, or a cementing of those devices in. However, um, we allow some integration to occur. And in fact, we often allow it to at least initially occur not in the, the site of, of, of the final site of, of the keratoprosthesis. So we don't have um, the OKP um, in the eye initially. We actually allow it to integrate elsewhere and then eventually transplant it into in situ. This is, of course, because as I mentioned earlier, the site in which we're trying to have the integration is really quite inhospitable. Um, so we give it a little bit of a head start, perhaps. 
Um, there are other integrating types of uh, keratoprostheses. Again, the alpha core not as widely used, but the idea to have a, a polyhema um, skirt that would allow it was porous and could allow um, cells and, and tissue to grow in. Of course, again, in, in the inflammatory conditions, um, this integration wasn't possible. Those kinds of beds are not hospitable to integration, and in fact, it was maladaptive in this case. Um, there's a care clear. I think we were, we're going to get a, we we're going to get a talk about this. Um, Essentially, the, the ease of implantation may be the advantage, but in terms of integration, um, this is an acrylic device which isn't expected to have a lot, a, quite a bit of interaction with the, um, with the surrounding tissue. Um, something I thought I'd bring up, although it's not commercially available, it's, it's pretty nascent, but I think that starts to embody the kinds of ways in which we need to think about integration. The Stanford artificial cornea is an interpregnating, uh, interdigitating forms of hydrogels um, that, are, that are pretty advanced biomaterial. The skirt of this, um, of this device is made with nano scaffolds um, to which you can covalently attach um, biologically active moieties, so essentially trying to combine the biological activity within a highly advanced biomaterial. I think de facto this device hasn't actually been um, as biocompatible as we would hope, but I think it's the, the, um, the interactions, the cross-disciplinary work between engineers, biologists, ophthalmologists that are going to be key to finding uh, in, uh, the kinds of keratoprostheses kerap that can integrate, particularly in these hostile environments. So where do we go from here? Well, again, I think material science is going to be important. Most of the materials that have been used thus far are relatively basic. Um, in the scale of what's being done in the engineering departments around the country. They know quite a bit about creating novel materials that are strong and highly biocompatible. The concept of 3D printing the materials in unique fashions that would be um, hospitable to the ingrowth of, um, of, of, of tissues. Um, we know more about corneal tissue biology. Wound healing in an avascular tissue is very different than the wound healing in a cornea that is highly vascularized, such as these. We need to know more about the immune responses that are occurring. Importantly, we should prepare the host. We, we talked earlier about whether we immunosuppress patients. We, do, we often worry more about how to design a device that's going to work better, where in fact maybe the devices are fine. We just have to prepare the patients for the integration that needs to happen. And there's a convergence, of course, with tissue engineering. Um, I think that we have a, a, mer a melding conceptually between uh, these purely mechanical engineered types of solutions and tissue engineered solutions that use biology, et cetera. So there are a number of stromal engineering approaches, for instance, using decellularized tissues, PGA scaffolds. May Griffin, of course, has perhaps the most popular version of an artificial cornea for stromal replacement that gets innervated, epithelialized, as healthy for endothelium, and has helped some patients. Um, in our laboratory, we work with silk films that we can pattern at the nanoscale. Worked with David Kaplan at Tufts University to create sandwiches of these um, uh, silk films on which um, keratocytes have been placed, and then um, begun to see how these can form multi-layered constructs that are, will eventually be biodegradable. So in summary, um, K-Pro integ integration may be able to improve outcomes, um, but, but in some cases they may not be able to. In some cases we may not want integration. We may instead prefer to have uh, something that's merely tolerated. The extent of required integration really isn't known. Existing K-Pros actually have several degrees of, of integration, and they vary, particularly in the context of the underlying disease, and it's really going to be cross-disciplinary efforts in tissue engineering, immunology, chemistry, material science, and ophthalmology, which are going to hold promise for, for identifying the appropriate integration. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We'll, we'll hold the questions until the end of the session, and then we'll uh, have questions for everyone um, and so the next uh, talk uh, let's make sure we're in the right order here is Dr. Noman uh, next or Bob you're going to do first? I, I want to introduce the talk. So. Okay great. Terrific. Well uh, first of all uh, welcome to everyone. This is a, a great honor for the Shiley Eye Institute and our Department of Ophthalmology to have an amazing and esteemed group of corneal specialists from around the world uh, I wanted to introduce the, the next talk because I, I think glaucoma continues to be one of the major problems that you have with, uh, with the K-Pro. Uh, I'm a rookie with the K-Pro. In fact, I, I owe so much to Natalie Afshari uh, because with uh, the advent of Natalie Afshari at the Shali Eye Institute, I had to become a quick study and, and learn all about the glaucoma problems with the K-Pro uh, because of the large number of surgeries that she's doing and, and uh, all of her skill in, in doing it. Um, one of the things that I realized very early is that it's absolutely absurd to be managing glaucoma in these patients or any patients with 
single measures of intraocular pressure. Uh, one of the other things I learned is that uh, you guys do things like palpate intraocular pressure. Uh, you have all kinds of gadgets you put on the sclera. And, and Natalie and I have an ongoing discussion about this, but uh, let me assure you that none of these things are accurate, none of them are reliable, and none of them are reproducible. And so there's a large unmet need to do something that can really help. Uh, the glaucoma approach is placing a glaucoma drainage device, and I was talking to Eddie Alfonso briefly uh, earlier, and he was talking about, you know, before the drainage devices, uh, you know, how glaucoma uh, was such a problem that these patients were all going blind and trabeculectomies were being done and nobody wants to do a trabeculectomy in the K-Pro patient. But I would say, you know, that, that probably it, even doing glaucoma drainage devices in these patients is not optimal and not a best approach. So let me just tell you, uh, show you a little about what you're doing with uh, current glaucoma management in these patients. You see a patient and you might palpate a pressure or you might take a Shiatz tonometer or you might take a Numa tonometer or one of the other gadgets uh, that, that we use. And you might see the patient again, and you're making treatment decisions. Do you add medicines? Do you do surgery? What are you doing? And in fact, over a period of time, whether it's six months, 12 months, 24 months, you have a couple of intraocular pressure measurements. In fact, you know, the real intraocular pressure may be lower than what you're actually measuring. Or the worst case scenario, you're underestimating the real intraocular pressure, and intraocular pressure really is much higher. Intraocular pressure always varies. It's, it's, it's varying instantaneously. It's varying second to second. It's varying even microsecond to microsecond. And, and even a single snapshot taken multiple times is not going to reflect what's really going on with intraocular pressure. Moreover, the intraocular pressure behavior at specific times on a given day does not provide meaningful information regarding intraocular pressure at specific times on other days. And this is why the one-eyed therapeutic trial doesn't work. Uh, you look at any given patient, and this is the same patient measured on different days, and intraocular pressure might be higher in one eye than the other at a certain time, or the next day it might, be, it might actually be lower than the other eye at a certain time. So, you know, what's the solution? Well, the solution is to be measuring intraocular pressure continuously. It's to be measuring it over 24 hours. And intraocular pressure is really going to dictate your treatment. You're going to be able to have a measure of uh, the area under the curve of intraocular pressure over time. You're going to be able to have measures of the variability of intraocular pressure, mean intraocular pressure, and you'll be able to be able to really determine what is the best management for patients. Some patients, it might be a simple pressure-lowering eye drop. In other patients, it might be a surgical approach. And then ultimately, we'll probably have surgical devices that integrate pressure monitors and, and will be regulating intraocular pressure based on what you uh, place in the devices. So a couple of introductory comments, because I'm very excited, actually, to hear the next lecture uh, on 24-hour sensing. 24-hour intraocular pressure monitoring offers potential for personalizing intraocular pressure for optimal glaucoma management, not only in K-PRO patients, but all patients with glaucoma. Over the next five years, I think we're going to have the introduction of these into clinical practice. It's not going to happen first in the U.S. You know, the regulatory process here is challenging, and the, uh, the IRB process is also very challenging. I suspect that, you know, these devices now are becoming available in Europe, and in the Lex lecture, we're going to hear about one of the, the very exciting devices, probably the one that's most advanced. And what we're going to have is a plethora of data, which is going to provide deeper insight, you know, about what we can do and how we could better manage these K-PRO patients. Thank you. is going to talk to us about uh, IOP uh, monitoring uh, through an electronic pressure sensor. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great honor and pleasure again to be here. Um, and as uh, you just said, uh, you're a rookie. Yes, well, I'm, I'm a rookie in care to prosthesis also. I started uh, by far as the first one in Germany. Uh, six years ago, and um, have uh, 
obviously one of the first problems that I came across was the glaucoma problem. And with a little eye twinkle, I may say that uh, I'm one of the last European fossils who's not a subspecialist, but uh, is still a comprehensive eye surgeon. And therefore, I uh, take care of a multitude of problems, amongst them also glaucoma. I do have my personal views on glaucoma, and I superbly appreciate much of what you have just said, and I think we could have a meeting entirely on that subject already. Uh, um, this is essentially just an introductory s slide, uh, much of which is commonplace, has been, and with everything we've heard this morning, uh, I don't have to go uh, into anything of that in any detail. It's frequently associated, two-thirds or even more, uh, if we could measure them all properly. Um, it is uh, um, either associated with the underlying disease or caused by the K-Pro surgery and uh, its, its volume um, uh, problems in the eye uh, or both. And then monitoring, we, you have just uh, pointed to that. Monitoring is extremely difficult. Classical measurements are not possible. Palpation is inexact and error prone, and even the most experienced ophthalmologists, and I've been in ophthalmology now for 45 years, and we have had competitions in measuring glaucoma and palpating it, and have, have had sessions of, uh, of uh, sitcoms about uh, the very experienced ophthalmologist who lay extremely aside of the actually measured value. What we do have, and I don't know if you have it available in the United States, uh, what we do have available is direct manometry with a cannula. Uh, we do use that, and I do use that regularly in my, uh, my at-risk uh, keratoprosthesis cases, direct manometry uh, invasively with a cannula. This is obviously very exact, but still has the problem of being momentary, just a momentary value. You can't do that uh, 10 times a day. And um, it is invasive, it does have a basic wrist, and it is of, as I just pointed out, limited frequency, and therefore functional loss is frequent just because we don't really know what we're dealing with. Uh, the, uh, oh, to my knowledge, only intraocular pressure sensor uh, and why continuous measurement of intraocular pressure is the one and only way to actually approach the problem of glaucoma has been very aptly uh, uh, been um, uh, laid out just a minute ago, is the implant data pressure sensor by the name of Argus. Implant data is the company, a Hanover, Germany-based company. And this is the latest version here. Um, this is the backside. Uh, this is the membrane that the, the displacement of which uh, measures the pressure. This is the front side, and you can see some of the integrated circuit here. And this thing here is, this is a gold coil antenna to transmit the uh, measurement values to the outside. This here is a handheld um, sensor um, which um, measures, number one, the outside atmospheric pressure, because that's the pressure against which intraocular pressure is measured, and it provides the power uh, to the intraocular sensor uh, to uh, read out the values that it's measuring. These are construction designs just to give you an idea of the dimensions. The, uh, the diameter is 10.9 millimeters. The little haptic protrusions of silicone into which all this is uh, hermetically embedded um, protrude another 0.3 millimeters. And the whole thing, and you can see how clumsy it still is. Fine, fine as it is, it's still clumsy compared to the intraocular structures is 0.9 millimeters thick um, at the uh, sensor edge, and it's still 0.6 millimeters thick at the thinnest part of the coil antenna, and, and that's mostly due to the ensheathing with silicone. Now, what's the current knowledge base that we have with the sensor? Uh, Dani and Associates Melki, the, the, the Boston group, have described it in detail already. Plange from Aachen, uh, the uh, Technical University of Aachen, was really at the, uh, uh, at the base of the development of the sensor. 
uh, have described it, and uh, I don't think it is of uh, further interest to describe the integrated circuit. We are all not electronic engineers. It is an application-specific integrated circuit. I've shown you a little part of it, uh, so-called ASIC, with a microcoil antenna, silicone embedded, as I just showed you. There's an external reader, which is coupled to the sensor uh, um, by, press by, by pressing a, a button by an electromagnetic high-frequency field, which provides power supply, and then the external reader also measures ambient air pressure. It's tested and found well tolerable in rabbits. The Boston Group uh, has done some, uh, some very important rabbit studies here. Two Boston Capro cases have been operated in Santa Domingo in 2009, 2011 by the Boston Group again, and currently this sensor is in human study for glaucoma in pseudophagic patients. Uh, uh, currently, there are five German centers involved. Uh, it's called the Argos II study. Argos is the name of the sensor. Um, recruiting is uh, far slower than anticipated. Um, so uh, uh, up to now, I think there are eight implanted uh, patients. And there's already a wealth of uh, first um, measurements and data coming out, which uh, uh, which show a lot of the characteristics that you have just so aptly pointed out. Uh, Argus with the K-Pro now, uh, I have initiated an own study. It's called the Ar uh, Argus K-Pro study. It's ethics committee approved, and uh, in, uh, I'm, at, at the moment I'm the only center, because until recently I was the only center in Germany to, to do K-Pros. Uh, I've included the first patient, and this is just the opportunity to, to report this to you. So it's very, very preliminary, of course. It's a congenital aniridia syndrome patient uh, who had cataract extraction with an aniridia, IOL, secondary glaucoma, uh, as not uncommon. One failed Ahmed implant above, and then I had to take that one out due to heavy scarring. Now he's currently controlled with a second Ahmed implant that was implanted from temporally inferiorly. And finally, he, I could not find a compatible living-related donor, also for family reasons, uh, uh, available for liberal stem, stem cell transplants to create a surface into which a uh, keratoplasty may have a certain chance of being successfully implanted. Um, he had one failed limbo, limbo keratoplasty, Again, to, uh, with, the, uh, with the intention to give him a chance to uh, come up with a, uh, a corneal phenotype epithelial surface. So that finally was the indication for a Boston K-Pro. It's, it's also an only eye. The other one was lost with uh, a, um, retinal det a retinal detachment and PVR. So do I just click here for the video? Um, this is just a short video to show you uh, the, a few decisive steps. I have created for myself a double tree fine in order to uh, guarantee central trephination of the central hole. This then is the uh, mounted K-Pro. Here you can see the aniridia IOL and of course the, the Ahmed, uh, the little Ahmed tube. The anterior segment is filled with viscoelastic. And now the pressure sensor is laid on, uh, is implanted with the microcoil antenna. I just turn it around to show both sides. It is implanted with the antenna underneath the um, underneath the tube here. So I slide it underneath that one first to guarantee uh, proper placement and to guarantee that it's not going to. Uh, entangle with the tube. The, um, the tube is implanted, as I usually do those, is implanted under a scleral lamellar bed. I do not cover them with donor sclera because it's, it uh, is much less bulky there, and that's why this guy can wear a contact lens. You can see here, temporally inferior, there is no bump from a scleral transplant. Then the uh, engineer from Implant Data advised me to uh, take the pressure sensor as far away as possible from the tube. So I rotated, otherwise 
that would have been planted. And uh, with the uh, pressure sensor at 12 o'clock right away. And you can see already one of the minor but still existing design weaknesses is that it is, has a fixed diameter. And of course, the eye sulcus does not have a fixed diameter. It's the age old problem with all implants that you put into that space. Uh, and and the, uh, the wheel is, it has to be reinvented every time a new implant comes, in, uh, comes into place. And then the, um, the K Pro is placed. Excuse me, is placed on top. Um, I think we can. Um, you can see I have radial marks, equally spaced radial marks, because the trephination was performed with a Crewmic GTS system, where I can very exactly and centered to the opening place radial marks, and the K-Pro comes with its own radial marks in, in terms of the holes. Here the, the globe is pressurized, and this is what it looks like at the end of the surgery. Currently, the young man is 10 weeks post-op. Uh, this is the morphological status just uh, two or three days ago when these photographs were taken. I apologize for the oblique angle, but that was the only photograph I could get at proper sharpness because he has such a, a wild nystagmus, of course, and that's difficult to photograph. But I hope one can see uh, that, uh, that the uh, implant, even after now 10 weeks, is absolutely stable in exactly the place where we put it intraoperatively. The IOP is between 16 and 19 millimeters of mercury, and that is uh, uh, within plus minus two millimeters, the Argos and the invasive manometry uh, are within plus minus two millimeters of mercury, and um, that I personally find very promising uh, for the future because we do not deal with any indirect uh, biomechanical problems with uh, corneal uh, thickness measurements and so on, uh, senseless as they are in the first place. So a, pre a preliminary experience summary may read like this. The implantation with the K-Pro was without obvious problems, as I hope I could show you. It is well tolerated so far over 10 uh, weeks. The handling by the patient, well, this is a young man, uh, is without any problems. The reader failed after seven weeks. Well, we just were going into collecting enough data. Uh, the reader failed. The uh, engineers have not yet really found out why that was. They, um, they theorized that uh, the boy might have rubbed the eye and therefore mechanically have interfered with the, um, uh, with the implant, which is, uh, but they, they can't uh, so far yet properly determine it. We uh, have just uh, recently uh, recalibrated the reader, but um, that was kind of as, as a, at a given value, they just, uh, used the value that was last measured, but already we don't know if that last measured value wasn't already influenced by mismeasurement. Uh, so uh, in a week or two, uh, the young man comes back for the next scheduled intraocular invasive measurement, and we will then recalibrate the reader to that, to that measurement. Uh, and to finish this up, what are at first sight, of course, there will be many, many more improvables as we go on, but uh, certainly improvables are the thickness, the bulk, that is currently 0.9 millimeters. Um, and that's probably also one of the reasons why the, recruiting, the, the recruitment for the pseudophagic glaucomas is so slow, because it takes guts to put this bulky thing into an otherwise healthy, only quote unquote glaucomatous eye. And then there is, as I pointed out before, uh, the haptics and the fixation issue in eyes with a capsular support, in eyes without a capsular support. You don't, I, I, I find it uh, stone age techniques to run a suture through, this, uh, through these silicone ears and then fixate it somewhat uh, waggling and wiggling uh, uh, transclerally. Uh, we must, and I have proposed that we must find 
a fixation that's independent of ocular tissues. We're thinking of if we could get it small enough and everything, of fixating it maybe on the posterior stem of the uh, of the optical uh, uh, of the optic stem, and uh, we must find a way of recalibration uh, and or uh, rule out that the uh, that the uh, reader shifts out of measurement range. Altogether, I still find it very promising. Uh, for the very many reasons, for the very obvious reasons that I think to repeat would be commonplace, and um, uh, yet we still have a long way to go. But uh, this is the first, in my view, the first really promising uh, quote unquote solution. It doesn't solve the problem of the glaucoma, but at least it solves the problem of being able to monitor it and to know what's going on in these eyes. So. There's a rainbow on the, hor on the horizon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we'll uh, proceed with contact lens drug delivery and how it could uh, benefit the Boston K Pro. Joseph? I'd like to thank uh, Jose and the organizers for allowing me to give this presentation. It's a subject matter that I'm really excited about, and uh, the story really starts with the Boston K-Pro patients. Um, as we know, ocular medications, uh, the majority of them are delivered by drops, over 90% of them. Drops are inefficient, and there's poor compliance. When we talk about the K-Pro, you probably have patients who are on several of these drops, if not all of these drops at one point in time, antibiotics, perhaps an antifungal, perhaps a glaucoma drop, and a steroid. So the reason the K-Pro patients inspired this work is because they need multiple medications, perhaps multiple antibiotics, and they wear a contact lens. If they don't have the drops, they could potentially lose their vision due to glaucoma or lose the eye due to endophthalmitis or another infection. So the uh, thought was, well, why don't we use the contact lens to deliver the medication to the eye? That way we ensure that as long as the contact lens is in place, the patients are getting their medications. The, uh, the idea is not new. It was introduced in the 1960s, and there's many, many challenges. At this time, there's no commercially available products. The approach we took was taking a very thin drug polymer film and embedding it inside of a contact lens. So it's completely encapsulated in the contact lens material, kind of like some of the cosmetic contact lenses that have a coloring. Here's a uh, OCT picture of the film, and you can see this thin drug polymer film. This one is latanoprost and PLGA, and it sits right in the middle of the contact lens material. We can change the size of the aperture. Um, we found that if we make the aperture six millimeters, it has absolutely no effect on the vision, so the vision's perfectly clear. And it, the contact lens can be made with refractive power. So in our first uh, publication, we incorporated ciprofloxacin as this design. This is a very much a prototype contact lens at the time. The y-axis is mass per day of the drug. And you can see we got a very large burst, but we were able to sustain zero order release kinetics, meaning same amount of drug each day, every day, for 30 days. This is cumulative mass, so then zero order looks more like a straight diagonal line, and we found that we can modify the release kinetics by changing the polymer employed in the drug polymer film. In this case, we're changing the molecular weight, but there's other ways, including the drug polymer ratio. We incorporated econazole into the contact lens, and in benchtop studies, we show that we can maintain complete killing um, for three weeks with an econazole releasing contact lens with a dose response, depending on how much was loaded into the lens. And then one of the uh, questions was, can we use the treat glaucoma, given that glaucoma is a fairly prevalent disease and many patients who are non-compliant with the, with the drops. Um, some of our patients use multiple drops. Um, this is kind of a hyperbole, I guess, for glaucoma, but 
it's really not too far off if you think about some of our K-Pro patients. If you think about they're taking their antibiotics, their steroids, maybe one or two glaucoma meds, and they're spending a lot of their day putting in drops. So it would be nice if they could change their schedule to look something like that, where the contact lens replaced maybe once a week or once a month. Here's a latanoprost eluting contact lens. It's in a rabbit's eye. It's uh, here. It's very hard to see because it's the drug polymer film is fairly translucent. Um, here you have a, this one is about a six millimeter aperture. Here's the drug polymer film. You can see a bit to the edge maybe, and then the edge of the contact lens. That was pulled down so you could see it. And uh, what we did is we looked at the area under the curve over 24 hours from a drop, and this was our therapeutic goal. And we placed the lens in the eye of the rabbits, and at various time points removed aqueous humor and quantified how much the, what the concentration was. And what we were able to show is we got that burst, and they were able to uh, maintain sustained delivery over the course of the month at levels that were at the goal or perhaps a little higher. We had a, uh, a lens made specially for dogs, and uh, this was with a N of 1 out of the 10 dogs. Only one kept the lens in. Apparently, it's very hard to keep contact lens in dogs, and we found that out firsthand, even after a trial set was used. Um, and what we found in that one animal was we were able to maintain the pressure reduction as one would expect uh, with latanoprost, about 6 millimeters of mercury in that one dog. We've uh, gone on to glaucomatous monkeys, and we uh, again created a trial set with nine different lenses. And um, th because of the short fornix and the prominent steep cornea, there's actually a very specific um, combination that worked. Um, and uh, it's, the eye's not as forgiving as, it, as a human eye. In this study, we just started two weeks ago. And so we were using a lens for one week of drug delivery. Um, I can't share the results yet because we're just confirming them. But right now, we're super pleased with the results. The, uh, the lens was maintained in four animals for a week, and it seemed safe and very effective during the time that the lens was in. So as soon as we have that data, I'm happy to share it. So what about a contact lens to treat ocular inflammation? For capro patients, um, we have the problem of sterile botrytis. Um, there are some conditions we think that may, um, that, that uh, some retroprosthetic membranes might be prevented by increased steroids, and there's a literature to, to support that, and perhaps tissue mounts. So we have a dexamethasone eluding contact lens as well, and uh, we did a similar study where we look at the area under the curve over a certain time period, and so here we have the hourly drops, and we also have four times a day dexamethasone. And then we placed the contact lens in the animal, removed the aqueous humor at various time points, and we also looked at serum. What we find is we get a very large burst and we're able to maintain drug levels in the aqueous humor that is equal to or greater than uh, hourly drops for about four to five days and maintain levels that are about four times a day over the course of a week. Interestingly, the serum levels remain very low. Uh, we, see, we need to do comparisons to see how it compares to hourly drops, but it seems like the ratio that, of drug we're getting into the eye compared to systemically is, uh, is, is quite high. So quite a bit of drug in the eye not as much in the serum, in the, in the blood. We've looked at tissue levels at a couple different time points, and we find very high levels in the cornea that are equal to or greater than hourly drops, um, certainly greater than subconstitutival injections or retrobulbar injections. Interestingly, we get fairly high levels to the back of the eye, and uh, we've looked at this at other time points, later time points, and the levels just seem to be rising in the back of the eye. So in, uh, in conclusion, this, um, this work was certainly inspired by Boston K-Pro patients, and uh, we've developed a contact lens design that we think we've demonstrated as a platform for drug delivery, and it certainly can deliver medications that can be used by K-Pro patients. One of the benefits is compliance and also, we think, increased efficacy with possibly less adverse effects related to the excess drug and waste. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Heather Durkee. I'm from Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami. And today I'm going to present the work that um, me and my Dr. Pearl's lab did in Miami. Um, sorry, is this better? <laughs> okay. Um, the work that Dr. Pearl and I, um, Dr. Pearl, did in Dr. Pearl's lab in Miami to better visualize what a K-Pro patient sees. Um, 
This is my financial support. I have no financial disclosures, closures, and I'm grateful for these people for helping, especially Richard Ingram, who's in the audience. Um, he provided a lot of assistance with the optical, um, one of the optics that I'm going to present. So the purpose was to replicate what a KPRO patient sees um, and maybe give clinicians and potential KPRO and MLK patients a better understanding of what their vision would be like afterwards and evaluate the optics. So I evaluated an MOKP optic, a Boston type 1 optic, and the new MIDI optic. The MIDI KPRO is a, um, uses a titanium skirt that's placed on top of the cornea, and the optic goes through the skirt into the cornea, and then mucosa is placed um, on top and sutured to the sclera. So the methods, um, Dr. Perez presented earlier the, what an MOK patient sees. We've um, since updated the system and used a larger sensor camera so that we could capture the full field of the optic. Also, we placed the optic at the focal plane, so we're only evaluating the optic. In the previous condition, we were evaluating the optic of the camera and the optic, so this is an improvement. We mounted to the camera with a black plastic custom-made piece to block stray light. So on the top left, you can see the MIDI optic, the right is the Boston Type 1, and in the bottom, the MOKP. And you can see in the MOKP, there's a lot of halo. Oh, this is in Miami, so it's like very bright today. And I tried to read a map, and I was about two feet away. So you can see here from the final images uh, the quality of the three. And here I did it at different distances. So the Boston is on the top at eight feet, four feet, and two feet and the MIDI is below at 8 feet, 4 feet, and 2 feet. So then I moved from the map and I decided to go into the research part of the hospital. Um, you can see the, the changes in light um, make different distor distortions in the optics. Um, there's some halos. And then we we'll look here. Um, you can see the door in all three optics, and you can, you know, navigate through. I mean, you can even read the rug. So um, I tried to read a sign that was outside, and you can see the difference with the MIDI on the left and the Boston Type 1 on the right. Um, and one of the things that struck out to me when I was doing this is the MIDI had good depth of focus for a large range. So you can see these blue columns are in focus, or with the Boston Type 1 and the MOKP, it's un you can't see that. So for the MIDI, you can see both near and far, not near, I'm sorry, like relatively near and far at the same time, not near like reading. So then we went inside, and you can see the changes in light made a difference. Um, we're coming through. Both the MIDI and the Boston have good vision and you can, you can find the water fountain. Um, there's bathrooms on the left and you can distinguish between which bathroom you should go in. You can find a door, read whose name's on the office, and you can, oh, you can open a door with a key, which is important. So you're not doing it by feel, you're doing it by sight. Then we go into the lab with the MO, oh, I'm sorry. I'm ruining my presentation. <laughs> I'm gonna break the computer. Okay. Okay. When you're coming into the with the MLKP, you had to scan more because it's a much smaller field, and the halo really obstructs a lot of the vision. So the patient would have to scan more. And we sit down at a computer. And then um, I tried to use Google. It was very difficult to look through the camera. I wasn't used to it, but um, the MLKP was not very clear, but both the MIDI and the Boston, I mean, I think you can navigate pretty well. So then I tried to read a magazine. Um, this is just a magazine that we had out in the lobby. The larger text you can read with the Boston and the MIDI, MIDI but for the MOKP, I, I found it very difficult to read. And the Boston had very good near um, quality, but it has this central halo in the center that would obstruct your vision. 
So then we wanted to do something a little more objective, and we did a visual acuity test in the eye hospital, uh, and pretended we were a patient and did the refraction. And with the MOKP, um, I think that the best that you can resolve is 2070. Then with the Boston Type 1, we did the same. I would say 2060. And then with the MIDI, I said 2030. And then side by side, you can see the difference. The MOKP, the Boston, and the MIDI. And then here. Um, and then we did a Jaeger chart test where we placed the Jaeger chart 14 inches from the camera. And then this was the result for the MOKP. Um, for the Boston Type 1, the same. And the result was Jaeger, oh, I'm sorry, Jaeger 5. And then for the MITI, MITI uh, Jaeger 7. So this is the three results side by side. So in conclusion, I think that this was a good way to evaluate what the quality of the optic and what these patients have the potential to see. And I think it could be used to better understand some of the visual distortions that are reported by patients and to help improve the visual performance for the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we'll go into any questions, discussion. Dr. Dolman, any comments? Well, I found it. <clears throat> very, very interesting. And um, uh, the sharpness of the Miami titanium is that due to uh, an uh, titanium clad stem, or what do you think? And then it has to be related, of course, to the patients who see 2020. Yeah. Uh, how come? Uh, it doesn't exactly jive. Uh, I, I still think that it's very valuable. It's a very elegant study. But that needs to be recon reconciliated a little bit. Yes, it's live stream, yeah. yeah. Can we use the microphone? Sure. sure. Actually, we should wave all of us to Jean-Marie Prell, who is actually watching and uh, is texting um, Jose. Much love to you. Hope that everybody is waving to you. Can you see it? Um, the question is... Um, for Dr. Perel's lab, Heather. By any chance, did you look at this through polarized glasses? Because it seems so much of it is the glare, and it would have made complete difference um, in the results. No, we can find out. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not really sure what that means, since we have seen patients who are 2010 with all these prostheses. But my real question is for Dr. Weinreb. So I keep asking, we have these devices. We put tubes in the eye, which are of known diameter, and we put all this hardware on the outside of the eye, double maltinos and all sorts of things. Why don't we have a device that both measures and regulates the pressure right now? Can't we make the electronics small enough in a, in a device that sits on the sclera and measures the pressure coming back through the tube and then regulates what, how, how much resistance is there? I mean, I keep saying to myself, why are we waiting for this? It seems like something that should be within the reach technologically today. So, so there are a number of such devices that are being tested in the laboratory. And moreover, I would even go one step further, Jim. Uh, not only do you want to be able to measure pressure um, and, and be able to regulate pressure, but you also might want to consider delivering drugs at the same time whether it's intraocular pressure-lowering drugs, whether it's uh, drugs relating to the inflammatory response, or perhaps even neuroprotective drugs. Um, 
It's less easy than one would have thought. Uh, we are currently in a process of constructing a uh, nano pump uh, pressure sensor controlled um, evacu aqueous evacuation system for uh, glaucomatous eyes. The electronics uh, challenge and the challenge of integrating a, measure, um, a measurement device, the by far smallest achievable, is as bulky as the one you saw, plus the nano pump, which is the world's smallest nano pump produced by the Fraunhofer Institute in Munich, uh, is, um, is limiting what we can currently do. We're, we're going forward, but the, um, the, uh, the technical challenge is far beyond what we thought when we started the project. Comments? I have a question. I mean, I, I haven't seen uh, many of us patients with keratoprosthesis where, you know, uh, pressures are measured in different ways, OCTs are obtained of the optic nerve fiber layer, and we do visual fields and serial photographs, and yet these patients, something happens to their optic nerve that vision goes away, and there's death neuronal death in the optic nerve that we can't explain why. And, and I am tempted to say that it's absolutely not pressure related, that something else is going on. Our optic nerve specialist, what is going on? Well, I, I would s suggest that until you can continuously measure intraocular pressure, uh, the most probable explanation is that it is intraocular pressure. So when we look in our sleep laboratory uh, here, at, uh, at UCSD, uh, what we find is that two-thirds of our patients, for example, their highest intraocular pressure is not during the daytime, which is what many of us probably learned when we were residents or whatever, but the highest intraocular pressure is nocturnal uh, intraocular pressure. Moreover, intraocular pressure varies with position, and so supine position, you tend to have an increase in intraocular pressure. But even if you measure intraocular pressure over 24 hours in the supine position, as we've done in a number of studies, it's still highest at nighttime. Uh, on the other hand, there's a third of patients who have the highest pressure during the day. And we don't have any way of identifying a priori which of those patients are going to have the highest pressure during the day and which of them are going to have the highest pressure during the night. So I concluded that, you know, once these devices become real and, and make their way into clinical practice, we'll have a plethora of data that's going to teach us a lot about optic nerve damage and what's going on. I would put my money right now uh, in these particular cases on intraocular pressure. Bob, and you think that uh, the mechanics of the eye where we're changing a third of the eye into a rigid structure, pretty much. What, you know, what are we doing in terms of even pressure sensing and pressure monitoring in these eyes? I mean, we got a, uh, one third of the eyes become a, a, a different wall. Yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, but we don't know really the capacitance. We don't know also the elasticity of an individual patient and how important that is. We don't even know, for example, whether you know a rigid lamina cribrosa, one that doesn't change very much with intraocular pressure, is a better or worse uh, predictor of pressure damage than one that is very, very compliant. In other words, when you raise intraocular pressure, it's compressed, and when you lower intraocular pressure, it's not. Again, until we can measure intraocular pressure, my guess is we're not going to have that information. But it, it, it's, a, it's a great comment, and it certainly might have tremendous impact. And without wanting to make this into a glaucoma discussion, but the rigidity of the wall, the biomechanics of the outer wall of the eye, uh, of which we only have a word and not a single reliable measurement value for that biomechanics, which is talked a lot and known a little. Uh, but the, the wall rigidity does not influence, at least not to any clinically relevant measure, does not influence the pressure. It does influence our, measure, our indirect measurement values. 
but it does not influence the pressure that's really acting on the optic nerve. Mark, I have, I have a, 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 an observation. Um, you know, is, is biointegration, uh, as much as we would like it uh, to be happening with these polymers that we're putting in the eye, something that you think is really a reachable uh, uh, point? Um, you know, it seems to me that, uh, you know, when we look at a transplanted allograft, you know, it, almost gets fully integrated over the lifetime, lifetime of a patient. You know, the endothelium is the host endothelium after a while, and the keratocytes are probably the host keratocytes after a while, and certainly the epithelium becomes the host uh, epithelium. So um, is, there, is there a way you think that we can use polymers and achieve the same? So I think the current iterations, there's very little integration de facto. Um, I think that there certainly are ways. I think it will be a combination, not just of materials, but on um, applying, whether it's topographical cues that we've looked at in our laboratory, whether it's chemical cues that are bound, whether it's growth factors that are in kind of sustained release fashion released from these materials. I think there will be ways to coax uh, true integration, but I think understanding that the biology into which you're putting these devices is not the standard wood healing that you tend to study in the laboratory will make a big difference. Once we understand more about the biology, we can change the materials to reflect reflect those differences and perhaps improve the amount of true integration that happens. Well, I think it's, we want integration where we want it, and we don't want irrigation, integration where we don't want it. It's in, in the center, we probably don't, although some folks who work in more tissue engineered corneas think that we can recapitulate that in a replacement cornea by controlling the spacing of collagen, by regulating the amount of scarring that's happened, by preventing neovascularization. I think that probably a hybrid where you have a surround, essentially, that allows um, these, what would I say, plastic, for lack of a better word, plastic centers to be better um, intertwined with the surrounding um, biological tissue is, is what the goal should probably be. Um, how to make that happen is, is complex and where to draw the line and how much should integrate and how much shouldn't. That's, but integration isn't all good, just as lack of integration isn't all good. No other questions? Thank you. Thank you for all the speakers. Thank you for all the moderators. So we're moving on to our last session. This is the home stretch. We'll go to the free paper session. And we have the two moderators, uh, Dr. Joe Cholino and uh, Maria de la Paz. And while everybody's getting set up, I would also like to, most of you, if not everybody, already signed this book. And Klaus, uh, as you know, uh, a lot of people here put a lot of effort into putting together this book with the uh, current prosthesis and artificial corneas. And as a, a small gesture of our appreciation, we're all signed it, and uh, we'll especially hand it over to you. Let's uh, have the first presentation by Dr. Alia Cernage. Did I say it right? Cernage, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, good afternoon. 
Um, thank you for uh, having me here so I can present the study from our group. So I'm from Europe and I am not allowed to treat patients in USA and Dr. Dolman was kind enough to allow me to treat some mice. Um, <laughs> sorry. So no financial interest. Uh, Dr. Akpek, um, a study uh, from recent study actually, 2014, show that the uh, Boston Caper retains good vision in about half of the patients after seven years. But here is a list of long-term complications we've been discussing about today. And actually, mechanisms of all these complications are largely unknown. Most of them point, but most of them point to a chronic inflammation going on in the eye. So uh, we already uh, presented uh, mouse capro in Salzburg. Just to remind you, this is a comparison to a regular pencil. Sorry. Excuse me. Just to remind you of its tiny dimensions. So front plate is made from PMMA, and it has ma one ma millimeter in diameter. And titanium is um, uh, back plate titanium is around 1.3 millimeters in diameter. As I mentioned, we used mice. This is one of our mice with Campro implantation. And we performed syngenaic transplant. So we took white mouse and transplanted cornea to white mouse, meaning autografts. And then we performed allogeneic transplantation. So we transplanted black um, cornea from the black mouse to a white mouse. The aim of our study was to evaluate the degree of chronic colonine and, and retinal inflammation after the surgeries. So from the control group, we per performed uh, penetrating keratoplastic in the syngenaic and allogeneic fashion, and then also capro implantation also in syngenaic and allogeneic fashion. And then we compared these four groups to naive mice as well. Our endpoint was eight weeks. We assessed many ocular parameters at that point, but first was eye, um, intraocular pressure measurements, which were done with a special trans transducer. As, as you can see here, there was no statistical difference between operated eyes, fellow eyes, and naive group uh, at that point. Um, so, and all mean interocular pressures were within normal limits. Secondary, we inf assessed inflammatory cells in the cornea. This is a busy slide, but I would like to emphasize two things. So we measured CD45 and CD4 cells. And bo both CNGNA groups had much less um, inflammatory cells compared to both allogeneic groups. And secondly, CNGNA capro implantation had less inflammation in the cornea compared to allogeneic penetrating keratoplasty, meaning that, there, that allogenicity contributes more to inflammation compared to capro device itself. Next, we assess cytokines in cornea and in retina. So TNF-alpha, we found increased expression of TNF-alpha in all operated groups in cornea and retina. As you can see, pattern was really similar. And we assessed IL-1-beta. Again, uh, we found increased expression in all operated groups, but the, it was especially high in both K-pro groups. Next, we assessed microglia. So microglia, when it's activated, meaning that there is a pathologic process going on in the retina. <coughs> and we found that in retina, in both allogeneic groups, microglia was much more activated compared to both syngenaic groups, just for, to illustrate. This is, let's say, syngenaic caper group, and we see tiny little microglial cells, no ramifications. And in allogeneic caper group, we see huge ramifications and big microglial cells. This is similar to what we see, let's say, in chronic AMD. And finally, we analyzed optic nerves. So we measured optic nerve axons. Sorry, we counted optic nerve axons. And uh, we didn't find any axon loss. We compared the operated eye and the fellow eye. And we haven't found any axon loss in both syngenaic groups. But we found the trend uh, of axon loss in both allogeneic groups, especially in allogeneic capro group. We also found increased axon size in all operated groups. And we found reduced axon circularity, which was especially reduced in allogeneic capro group again. All these data point towards a degenerative process in the optic nerve. 
So to conclude, carrier graft allogenicity and CAPRO device both contribute to invisible chronic inflammation going on in the eye and resulting in optic nerve damage, but possibly also in other long-term complications that we can see in patients. So our study suggests, first of all, the use of patient's own cornea, meaning autograft as a capro carrier, or possibly decellular cornea tissue, which they're already doing in Russia, so cross-linking or gamma-irradiated corneas. And second, long-term anti-inflammatory uh, treatment, uh, possibly inhibitory, um, inhibition of in inflammatory cytokines. And this is actually our next step for our study. We are at the moment assessing the effect of cytokine inhibitors after CAPRO implantation. So I would like to thank, first of all, Dr. Dolman. You are simply the best. Thank you. And then Dr. Dana for advice and support. Mas and Thomas were helping me with experiments. Eleftherio, these IOP measurements. Miguel um, helped me with analyzing data and Larissa John from Capro Group and the rest of the Scapens crew. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Kavita Sivaraman. I think she's also from Boston. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Kavita Sivaraman. I'm currently a fellow at Bascom Palmer, but this is research that was done when I was a resident at um, Illinois Eye and Ear. Um, my topic today is uh, SEM analysis of biofilms and explanted KPRO, specifically comparison of sterile versus uh, infected cases. I have no financial disclosures. Um, so as you all know, biofilms are an important topic in medical prosthetics because they have the ability to both harbor bacteria as well as confer antibiotic resistance. There's many reported examples of biofilms in ophthalmic devices, and from the IOL literature, we know that the material comprising the surface of the devices is a contributing factor in biofilm formation. For example, we know that hydrogel and acrylic IOLs are less likely to promote bacterial adherence than PMMA or silicone IOLs. Um, however, the relationship between surfaces and uh, biofilm formation in KPROs has not been widely studied. So that was essentially the objective of the study, to describe the presence of cellular adhesion biofilm formation in, uh, on intraocular KPRO surfaces. This was a retrospective study of KPROs explanted during a four-year period that were sent for SEM imaging. The images were then reviewed for the presence of adherent cellular material or biofilm formation, and a sterile, unused type 1 KPRO served as a negative control. So this table summarizes the characteristics of the five patients who met inclusion criteria. On average, these KPROs were retained for 17 and a half months after implantation. One patient required KPRO explant due to pneumococcal endophthalmitis. The rest were removed due to what was a clinically sterile corneal um, melt. So we'll start with the negative control. This is the SEM of the sterile unused KPRO. These are the same images that Dr. De La Cruz uh, showed earlier. Um, it's worth pointing out that only the optical surfaces of the Boston KPRO are polished. The, um, both the back plate, whether it's PMMA or titanium, are unpolished, as well as the titanium locking ring. And you can see that at um, both high, low and high magnification here. So getting to the explanted KPROs, this is patient one, who again had a culture-proven pneumococcal endophthalmitis. Um, so even at the 70x magnification here um, of the titanium locking ring, you can see this adherent material. At higher magnification, you can see uh, the inflammatory matrix. And at very high mag, you can see the actual lancet-shaped diplococci that are uh, consistent with the diagnosis of pneumococcal endophthalmitis. So now going to a patient with uh, what was clinically a sterile corneal melt, you can see at low magnification, there's still quite a bit of inflammatory ma material, but it's adherent to the unpolished surfaces. The rear optic here is relatively spared, um, at, which you can see better at slightly higher magnification. Um, these on first glance look like bacteria. They're actually erythrocytes, but still within this inflammatory um, fibrinous matrix. Um, 
this is another patient with a sterile corneal melt. Again, there's adherent material along the um, rough side of the uh, back plate hole. At 500x magnification, these are again erythrocytes and keratinocytes with an inflammatory matrix. But at even higher magnification, you can actually see these clusters of cocci-shaped bacteria. Again, this is a patient who had clinically sterile melt, cultures were negative, but nonetheless is harboring um, quite a significant bacterial biofilm burden. Um, finally, one more patient with a sterile corneal melt, and I think this is really nicely points out the difference again between this rear polished optic, really minimal cellular adherence, even at higher magnification, um, whereas the unpolished backplate, you can see even at low magnification, quite a bit of adherent material, um, and again, these um, adherent erythrocytes. Um, these are pit marks from um, YAG for, for a uh, RPM. It wasn't me either. <laughs> um, so in summary, uh, the capers that were explanted from the eye with clinical evidence of endophthalmitis showed extensive biofilm formation that formed preferentially on these unpolished rough surfaces. Um, even in eyes with a clinically sterile melt, however, um, they had uh, some of them also harbored evidence of actual bacterial biofilms, and short of that, even the natural inflammatory cells were more adherent to the unpolished surfaces. Um, so this is obviously a very descriptive study. We don't know why some, only some eyes with bacterial biofilms develop endophthalmitis. Um, there is some precedent in the cataract surgery literature that shows that the anterior chamber can um, clear a small inoculum of bacteria introduced at the time of surgery without causing a clinically evident infection. The problem is that bacteria and biofilms are sequestered and may not be uh, exposed to the aqueous humor, at least not right away. Um, endophthalmitis has certainly been reported in Capro several years after implantation. Um, the average Capro in this study was explanted at a little over, a little under a year and a half, so it's possible that they'd stayed in situ longer. They could have caused endophthalmitis down the road. They were just taken out too early. Um, the next logical question is whether we should be polishing all the intraocular surfaces um, because, again, there seems to be preferential cellular adherence to these to the unpolished surfaces um, within the eye. Um, and that's a question that Heather is going to be addressing in her next talk. So um, I'll, I'll leave that um, there. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Heather Durkee. I'm Heather Durkee again, um, Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, and I'm going to present our work on the relationship between surface quality and biofilm adherence in the Capro. Um, these are my financial support, and I have no financial disclosures. Um, so, the biofilm is a big problem because the Capro is a mesoplant, meaning that it spans from the outside of the eye to the inside of the eye. And in a healthy eye, you would have the cornea, which acts as a physical barrier that prevents the outside from coming in. So when biofilm does get into the eye, it makes a, a sub-environment where um, bacteria can flourish and they aren't affected by the um, antibiotics. And biofilm is especially fond of the abiotic components, so that would be the non-living portions, such as the PMMA or the titanium. So we wanted to evaluate the biofilm on explanted capros. Um, they were all explanted at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And we did it with confocal microscopy with a live dead stain, which um, was able to selectively um, target the microbial parts. And we used a bright field illumination to show the surface features of the Capro. So here's an example of a rough area. This looks like a nick in the front optic of the Boston Capro. And you can see that the red is the dead stain and the green is the live. And there's more bacteria where there's roughness. And on the right, um, you can see the, the ridges on the optic. So this was a um, patient that was explanted recently, and they had confirmed endophthalmitis, and this is the posterior surface of the interior surface of the eye. You can see this membrane spanning across the optic, and the, red, the green is all biofilm and microbial adherence. You can see it's especially fond of the, the holes in the back plate as they're rough. And if we look at this at higher magnification, between the optic and the titanium ring, you see these 
cells growing. And here's a higher magnification image, again, through the back plate hole here. So this patient had a, um, was diagnosed with a retroprosthetic membrane that couldn't be treated with a YAG laser. This is the posterior surface the internal surface, again you can see the optic, the titanium ring, and the back plate. And if we look here between the um, back plate and the holes, you see this biofilm spanning and adhering to the inside surface. And this is the titanium ring, which also has a lot of microbial activity. And this patient, you can see here on the edge, nick marks probably from using the metal tools. They created indentations in the um, PMMA. And then here again in the back holes. And this patient was unique because they had an IOL, and at the time of explantation, we also took the IOL and we examined it in the, on the compocal microscope with the same live dead stain. And you can see here that there is very little microbial activity and also very little surface features. And this is important because these, both of these um, prosthetics were in the same, was very similar environment. So why did the Boston, why did the back plate with the ridges get more microbial activity compared to the IOL, which is smooth? So you can see here the difference. So if we compare IOL surface from the I, to the IOL, this is the external surface and the internal surface. We decided to do a similar experiment with PMMA um, rod that was shaped like an MOKP and we polished it to different specifications and we placed it in a bioreactor for 96 hours. And you can see here on the left the more rough surface had more activity, while the more polished surface had less microbial adherence. So we wanted to further this with something that's actually used in patients. So this is a PMMA backplate that we received from Dr. De La Cruz. And you can see here, we imaged it with confocal bright field, and you can see these ridges. And after we sent it to Dr. Ingram, um, sorry, Richard Ingram, and he polished it for us, and you can see how smooth it is. So tumble polishing was able to eliminate these ridges. And when we compare these two side by side, you can see the difference. Especially here at the edge, these, so this is the, um, sorry, I didn't explain. This is the interior surface, so this would be the part that would be inside the anterior chamber, not the part touching the donor cornea. And you can see the roughness here in the back plate holes was eliminated with the tumble polishing. The same, this edge was smooth. This looks more like an IOL. Here, these ridges were eliminated same. Um, we previously placed a, bio, um, a Boston Type 1 in a bioreactor for 96 hours and these were the results. And our next step will be to place these two, um, these two opti um, back plates in the bioreactor for the same amount of time and compare side by side how much biofilm adherence you can get. So, and hopefully if you could maybe decrease the microbial adherence, it would increase the lifetime of the K-Pro. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eleutherios Pascales. will speak about optimization of the titanium surface characteristics in Boston keratoprosthesis backplate. So, wait, do I go ahead? Hello, thank you for inviting us uh, here from uh, Boston. Uh, the weather is beautiful and great. So that's gonna be a very nice follow-up um, to the previous presentation about biofilm. Uh, so the presentation is optimization of titanium surface characteristics in Boston keratoprosthesis backplates. So we have witnessed the transition from PMMA to titanium over the last years in the Boston keratoprosthesis backplate. We know that PMMA is inexpensive, transparent, but uh, uh, it has an increased glare, and uh, we also have some um, issues with uh, cell attachment. Uh, titanium, on the other hand, is expensive, non-transparent, cosmetically less favorable, but reduces glare, uh, has better, it's a better bi biomaterial with superior uh, mechanical and chemical stability. So titanium is uh, the most widely used biomaterial in orthopedics and dentistry, and this is where it started. 
with excellent bioinertness, biocompatibility, and physical mechanical properties. However, when you implant it in an eye, and this is a, a, a titanium backplate, it's cosmetically uh, inferior compared to uh, PMMA. So in order to um, solve this problem, we uh, employed uh, a couple of different techniques. First, it was the grid blasting, which creates uh, a surface roughness to scatter light and reduce ref reflect reflectivity and metallic appearance. And second was uh, electrochemical anodization for changing the color but without, without using a dye. And uh, speaking about grid blasting, uh, on the left is a polished uh, titanium, on the right is a blasted. You can see that the reflectivity has been reduced. And coloring, we used electrochemical anodization where we predictably grow a titanium oxide film on top of the uh, titanium backplate. This is uh, down to the uh, angstrom scale and uh, this uh, utilizes the constructive and destructive interference of light, thus amplifying a very particular uh, wavelength of light. And we can give this kind of colors. Uh, we match the blue and a, and a brown, which, is, uh, which are the most common uh, colors. And we tested in vitro and in vivo this uh, process, and we found that uh, it's safe to be used and uh, doing tunnel assay for cell apoptosis and CD45 for immune cell infiltration. We didn't find uh, any uh, adverse effects in vivo uh, 60 days uh, after implantation. So going back now to the grid, grid blasting, uh, has been evaluated in orthopedic and dentistry. It generates a surface roughness in a random fashion. It is suggested to enhance the mechanical fixation to bone, but not the biological fixation. Little is known about the effect of grid blasting, uh, the surface roughness in cornea cells specifically. So we undertook a study to study this. So we created uh, titanium plates with uh, linear increments of roughness. And you can see on the plot that uh, this increase was linear. And we also looked at the surface energy because we know that uh, create, changing the surface pattern of a material can change the surface energy and uh, make a material more, more hydrophobic, which is bad for cells. We didn't find any difference in uh, surface energy by contact angle measurements of uh, water uh, micro droplets. So that means that the surface topography had, had no effect on the surface energy. However, we found a, a profound effect uh, when we assessed these different topographies on human corneal epithelial cells and human corneal fibroblast, less effect on human corneal endothelial cells, and we used uh, chunk cells, which are uh, human conjunctival epithelial cells, as control. So looking at the morphology, polished titanium resulted to better cell attachment, cell spreading, and more aligned stress fibers at four days of culture. That was with F-actin staining. Likewise, at uh, 1.5 months uh, after seeding, polished titanium resulted to uniaxial cell alignment, while rough resulted to random alignment. Uh, both didn't have any uh, positive uh, alpha smooth muscle actin uh, staining. Looking at, uh, at the uh, collagen expression type 1 and type, type 5, 1 0.5 months after culture, polished titanium resulted to longer, thicker collagen bundles with parallel alignment as compared to rough titanium, which resulted to thinner, more disorganized matrix with lack of collagen fibrils. So now in, in order to mimic the wound healing environment that actually appears in the eye after Boston keratoprosthesis implantation, we supplemented TGF beta into our cultures. So we saw uh, asthma, alpha smooth muscle actin expression already four days after sitting, uh, but uh, this expression was significantly reduced in rough titanium 1.5 months after sitting. Looking again at, uh, one, at uh, collagen type 1 and 5 at 1.5 months with TGF beta, we found that uh, rough titanium had a less fibrillar collagen matrix with random organization and large collagen voids, 
while polis had more dense fibrillar collagen deposits with good alignment and presence of bundles of collagen fibrils. And you can see on the lower uh, right figure, this is an assay that uh, measures the total amount of collagen. Uh, rough titanium, which is grade four, three, had the less amount uh, produced. And finally, look, uh, looking at uh, uh, phos the phosphorylation of uh, focal adhesion kinase with TGF beta supplementation, uh, we saw that uh, the expression was significantly reduced in rough titanium as compared to polyest. Uh, phosphorylated uh, FAK is a marker of cell material integration and provides a very good um, intrinsic explanation of the dynamic cell response with the substrate. So in conclusion, electrochemical anodization is a safe and feasible technique to improve cosmesis of the Boston keratoprostasis backplate. Uh, titanium surface roughness effect affects corneal cell, cells more significantly in corneal epithelial cells and fibroblasts. Titanium surface topography can impede the biological effect of TGF beta 1 in corne corneal fibroblast in vitro. Surface topography optimization may, may promote better wound healing and reduce RPM formation. And in vitro and in vivo studies are required to fully elucidate these uh, uh, results. And here we'd like to thank uh, uh, our fellows, uh, Steve, for doing this work in titanium uh, surface roughness, uh, Dylan for helping out in this project, my mentors, Dr. Dolman and Dr. Choros, and of course, Dr. Dolman for supporting uh, our uh, very new Boston Keratoprosthesis Laboratory at uh, Skepens Eye Research Institute, where we can facilitate all this work. Thank you. Thank you. Our next talk is by Dr. Ali, who will present his paper entitled Management of End-Stage Corneal Disease in Chronic Uveitic Hypotony by combining the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis with PARS plan of vitrectomy and silicone oil fill. Good afternoon. I'm really excited about talking about the treatment of corneal decompensation in the setting of uveitic hypotony, and especially expanding on the topic that uh, Dr. Afshari presented earlier with silicone oil. So imagine um, struggling and fighting with the loss of vision for 30 years. What's remarkable about this woman is that she's extremely sharp. And despite her visual uh, morbidities, she lives by herself, manages all of her own affairs. What if you were able to provide her with a surgery and help maintain some semblance of control and independence in her life? So at this visit, she had already undergone a PPV in her right eye. Her left eye had dense band keratopathy, corneal edema, no view to the fundus. Macula OCT of the right eye, though the signal is poor, showed a chronic serous RD. And uh, inflammation in general, and specific in the uh, setting of uveitis, increases permeability of the blood aqueous barrier. The teaching is that this acute hypotony related to acute interocular inflammation is typically reversible and responds well to interocular um, anti-inflammatory medications. But it gets complicated because hypotony can directly cause breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier. And so this makes breaking the cycle difficult. If there's a tractional um, uh, detachment of the ciliary body, sometimes removing that membrane can restore the anatomy and improve the intraocular pressure. But in real life, this is often difficult to do. So there are some other treatment options available. The studies show that topical ibopamine significantly increases intraocular pressure, but this effect only lasts while the patients are on the medications. Another study looked at 17 patients, only nine of whom were able to continue the medication for the full 24 weeks. This study also showed that while the intraocular uh, pressure increased significantly, it was modest, and only 50% of the patients actually tolerated the medication. Other treatments include intravitreal triamcinolone, intravitreal viscoelastic, but these remain letters to the editor. 
So another option is silicone oil. One study looked at uh, 50 eyes who had long-term silicone oil, and they found that while this is um, a reasonable surgery, sort of a last resort surgery, and there is anatomical success, there's significant amount of ocular uh, comorbidity involved. Another study looked at the corneal sequelae specifically, and 14 patients were reviewed who had uh, silicone oil placed as well as a PK, 43% of these grafts failed. And the study noted that the graft failure decreased from 67% to 25% in patients who had silicone oil removal at the time of the PK. So by this point, our patient had received um, an abopamine trial, Durazol, subtenons, Kenalog, was on systemic immunosuppression. She was fearful of tapering off of the cell sept because she didn't want to lose the little vision she had left. So what are our alternatives? We decided to go ahead and proceed with the PPV silicone oil, but we didn't want to just slap on a cornea. So Dr. Dolman actually described back in 1999 the first case of a uveitic patient secondary to severe chemical trauma. And at one year, this patient had good vision, 26. 60 with a modified type 2 prosthesis. Since then, Dr. Akpek has published a, a small case series of three eyes that had all improved vision, though a modest, at one year follow up. And the largest series so far is published by Dr. Holland's group, 13 eyes, with 10 out of 13 of them actually having an improved vision. All of them had anatomic success. So the indications for the Boston Capro we reviewed, you know, patient selection is key earlier. Uveitic hypotony with corneal decompensation is one of the indications. Our algorithm at Baskin Palmer includes a surgical team of cornea, retina, glaucoma, and oculoplastic services. In these uveitic patients, we don't put in a tube, um, but we follow all the other steps. So initially, this patient had a surgery of the left eye first, and it was done in January of 2013. She had EDT chelation performed, a temporary K-PRO was placed, IOL was removed, um, and then a cyclitic membrane was attempted to be removed. It was difficult to do. She had um, a, a silicone oil fill after a PPV, and then the uh, type 1 K-PRO was placed. Another important point um, to remember is that these patients, oftentimes a uh, contact lens is difficult to fit, so she had a tarsorophy done because of the concavity of the, of the cornea. View to the posterior pole, this is another indication now we can actually monitor the fundus after the surgery. So, so far we've done six cases of uveitic hypotony who have had both silicone oil and uh, a K-PRO placed. The mean age is 64 years. The mean follow-up so far has been 26 months. The preoperative best corrected vision was Logmar 2.73 with a visual gain of up to 1.9. Final visual clarity on the last follow-up was 2.23. All of this shows just a modest improvement. No eye actually lost vision. Two eyes had had previous uh, transplants performed. Four eyes had the uh, K-PRO as the first corneal procedure. So far, 100% of these K-PROs have been retained. In terms of complications, we've had one retroprosthetic membrane. It was in the patient who had a pseudophagic uh, K-PRO. The rest of them have done well. We have not had any extrusions, melts, infections thus far. So really the take home message is that the surgery should be reserved for specialized cases. We do not make it a habit of doing bilateral K-PROs uh, in these patients, but specifically was to prevent tysis. Um, preservation of the eye is the key. Sometimes we'll get modest improvement in the vision, but again, the goal is to keep these patients ambulatory um, and they can do very well. These are my references. And I specifically want to talk, uh, thank Dr. Perez and Dr. Amesquia for their continued mentorship. Ten-year follow-up of Boston Type 1 keratoprosthesis demonstrates stable visual acuity and retention. Thank you. I also want to uh, apologize for having to listen to me a third time today, but I promise this is my last talk. And I want to thank Natalie for hosting us, an incredible hostess, as expected. And I'd like to also thank uh, Jose and Jean-Marie for the uh, organization of this meeting, which I think has really been outstanding. Definitely the best Keterprosthesis Symposium I've attended as far as the level of the talks, the interaction, a few things I'm going to take home and do differently. And I think we've all had some ideas about 
future directions for research. You know, if you ask people who don't do keratoprostheses, our colleagues who are not here, who are out at the beach, why don't you do keratoprostheses? I, I think the number one reason they say, well, patients may see well for a while, but inevitably something will cause loss of vision, whether it's advancement of glaucoma, infectious keratitis, and ophthalmitis, retinal detachment, et cetera. So I think the key for us to increase the attendance of this meeting, get more people interested, is to show good long-term outcomes. I think the more of us that can publish long-term results, the more uh, we will be able to convince others uh, that uh, this surgery is something that all corneal surgeons who do an adequate number of transplants should either perform or refer patients to surgeons who do perform. So I want to share with you my long-term outcomes. We're defining it here as five to ten years of the Boston keratoprosthesis. Again, I have no financial interest in the keratoprosthesis. Essen presented uh, earlier this morning on this multi-center study that she helped to spearhead, which collected data from five different surgeons looking at long-term outcomes of the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis. On the right, some of the information regarding this series. Uh, we see the length, the median length of follow-up was about 48 months. And I think this is really good data. It was a very good study. However, as we know, a lot of the postoperative complications, I think, depend upon how we manage these patients, whether you use contact lenses or not, which antibiotics you use, whether you rotate them or not. We don't know what's the correct protocol, but we do know that it's a fairly heterogeneous group when you get five different centers together. So what I want to do is look at one center, i.e. our center, one surgeon, one protocol, then look at those long-term results and see how they compared. And I also wanted to extend this follow-up like I said, out to 10 years. So the purpose of this study was to evaluate the five to 10-year outcomes of the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis. It's a retrospective interventional case series of eyes undergoing surgery at uh, our institution prior to September 2009. The outcome measures are the ones, like I said, we always want to measure with keratoprosthesis patients, which is visual acuity, retention, and complications. So as far as demographics, this included 68 procedures performed in 54 eyes of 51 patients. You'll see the um, uh, median follow-up here is 66 months. Follow-up in some cases only two months. That's because, obviously, I want to be fair. I want to include those cases I did in 2005 in which the K-Pro was removed after two months. It'd be unfair to exclude those and only include the cases which had uh, kept the K-Pro for five to ten years. The longest follow-up in this series is ten years. Primary indication, as in most series, is failed corneal transplant, pre-existing glaucoma, as you see in the majority of patients. And you note about uh, almost 40% of patients either had never had a corneal transplant or only one prior graft. Vision. So in the top row, we see number of eyes retaining a K-Pro at each time point out here to 10 years. Number of eyes with recorded visual acuity. I don't have vision on all these eyes, but the majority of the eyes certainly through seven years. Here we see the breakdown by level of vision. Let's just take a look at the bottom row here. 6% of eyes had vision of 2,200 or better prior to surgery. I showed earlier today that through five years, we saw about 60% of eyes retaining vision of 2,200. So what is that after five years? Well, we see very encouraging that it continues to be steady. Uh, beyond seven years, the end is quite small. So I don't want to draw any conclusions past this point, but I think this is quite encouraging that these patients contrary to the opinions of our colleagues who are not here, are obtaining and maintaining visual acuity of 2200, the level about 60%. This is an image here. I'm showing you now the longest follow-ups I have. I have five patients who either have nine or 10-year follow-up, two have moved away, three are still under my care. So these are not cherry-picked as the best follow-up. This is the longest follow-up. So this was the fourth K-Pro I've ever performed. This is a gentleman we just talked about, chronic uveitis, hypotony, Gentleman was 2250, four failed graphs. He's now at nine years at 2050. How he sees 2050 with a pressure of like three, I have no idea. I don't ask questions, I'm just happy. This patient was my second K Pro ever performed. Graph failure, persistent epithelial defects, so I also had some limbal stem cell compromise, hand motions prior to surgery. He is 10 years out, 2040. Again, these are the longest follow ups, these are not the best follow ups necessarily. My first keratoprosthesis ever, performed in May 2004. Sadir Hanish was kind enough to fly cross country and sit there and hold my hand while I did this case. A gentleman with four failed grafts for keratoconus, count fingers in this eye, and he maintains vision of 2040, now approaching 11 years out. 
We're looking at the visual acuities now on a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. This is from the multi-center study that Essen presented this morning. In this case, presented a little differently. What they've done is only include the patients who obtained 2200 or better after surgery and then looked at the percentage that lost that level of vision over time. In our study, we looked at all patients after surgery. So you see 20% or so never obtained vision of 2200, and the most common reason was a glaucoma. Over a follow-up of five years, we see another 20% or so lost that level of vision, and the most common reason, glaucoma. So glaucoma is the most common reason why people fail to obtain and to maintain level of 2200 better vision. Regarding complications, again on the left here is from the multicenter study. On the right is in my series, and you see a lot of differences. I think this is where individual management of KPRO patients makes a difference, maybe for uh, better or for worse. Persistent epithelial defects, much more common in my series, maybe because I'm doing more cases in patients with limbal stem cell compromise, maybe because I'm obsessed with persistent epithelial defects, so I'll look for them more commonly, don't know. But 44% versus the multicenter series, uh, only 8%. Again, my data, a lot of these cases were mine. Um, glaucoma surgery, only 9% of the patients in our series required glaucoma surgery after keratoprosthesis implantation versus 21% in the multicenter study probably because we have extremely low threshold for putting tubes in at the time of the capro. I have to think that's why that number is a little bit lower. Infectious keratitis, 19% in my series, versus only 3% in the international series, excuse me, in the multicenter series. Maybe it's because of different contact lens management, different antibiotic management, hard to know. Infectious anophthalmitis, none, zero. I've had a couple cases, but neither have had five to 10 year follow-up. So those with the follow-up here in this series, none, as compared to the multi-center study, which was 15%. So again, I think it comes down to probably different types of patients we're operating on, different post-operative management, but I think it's helpful to look at a multi-center study as well as a single surgeon, single protocol example. Retention, again, from the multi-center study here, we see that out to 60 months, slow decrease as far as retention uh, failures, but then it's stable after that. What happens after 60 months? Well, fortunately, not much. Look at our series, only two retention failures beyond 48 months. So if you get to 48 months with your keratoprosthesis, it's probably going to stay in place at least out through 10 years in our experience. Showed this graph earlier today. You're looking at the alternative for these patients. Well, it'd be a second or third graft. If you look all the way out here, at 84, 96 months, you're looking at maybe 50% retention. This is all comers. Many of these are eyes you would never consider a PK for, like the Steven Johnson patients. Even with that in mind, the retention is still double that of a repeat graft when you get out to that far out after surgery. So as far as vision, more than 50% of eyes maintain corrected vision of 2200 or better five to 10 years after the Boston keratoprosthesis, with glaucoma being the most common cause of the failure to obtain and maintain that level of visual acuity. As far as complications, the most common complications are the same as those observed in the first five years after surgery, which we've discussed and you see on the slide. Anophthalmitis did not develop in any eye with a cumulative 300 years nearly of follow-up. So I think even though I'm seeing a higher rate of infectious keratitis, I'll take it if I can avoid endophthalmitis. And the complications we've encountered that you guys encounter can typically be managed with medical or minor surgical procedures, although obviously an occasional more, inv into, uh, more invasive surgery is required. As far as retention, retention failure is very uncommon more than five years after surgery with only two retention failures in this series. And the retention rate of the Boston keratoprosthesis is significantly higher than the repeat graft survival rate. I want to thank you very much for your attention, the opportunity to, to uh, speak three times today, and congratulations on an excellent symposium. Our next talk is by Dr. Guico, experience with type 1 keratoprosthesis. I would like to thank the organizers for letting me present our experience. And I'd like to thank Dr. Domo uh, for letting me learn from him this type of surgery and for letting us have a device to remove from blindness some of our, our patients.
So my two, co two colleagues, Thiago and Danny, helping me uh, putting together our data. We are from the south part of Brazil, a city called Porto Alegre, close to Argentina and Uruguay. And my first case was back in almost 10 years ago, September uh, 05. Uh, this was a young boy, 16-year-old boy, with a severe bilateral chemical burn, alkali burn. And we, of course, prepared the eye first with uh, surface ocular uh, surgeries, such as limbal transplantation, salivary gland transplantation, amniotic membrane, autologo serum, etc. And uh, this patient is almost 10 years out in the first eye and nine years in the second eye. This is one of my cases that I uh, implanted bilaterally. So this is Implanted uh, Boston Type 1 K Pro in 36 eyes. Uh, 11 of these, one third alkali burns, and almost half of the patients had multiple, multiple failed grafts uh, due to um, different uh, diagnoses. And Stephen Johnson, uh, just uh, three eyes. These are some cases pre and post, pre and post. Uh, this was a, was a severe uh, chemical burn eye that we performed limbal transplantation and then a coronary transplantation. It didn't work. And then we performed a Boston Key Pro. This is a Steven Johnson. Uh, as in uh, all series, glaucoma uh, preoperatively is very common. Uh, half of our patients had uh, diagnosed, uh, diagnosed preoperative glaucoma. Two had uh, RDs. And almost all these patients had previous uh, PKPs and other surgeries, and many of these uh, surface surgery prior to uh, Boston K-Pro implantation. Uh, simultaneous surgery, uh, one third of our patients, we had to remove cataract. We implanted at the same time uh, uh, Ahmed Valve, anterior vitrectomy, and in those, those two cases with previous diagnostic uh, RD, we did this, uh, the surgery with the uh, K-Pro. Uh, most of our eyes, we uh, chose to uh, left them pseudophagic, but for aphagic. Uh, as regard to visual, impu uh, visual acuity improvement, overall, uh, in our follow-up period from 6 to almost 10 years, half of patients uh, had better than uh, 2200, 20, not 2100, 2200 vision, this is the overall uh, uh, result. If we analyze over the years, from one to nine years, we can see that half of these patients kept this vision. Uh, here, uh, after five years, some of them had uh, melting and extrusion, so some of them lost uh, uh, VA. And this is each patient we can see uh, around the set between the second and third year, some patients lost vision, and then we could rec uh, recover some, and around the fifth year, also some patients uh, lost some uh, VA. Retention rate, as almost all series, uh, in the first five years, uh, they are okay, but we lose some uh, uh, retention rate. And after five years, of course, we have uh, less ice. Uh, they kept uh, in a, around 85% of retention rate stable. Complications we all have, that's a big problem. Uh, our most frequent complication is uh, uh, sterile vitreitis in one third of our patients, uh, but only in some cases we had to perform a posterior vitrectomy. All others we could control with uh, oral steroids. Corneal melting is another big problem that we uh, have. 50% uh, of these patients were in alkali burn eyes. So one-third of uh, the patients uh, developed corneal melting uh, from the second month and, uh, up to fourth uh, year after surgery. Uh, in half of these cases, we had to remove and perform a corneal graft and then implant another Kipro. Uh, extrusion, we had only a couple patients, two patients, four years after 
the K Pro implantation due to a, a corneal melting. Uh, CME, uh, one fourth of our patients developed, uh, and almost all of them we had to treat with intra vitro injection, either of uh, Tresolon or Avastin. Uh, glaucoma is a big problem. 40% uh, of our, our patients had preoperative glaucoma, 11 developed after uh, the surgery, and 25% of these patients that had glaucoma prior to uh, K-Pro implantation had the glaucoma worsened. Uh, RPM, diagnosed, uh, uh, the diagnosis of RPM on the slit lamb we, we had, had only in 14% of the eyes. But of course, if we do OCT, and we started doing OCT uh, one year uh, from now, uh, back to one year, so of course we will have more RPM diagnosed. So uh, we had only 14% diagnosed only uh, at the slit lamp. And now we are starting to use more OCT. Infectious keratitis, 14% also from the third month to fourth year after the K-Pro implantation. Four uh, of these were fungal keratitis, uh, two fusarium and two candidates, and one bacterial uh, keratitis. And these were not more in uh, one or another diagnosis. Uh, so it was not specifically for uh, Stevens-Johnson or alkali burn cases. This is one example of one of our Steven Johnson's patients. This is three months out. Uh, four months after surgery, this uh, fungal infiltrate and also anterior uh, vitreous uh, with this inflammatory process or infectious process. And this uh, lady, this is the only eye she has. It's, uh, uh, it's nine years out now, with uh, keeping with a 2100 vision. After removing the Q-Pro and anterior vitrectomy, Voriconazole, intra vitro, etc. We had two cases uh, of uh, endophthalmitis, both of Candida. One is this lady, five months and uh, two years after surgery. One is in Stevens Johnson syndrome, this one, and the other one for uh, multiple previous failed grafts in Fuchs dystrophy. Uh, RD is another problem. We had only 11%, uh, uh, but that's a problem. Choroidal detachment also, we had some uh, cases, 11%. Uh, and we had uh, some patients that went to uh, phthisis, 11% also, uh, from seven to 48 months after K-Pro implantation. Uh, one was an alkali burn eye, uh, it, it was due uh, to a blunt trauma, and one in Stevens Johnson patients. But beside all these uh, uh, complications, uh, I'm still an enthusiastic of uh, K-Pro uh, because this is my first patient and we have many of these patients that are still uh, seeing well, like this. It's almost 10 years out with 2025 in one eye and uh, 2040 in the other eye. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Juan Carlos Abad, who will talk about novel strategies to improve keratoprosthesis outcomes. Okay, so I would like to thank uh, the Natalie, Jose, Jean Marie uh, for inviting me here. I'm going to present the, um, our experience with the latest set of patients. Um, we've um, changed a little bit the post op regimen. Uh, we try to avoid uh, collagenase activating medications. We use uh, medications that prevent collagenase activation, like uh, oral doxycycline, topical medroxy progesterone. We clean the contact lens with uh, povidone iodine at every single patient visit. I mean, not only the contact lens, but the surface of the eye. We use systemic immunomodulation in patients with, uh, with severe ocular conditions. Uh, we started doing a primary complete uh, vitrectomy at the time of surgery, rendering all patients aphakic. Initially, we were doing it with a temporary keratoprosthesis, and now we do it through a Boston K-Pro, as I'll show later. Uh, we, nowadays, uh, almost universally use a pars plana shunt, and uh, we've been using the oversized uh, titanium backplate. 
as uh, has been uh, pioneered by Kathy Colby and Andrea Cruzat. And since August of last year, we've been cross-linking all the donors, uh, as has been suggested from the Boston Group and Canelopoulos. This is her surgical technique. Basically, this is an artificial chamber. This is a well. We fill it with hypotonic riboflavin. That's the, that's the cornea. Then we put the valve first. Then the valve goes into a pars plana. Then we remove the cornea, remove the intraocular lens or the cataract, put the cornea. Then the retina surgeon comes in, three port, 25 gauge, uh, pars plana vitrectomy. Through a central optic, he's able to remove the posterior hyaloid and peel any membranes that might, by, might be back there. And then through a peripheral hole, he's able to remove the vitreous base doing a scleral depression and uh, doing a total, I mean, a complete vitrectomy. Um, we've done 20 patients, uh, half of them repeated graft failure, six chemical or thermal burns, a couple of Steven Johnson's, uh, 11 had had a, a one or several PKs, seven had had one or several Boston uh, K-Pros, PMMA mostly. Uh, the pre-op uh, visual acuity went from 2060, which was a redo with a melt, uh, to light perception, 85% had pre-existing glaucoma, 17% uh, uh, had a primary pars plana vitrectomy, and three had it later for uh, scheduling reasons. Uh, three have been cross-linked, I have a few more, but they have not reached the six-month follow-up which we uh, used here, and all the results that I'm gonna show are tallied from the six-month follow-up, I mean from the insertion of the oversized uh, titanium backplate. 70% uh, improved, 15% the same, 15% worse, 75%, uh, 65%, sorry, uh, 2200 or better, 20%, 2050 or better. These were very sick eyes with multiple surgeries and so forth. Uh, complications, 11 cases of worsening glaucoma, we inserted new valves in six of them. It's pretty easy because the patient has been already vitrectomized. So it's only a matter of uh, going to a different quadrant, hopefully not the inferotemporal, because we had a couple of complications there. Uh, and then you just insert the valve into, into the vitreous. Uh, we've had four cases of retinal detachment, uh, as Kathy and I were discussing. Uh, the one that worries me the most is the one that had a spontaneous retinal detachment, but he'd had four K pros before done by another surgeon, and then he was referred to us. So I, I don't know what could have happened during those surgeries. The other three were secondary to choroidal detachments that were repaired successfully, as I'm gonna show you later on. The primary retention rate is 85%, and we only had one case of RPM formation. This is a case, uh, hand motion vision, severe vernal conjunctivitis, glaucoma, then uh, almost a year out, he was seeing 2100 because of the glaucoma, um, happy. And then he comes in in the middle of the National Congress of Ophthalmology last year. I had a couple of, of uh, people from outside the country, but nonetheless, uh, here's the, the choroid abutting the, the, the posterior uh, optic. Uh, here's the melt. Here's the ultrasound, choroids, retinal detachment, so forth. First retina consult, there's nothing to do, the eye is dead. So I ended up getting a second retina consult, and hopefully we were able to do this. First, we trifine all the way down to the, to the big back plate. We remove the cornea, then lots and lots and lots of viscoelastic. Then we put the biome, we saw light at the end of the tunnel. Then we remove the keratoprosthesis, temporary keratoprosthesis, because this is a complication, perfluorocarbon, silicon, and uh, cross-linking to a donor cornea. And here is the patient. He's still managing his coffee farm. He's seeing 2200. Uh, we put him on oral cyclosporin and AZT. We were able to remove the silicon oil because of glaucoma. The retina remains flat. And these are the pictures of uh, himself nowadays. A very recent case, not included in the series, but I'm just gonna 
bring it up because I presented it at Bascom Palmer. You, uh, it, it was like a little session that we do every year, and this year it was called like corneal dreams. So I, I dared to present this case, and then everybody was laughing at me, especially Victor at the audience, because he said that that's a, a nightmare. But anyhow, that's a, a, a patient with Steven Johnson, three PKs on the right, uh, three, uh, on the right three PKs on the left, uh, hand motion on the left. Then we do cross-linking, I mean, the, what we did above, uh, the amid valve, the titanium back plate, the vitrectomy, and here's she uh, like two weeks out. And then I get an email from Bukaramanga. She had been referred from there for the surgery. And then there's an infection here. And uh, so we put the patient on antibiotics, uh, 45 vanco, septazim, and ampho. But look at this, which was uh, striking to me. The patient was to to totally sidel negative, and then the stromal corneal ring was crystalline and tight, and the, 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 the um, fluorescein wasn't getting there. There was a melt here, which was not reaching the hole, but this part of the cornea was holding nice and steady. So we decided to do an uh, amniotic membrane overlay with, uh, I mean, um, yeah, overlay with a, with a with one on top using fibrin glue, or, or actually was done in Bucaramanga. Um, actually hasn't worked for me. The amniotic membrane gets eaten by the infections and the melts and so forth. But in this case, probably because of the cross-linking, I don't know. Look here, the, the penis was covering the area of, um, of melt, and then here she is, three months out, uh, the, the rim still is crystalline, and she's seen 2100. She still has a little bit of a residual vitreous heme, but she was able to pull through. So cross-linking might have something to do uh, helping these patients. So in conclusion, uh, the PPV at the time of surgery plus aphakia makes further glaucoma and retina work easier. Oversized titanium backplates, along with the above, seem to decrease RPM formation over the optic and the backplate holes. Uh, Cross-linking might help and decrease melt. Glaucoma remains a big issue. And here's a patient, 42 months out, Steven Johnson's. Uh, she's on Celsept 2025. Look at the retroillumination. See? The holes are totally clear. And most of the patients are like that. And look at this. I don't know if you see it, but there's an epilip. And I, I'm seeing more and more epilips on my patients. I, I haven't tallied those. But uh, I don't know if it's because of the big back plate, because of the vitrectomy, uh, what it is. But, uh, but it's nice because this, as was shown before today, will decrease the, the, the rate of melt and will make the whole system watertight, which is what, it, what we want. I want to thank the retina surgeon you saw in action and then the amniotic membrane team in the Bucaramanga. And uh, thank you very much. Our next uh, talk is on cross-linking of donor corneal tissue with glutaraldehyde for keratoprosthesis by Dr. Sidaratan. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Sadat. I am from India. Uh, I work in Shankara Eye Center. Uh, for, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Natalia Sari for giving me an opportunity to speak here in this prestigious meet. So my talk here is um, a cross-linking of donor corneal tissue with glutaraldehyde for keratoprosthesis. We have a very preliminary report of cases, uh, probably around uh, five cases for about three to six months follow-up. Not a very big thing, but we started doing this and the early results were really good. So I just wanted to present and uh, get your thoughts also. So introduction is very short, like we all know, like we've been working around with a lot of uh, the um, um, new uh, delivery systems, like new um, uh, tech, uh, um, 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 uh, the technique to do better uh, quality of the tissues and um, the uh, drug delivery and the glaucoma and all those things. We've been working around a lot of things about that. But the primary thing what we all feel is we have is infection and the melt. These, these are the two main things which we, which we uh, go through when uh, whatever we talk about the designs or whatever. 
So going to the pathophysiology, we know that, that several enzymes, particularly the metallo, uh, matrix metalloponin family is responsible for the degradation of the extracellular matrix such as collagen and um, proteoglycans involved in the corneal milk. This is very basic, everybody knows. So going into the literature, uh, I like to acknowledge all these people who are here, who have done a lot of research on this. And uh, one thing which really um, uh, interested me was cross-linking and particularly uh, Dr. Kanapoulos, uh, unfortunately I couldn't hear his speech today. But um, the thing is that uh, he had actually presented uh, the, this thing for almost for 7.5 years. He had shown that the cross-linking of the donor tissue were really stable uh, post keratoplasty. So when I read through a few of the articles, I was uh, finding other, other materials which could be used for uh, treatment of uh, uh, for cross-linking and one was uh, the glutaraldehyde. So mainly glutaraldehyde actually is one of the um, uh, best cross-linkers which is used in vitro but the problem is that because of the uh, toxicity nobody is using it. But now the recent this thing is that uh, um, a lot of these uh, uh, tissue engineered corneas like all these people who are using this tissue engineered corneas they are using the glutaraldehyde for the uh, collagen. So this gave me a lot of interest and I went and read through a lot of, not, not ophthalmology, but a lot of glutaraldehyde treated uh, corneas for like uh, for uh, ca pericardial bioprocess and all those things and they found, they, they were able to say that, that this had the best cross-linking effect. But the main problem was that you have to titrate the concentration and the time of exposure. So this was the most important thing which, what they found out. And uh, this is a very brief description, like it's a, a linear 5-carbon di uh, dihydrate which is a clear colorless uh, pale to cholesterol fluid. And the thing is that it rapidly reacts with the amino groups generating thermally and chemically stable crosslinks. It is mainly available in acidic aqueous solution and various concentration. That's the main problem because it has various concentration and from 5 percent to less than 2 percent to 70 percent. Uh, but what was very maximally studied was from 5 percent to 0.1 percent. <coughs> So we took 0.5% glutaraldehyde because first what we did was we took about 4 to 5 our human corneal tissues which we uh, which were not um, uh, suitable for transplantation we cross-linked with the normal uh, collagen cross-link and we did around 0.1%, 0.2% and 0.5% glutaraldehyde and tried to see which tissue was better. So around 0.5% glutaraldehyde was giving almost equivalent stiffness or like even better stiffness. Uh, when, uh, uh, so we use the 0.5 glutaraldehyde. Why 5 minutes? That also it goes in literature that I have no experience in this but literature says that the first 2 to 3 minutes when you put the glutaraldehyde, when the tissue in the glutaraldehyde, the free amino groups in the collagen reacts in the first 2 to 3 minutes forming the shift space. So this shift space again reacts with the whatever remaining glu uh, glutaraldehyde to form the hydrolytically stable compounds which is responsible for the cross-linking effect. This is a very fine mechanism. If you use more concentration or if you use more time, they say it forms pendant GA links. So these GA links are weak and they may cause toxicity too. So this is probably what is now being studied and now even amniotic membranes which are used to, tra which are used to transport the limbal epithelial cells are treated with glutaraldehyde. So if it's going to be that very toxic, probably we may not be able to use, but probably we took a chance to use it and see. So our aim of the study was to investigate the possibility of induction of the crosslinks and donor tissue in order to increase the stiffness as a basis for an ingenious technique of keratoprocess. So where we obtain glutaraldehyde is very easy to obtain like we got it from our um, uh, cardiothoracic um, counterparts who use this uh, for a pericardial bioprocess. So once they use it, it's a sterile solution, they are not going to, th they are only going to throw it. So we just collected it and we stored it and we uh, treated it. So what we did here was we took 0.5 percent and we initially we did like four to five minutes of treatment like uh, that was what we did and um, initially we soaked the uh, solution in BSS for about 30 minutes just to uh, make it come to the normal room temperature and then after uh, the 0.5 percent um, uh, exposure we washed it with running saline for about 10 minutes. It took a lot of time but we did it because we didn't want to have any toxicity and we didn't have any prior reports of uh, this being done. So when it was done we could see that like immediately like within 10 minutes like once 10 to 15 minutes we could see that the, this, the cornea was really stiff whether the untreated cornea was not able to stand and we can really see that that, that stiffness was there which we could um, appreciate in these pictures. 
So we then use this GA treated cornea as a donor cornea tissue in the K-Pro made by the Aravindhaya Hospitals India uh, known as Auro K-Pro uh, for five patients. So just a brief discussion, uh, I'm not going to um, go into very detail, just that we wanted to know that whether the initial, the first three to six months, whether there was any problem with epithelization or there was any other problems. The first patient was uh, a child operated at three months, so he, he, like, um, he was not having very good vision. So we tried in this patient and you can see that at six months, very good, uh, very good epithelization and very good uh, conjunctivalization over the tissue and we did not have any problem. But his vision did not improve because of amblopia. The second case again was a graph failure, multiple graph failure done. And for him the vision really improved and again we didn't have much problem with the epithelization and uh, the other initial problems. So this patient, third patient, you can see a little bit discoloration because what we did was we stored this for about two to three weeks and then we used this. So probably this remained even at three to six months, this yellowishness remained. So then what we did was we used fresh whenever we get the tissue, we use it freshly. We didn't want to store it for more than two to three weeks. And uh, the fourth case was again a vascularized total locomotor's opacity with thinning and PAs. His vision also didn't improve and we didn't have much uh, problems. So going much, uh, fifth case, we're a little bit bolder, went to, uh, did a, this is uh, eye with silicon oil filled and like we tried doing this. But the problem here was as we expected here, there was definitely, uh, there was a limbal cell problem here. The other four cases didn't have that, so it really did well. This patient had a lot of dryness. You can see that the dryness was persisting. But what happened, what, what we saw here was there was no acute melt, like the tissue was still resisting the melt. But I don't know how long this is going to resist the melt, but we did a tarsography and we did a punctal occlusion just to save the eye. But we don't know whether the glottalidate is going to uh, resist this melt after some time. So summary of cases didn't take very complicated cases, took simple cases um, to just to see the epithelization and to see that uh, the early thing and what we uh, achieved was really was uh, um, uh, good to see. And uh, the discussion is like cross-linking with gradient definitely strengthens the cornea and makes it more durable. We have a very short follow-up. During this period, we report no early adverse effects of GA. There was normal um, epithelization, no aqueous leak, apotony, no increase in pressure and no melt. So key points to note which we I want to just discuss is that um, when you uh, punch the uh, tissue it's a little bit stiffer so like when you are doing in a normal uh, healthy like a, when you do in a fresh tissue uh, it's more softer but here it's a little bit harder so you have to be like careful that there is no gap you just fix it properly well you just nicely push it in and make sure that the front plate goes in and all the back plate and titanium also goes in. And suturing, as uh, Dr. Uh, Jim was telling today, like suturing is very important. You cannot too much flatten it, too much uh, make it loose. So here, a little bit resistance will be, definitely you will be seeing. And uh, it's not that very big difference, but you have to be a little bit gentle to do it because the tissue is a little bit stiffer. So conclusion is GA is definitely a promising cross-linking agent for donor tissue for K-Pro. It is cheap and easily available. It has the maximum cross-linking effect among all the groups. Better understanding of the mechanism of the GA has helped us to use GA judiciously and avoid the toxicity of GA of uh, glutaldehyde. Early results are encouraging, but definitely I'm not saying that glutaldehyde is going to be the uh, uh, thing for cross-linking, but definitely the, sh the Early results are promising, but we have to see long term, probably next time, probably a year or two, we follow up these cases, probably we may be able to know the exact uh, situation. Thank you. But not least, um, Dr. Radhika Tandon will talk about setting up a character prosthesis service in a tertiary care public funded hospital in India. Uh, thank you very much. It's been an amazing day. Uh, so much to learn and uh, some very nice um, information to take back home. The last time I presented um, at the K-Pro uh, study group was in 2003 when um, I was just finishing my fellowship with Christopher Liu at Brighton and going back to India to... Um, um, try to set up the service in my hospital. The All India Institute of Medical Sciences is a premier multi-speciality teaching hospital, and I had got a Commonwealth Fellowship to learn uh, keratoprosthesis surgery. Um, okay. 
So uh, effectively, the purpose of, uh, of this um, abstract was to review the long-term outcomes of uh, the surgical services that we started since then. And uh, the, the method was to go through all the various file records and case um, reports and update the information from uh, the operating room records and the applications uh, which were uh, written to apply for grants and arrange funding for the various procedures. Um, the detailed analysis was done looking at the uh, information, for example, socioeconomic profile, the information was available with the social worker because we had to apply for um, uh, uh, applications for, a, 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 uh, for uh, the various medications and also sometimes uh, if any extra device was required like the, like the glaucoma valve um, and the patients couldn't afford it. We looked at the types of devices, the surgical procedures, the length and duration of surgery and the expenses and I've evaluated for the purpose of today's talk, because just six minutes, short-term and long-term results, the improvement in vision, change in quality of life, impact on the family and life-changing events, expenses incurred in visiting the hospital, medication use, retention, and complications. So basically, uh, overall in our hospital, about 65 patients were operated, um, 40 patients uh, specifically under my care, and uh, 25 patients by other surgeons in the hospital over the last two years. The age ranged from 20 to 72 years, and this was the mean. Uh, also looking at the EBAI donor utility reports for, uh, for character processes uh, just shows how the surgery is now becoming more popular in India, and this is the donor utility for the Boston Type K Pro. We started in 2009-10 with May, there were 17, then 22, 24, 46, and 135. So with that uh, background, the diseases in my series were basically uh, prior failed corneal grafts were 40%, Stephen Johnson syndrome 33%, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid 5%, post chemical burn and stage limbal stem cell deficiency 5%. This is because we also offer uh, limbal stem cell rehabilitation and uh, cultured um, uh, as our um, first choice for patients with limbal stem cell deficiency. And these two groups, this was all uh, OKP uh, and and the OCP, one was a Boston K-Pro, and one was a Champagne Cork. Uh, heel keratitis, AFK with silicon oil keratopathy in combination of factors or others. So this is just a pictorial representation showing that largely failed corneal grafts and end stage uh, and um, Stephen Johnson syndrome were the largest group. The devices used, they were implanted, implanted in sequential order of the initiation of the surgical procedures depending upon what devices were available. So the Champagne Cork 5 to 5 were, were were implanted and initially we had ethics approval for putting five devices each and seeing what the results were and then deciding whether it could be considered as a standard of care. There were 12 MOKP, Boston Type 1, 19, Boston Type 2, 1 and also a temporary KPRO assisted VR surgery followed by either a corneal graft or a Boston Type 1. There were three cases. So the champion cork essentially the indication were uh, patients who were edentulous and dry eye, and state dry eye, Stephen Johnson syndrome with the MOKP. The Boston type 1 were effectively the failed grafts, chemical burns, and one patient with OCP. And um, Boston type 2 was an end stage Stephen Johnson syndrome, which was edentulous. Observations, the overall rate of improvement in vision was 95%, improvement in quality of life was 80%, long-term clinical outcome in terms of retention rate, including those who completed minimum five years of follow-up and excluding those who had a temporary KPRO assisted keratoplasty was estimated to be 77%. Uh, major complications, extrusion was seen in 5%, end of thalmitis in 10%, irreparable retinal detachment in 3%, exchange due to instability in 3%, surgical removal due to uncontrollable controllable infection in 3%, and progressive ciliary body failure leading to thysis in 5%. These are the major complications, but 65% patients um, were saved from these severe complications. Uh, looking at the uh, patients of champagne cork, uh, keratoplasty, Processes. Two out of five developed slow thysis over two to three years. One developed endophthalmitis. One developed sudden hypotony, perhaps because of leakage. An attempt was made to save the eye by injecting silicone oil, uh, which uh, allowed the eye to survive for another four or five months, but eventually the patient developed endophthalmitis. And one patient had mortality. So given the result of the champagne cork, we are not putting in any more of these devices. 
So the conclusion character processes surgery offers a life-changing option to patients with end-stage blinding corneal disease with passage of time and changing technology, a better understanding of case selection devices and procedures, clinical protocols, anticipated outcome and estimated prognosis has emerged. The champagne cork did offer useful vision for one to two years. It was simple, low maintenance, but poor long-term outcome. The OOKP in our experience resorption does occur in five years uh, with young Stephen Johnson syndrome being our only indication. Uh, ECC instead of ICC was done given the age of the patients. They were all below 25 years of age. Uh, one patient was 28. Uh, Preoperative glaucoma was excluded in case selection. Maybe I was a bit conservative and also we didn't have easy access to the MR glaucoma valve when I first started out. Cosmesis was an important issue and one of the patients actually elected to have a reversal of the procedure after stage one and didn't want to go ahead because the neighbors and the family couldn't uh, um, um, couldn't bear the, the appearance of the mucous membrane on the eye. The Boston character processes contact lens adds to the expense, but otherwise um, um, it is affordable with the help of um, government support. Capro surgery is unaffordable without subsidy for the, for the subset of patients whom we teach, and a caregiver is required. All the patients who had complications and either had problems with stopping their medication or not putting the correct medication or not coming for follow-up. So based on this, we realize that we need a social worker, we need community outreach, we need some part Partner, which is going to help us giving the service uh, support because most of the research grants that I applied for said it was more a service company, it would not be possible to give financial support. Affordable character processes uh, can be worked out as, uh, as we're having new prototypes of the Boston character processes, which has led us to now work on a disability inclusive low vision restoration and rehabilitation program. Uh, Christopher Blinden Mission is supporting it, and this is the AIMS National Program for Control of Blindness. And I'd like to mention the Reliance Drishti project, which did support a lot of the medications for a lot of the patients earlier, and they're also going to be a partner for this program. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Dolman, Tony L. Darby, and James Chodosh for helping with the Boston Character Processes work, Christopher Liu for the OOKP, and Indu Singh for Champagne Cork. And of course, all the residents and faculty at Ames. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for the talks. We are, um, we have passed the, the time limit, but I think Dr. De La Cruz says we have about five to ten minutes for questions. Okay. Any, que All right. <laughs> Any questions, please? Okay, I, yeah, I have a, can I ask first? For the, um, Dr. Aldavi. Yeah, um, you presented a very good follow-up, and I think this is one of the most important things. We are all learning. We are here to learn from others and share our experience. So I agree with you with, that when a patient goes through past five years of the prosthesis, then, then that's probably when you can consider it success. So with your accrued experience, do you prefer a PMMA over a titanium? Do you prefer an oversized to a normal sized? would you cross-link these patients or not? And if the patient has to have silicone oil because your retina surgeon won't allow you to take it out, would you consider converting to an aphakic um, keratoprosthesis? Okay, so trying to remember all those questions and then address them. You know, it's, it's difficult. A lot of us have our preferences, but I can't say that, uh, let's say, a PMMA backplate is better than titanium because I've only used one titanium. So this is what makes it difficult. We all have our protocols that we follow, but it's really it's not evidence-based. It's preference-based. It's what some, we saw somebody else do it. Or in Los Angeles, to tell you the truth, the impetus for using the PMMA is because people care about cosmesis. Like you just said, the, the woman who decided not to proceed with the OKP because the neighbors didn't like the appearance of it. It sounds ludicrous, but that's the mentality in Los Angeles. So I have used only the PMMA backplate. I have not used the titanium backplate. Um, what I would like to see, and I think the people in this room could put this together, is a, a larger study looking at titanium versus PMMA, both 8.5, trying to control for preoperative diagnosis, controlling for the risk factors that Joe has shown us that we've looked at that are associated with increased risk of RPM, control for those, and then really settle this matter once and for all. And obviously, if 
RPM incidence is lower with a titanium backplate, I will tell my patients the most common complication is this, and we can lower the incidence with this backplate. That may inspire them to actually use it. At this point, I'm still going with the PMMA, because I, I still have not seen in, in the study that was published, uh, I did not, we did not, I don't think Joe yet published that series yet regarding risk factors for RPM. So as far as I know, I haven't seen a study which controlled for risk factors for RPM formation, and, and I think that's a really big issue. For in our series, a smaller series than the one that you published, it was other surgeries performed at the time of caper implantation, so tube shunt implantation, vitrectomy, et cetera, and the presence of a retrocorneal membrane on the excised failed graft were the two risk factors that we found for RPM formation. That makes sense. So I'd like to see a study. We should really do this. This sort of a meeting should also generate collaborative multicenter studies to, to look at this question. As far as your, your, the other questions that you had about oversized, again, I have always used a 7.0 millimeter back plate instead of an 8.5. I have used 8.5 on a rare occasion. Why? I'm of the mind that if the least amount of hardware in the eye, the better. As if I can restore the ocular anatomy as close to normal anatomy as possible, that to me makes sense. Like with DSEC better than PK, DMAC better than DSEC. In that case, you're looking at rejection risk, et cetera. But the same principle holds true, at least in my mind. This may be totally false conception. Kathy may really be onto something as far as the larger back plate. But I have no personal experience with the larger <laughs> back plate. I do know in my cases when I do have to remove a retroprosthetic membrane mechanically, when I make the limbal incisions, it is, in the few cases I've had to remove it with an 8.5 millimeter back plate, it is more difficult to get access to the posterior surface of the optic with a larger back plate than a smaller back plate. It's an unusual patient who needs to have mechanical removal of an RPM, but for me that's a real reason to go with a smaller back plate. Also, many of these cases, when I'm in the operating room, it's a failed graft. I peel that graft out, it's 7.58 millimeters. I've always wanted the donor to be larger than the backplate. So with us, the 7.0 backplate, that's never an issue. If I wanted to make sure that the, you know, I always had a backplate that was uh, smaller than the donor, I'd have to measure these cases at the slit lamp preoperatively to know whether an 8.5 millimeter backplate would fit. To make it simple, 7.0 for everybody. But again, I have no evidence to say that that's better. Kathy has some nice evidence to show that maybe it does decrease RPM formation. That's the problem. I, like all of us, are doing things based on assumptions, based on convention, and not based on evidence. And the other, yes, I think you know. I'm really struck by one thing. I would take from this meeting is all the people talking about cross-linking, um, and I hope your DoD grant is funded. I'm, I'm pleased that you asked us to participate. I'm really interested in participating in that study to look and see if cross-linking does decrease the incidence of infectious keratitis and stromal necrosis, which are the two of the biggest problems that we see. So yes, I'll cross-link as soon as it gets approved, I'll start, cross I'll start using cross-link corneas. And the last question was about re a patient with silicone oil. You referred to a fake cross-linking In an AFIC, most of the eyes of silicone oil, in my experience, I have, I don't know, probably 15 or 20 eyes with silicone oil fills. Most are aphakic to start with. So I'm usually not faced with the decision as to either move an IOL or keep it in place. Usually there's no IOL there. Um, so if a patient does have an IOL in and it's well positioned and it's stable, the sulcus based or posterior chamber lens, my preference is to leave it in place and not remove it. If it's an AC IOL, it would come out. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. I think Jim's got a question over here. So Tony, it's possible that the seven millimeter back Pressing the donor cornea and having the host cornea sort of bulge into the chamber and then a membrane forming from that. So as you get the back plate away from the graft host junction, even though you're not compressing it with the smaller back plate, you may, if you're too trained to do for that, assuming you are, you may be getting the same result. You're not sealing the wound, but you're also not putting pressure on the wound right. the back plate. Right. That's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. And I think your point earlier about the suturing, I, one thing I tell the fellows, I do turn over a lot of these cases to the fellows because I don't have to worry about suture-induced astigmatism, but I do tell them the same thing. If you tie it too tight, you flatten that donor cornea, you can get a delin next to the edge of the optic, and that is going to be a problem. The gentleman, my patient, who I just saw this today at lunch, K-Pro patient, persistent epithelial defect adjacent to the optic. He lives in San Diego, so I said, I'll see you while I'm here. And now is infectious keratitis that I'm managing that developed from a persistent defect adjacent to the optic. It's not my suturing, of course. It just happened. But 
But that would have predisposed to it. Couldn't be, of course not. Dolman. Uh, I, I think we should uh, thank Radhika Tandon for her talk uh, as an example of how to set up a KPRO service. Uh, not only a tricky for the patient uh, measuring, having the text measure the visual acuity and then a quick look in the sit line, but here the social services, uh, evaluations of outcomes, and uh, the whole bit. I think this is very, very important. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm going to turn over the mic here. Thank you, um, Dr. Cialani and Dr. Del Paz. Um, it was a great day with having so many colleagues here, so much of stimulating talks and so much of intellectual um, exchange. Thank you, everyone. I know that I take um, a lot of pearls home, the whole 15-minute drive that I have compared to some of you who will be thinking about it <laughs> during your long flights, such as Dr. Tandon. I have a USB that is from Zimmer, so just guessing it must be a German doctor's. <laughs> there is Uber um, that would be available to whoever would like to call at this point or, or send them. A very, very special thank you to people who actually really put the program together, which is John Marie Perel and Jose de la Cruz, yet gave me some of the credit, which was not, which was not deserved because they truly did everything. It is such a great privilege to also have Dr. Dolman here on the first row, just uh, spearheading. Um, everyone's effort and teaching everyone care to prosthesis. So thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Jose. Well, thank you, Nelly, because it was a great host. All we did was put all of you together. And uh, as you noticed, uh, when we come to these meetings, a lot of great things happen, a lot of, a lot of discussion, and that's what we want to promote. As we meet more often, say yearly or every two years, to continue these collaborations, things that uh, we've uh, brought up as far as uh, group collaborations, individual things that we need to do so we all get the benefit for our patients. So all I did was put people together, and you allowed us to do it in your institution. So great pleasure being here. Enjoy the rest of the week, and uh, we'll, hopefully we'll see you again in our next meeting. I believe it's in Barcelona in, uh, in September. Thank you.